Hi, everyone. It's so great to see all of you. Welcome to the second annual NATO Youth Summit, securing our shared future. My name is Lauren Speranza, and I will be your host for today. I'm representing the Center for European Policy Analysis, or SIPA, who is so proud to co-host this summit with NATO. I'm coming to you all live here in Brussels, Belgium, in NATO headquarters where we have a fantastic group of in-person participants, so refreshing to see. And I know we also have a massive audience joining us online as well. So wherever you are, thank you so much for tuning in. So first things first, today is all about all of you. The point of today's event is to bring together rising leaders from across Europe, North America, and beyond for a conversation about the issues that you all see as critical to global security. I mean, after all, it's all of you who are going to be leading our societies and our institutions very soon. So the point of today is to elevate all of your voices alongside the leaders of today. We have an amazing program lined up. I know it's a long day, but there's just so much we wanted to pack in. We have a range of intergenerational discussions, uh, presentations, but also, most importantly, interactive discussions. And I'm not just talking about Q&A. We also have some cool things planned, like a cyber simulation and lots of live polls. So please get ready to contribute. You can follow all of the conversations online at SIPA and at NATO on social media and also on our website at SIPA.org. What's also special about today's event is that we have a really cool group of social media influencers here at NATO headquarters today to help us cover the summit and amplify all of your ideas. So keep an eye out for Ellie Herr from the UK, Sergio Hidalgo from Spain, Ingus Rutilis from Latvia, Isabella Evans from the UK, and Ben Wheeler from the US. So great to have you all with us. I think the best way to get involved in today's discussions is actually through our conference app, which is called Socio. So I'll ask everyone to get out their devices and make sure you have it downloaded. Uh, you can log in with the email that you use to register for this event. And once you're in, you can find access uh, to our agenda. You'll get live updates about that. You can find more information about our speakers. And the best part is that's where you can submit to the Q&A and also respond to live polls. To find that section, go to the live stream tab, and then there will be a button for Slido, and then you'll see it come up. There's a place to do Q&A and also to respond to polls. But also, for all of you joining us here in the room, I'm going to keep you on your toes because throughout the day I'm going to come to you and I might just call you out and ask for some reactions about what you're hearing today. So I hope you all are well caffeinated and ready to go because I'm so excited. OK, so while everyone gets out the app and uh, make sure that they're logged in, and before we do our first poll, I have the privilege of handing it over to one of our co-hosts for today, Ambassador Baiba Braja, who is NATO's Assistant Secretary General for Public Diplomacy. She has been such a fantastic partner for this effort, and she's been spearheading so much of NATO's youth engagement. She's graciously welcomed us into NATO headquarters today. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Ambassador Baiba Braja. Thank you, Ambassador. Great to see you. <laughs> good afternoon, Europe. Good morning, America. Goedemiddag, Brussels. Labdien, Tere, Labas, Dindobri. We have 30 countries in the alliance now, and we expect to have more soon. And why? Why are we doing the Youth Summit at the time when we all know what is happening on the European continent when one country has dared to try to undermine the very basics of another country, the choice to choose their destiny, their freedom, the right of every single person in that country or our countries to make our decisions. That's why we care, all of us, each one of us, you, we as the Alliance, at 30 countries, 30 societies, but the whole global community has united behind making sure that why the alliance was established, the peace and security for our populations, to all of you, to all of us, that this peace and security in our countries is maintained, that we can sleep at night and make sure that our ambition with regard to education, private sector, careers, families, is actually able to continue. And why we have you today, more than 100 in person, thousands online, is because you will be taking over from us. My generation, generation of our forefathers who established the NATO alliance, the proud alliance, 
that has now for 73 years guaranteed the peace and security in, in our countries, soon will be yours. You will be in charge. We are doing our best to make sure that it's as good as an alliance as when we received it from our pizzas. So that's why we are having this conversation with you today. So make sure you question us, that you question the Secretary General who is coming next, that you question all the other leaders of NATO, of countries, but also you have those conversations among yourselves on the issues that matter to make sure that also for you and for you, your future, the alliance, this political military alliance, the strongest in the world, fulfills that basic function that we all as individuals and as collectives, as countries want, to give us that peace, security, and predictability in our countries and elsewhere. So today, you are participants. You are not listeners. You are not audience. You are the ones to participate, to make sure that you ask, you get questions, and you make your points strongly. Thank you very much for being here with us. And I, I really, I will be around the whole day listening to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. <laughs> Ambassador, thank you so much for your partnership in making today's event possible. Let's promise we're not going to let her down. I know you all have lots of opinions to share. And just so everyone knows, there will be a microphone that will be coming up here in the aisle. So when folks do have questions, uh, I'll encourage you to get up and to go there so that we can make sure we can hear all of you and our audience watching online can hear you as well. So to get us started now, I want to start with a test question so that we can make sure our app works and everyone is logged in and ready to go. So I'll ask everyone to get out Slido again. So just a reminder, when you're in the app, you hit the live stream tab, and then you see the button for Slido. And that will take you to the portion for Q&A um, and also for polls. So we're going to start in the polls section here. And the first question, which you can already see up on the screen, uh, is just a fun question to get us started. So what's the best part about youth events like this? It's been a while since we've been able to do this in person, uh, but I would like everyone to answer, whether you're online, at home, or here in the room. Take your pick. Is it uh, learning new stuff that you're most excited about? Is it the cool speakers? Is it meeting peers that are, you're sitting next to in the networking? Uh, or my favorite part, I'm biased, obviously, the great audience polls. Um, go ahead and, and take your votes. Uh, we'll come back to this in a second. But I just wanted to quickly highlight, as Ambassador Raja mentioned, um, Today's registered audience, we have nearly 1,800 young leaders that are watching today, nearly 78% of which are under 35, nearly half are women, and we have more than 92 different countries represented. So thank you so much to all of the organizations that helped to contribute and spread the word about this summit. We're so excited to have such a diverse group to engage today. All right, so let's just see if our... our uh, our poll works here. It looks like everyone is most excited to learn it, new stuff. We have a, a room of a bunch of nerds here who love learning. I love it. OK, fantastic. So now this means we can go to our next uh, poll, which I will ask uh, our team to put up. Excellent. This is our first real question. So what do you all see as the most pressing challenge to global security? Let's see, we have the weaponization of emerging and disruptive technologies. We have climate change. What about military action by Russia? We also have China's rise, the erosion of democracy, or the spread of nuclear weapons. So I'll let those results keep filtering in here. Uh, and while we are waiting, I I'm so honored to introduce our first session of the day. And what a better way to start than with the NATO Secretary General himself, Jens Stoltenberg. He has been at the helm of NATO since 2014, so he's seen quite a few things in his time at NATO. Not only did he oversee the biggest overhaul of NATO's collective defense since the end of the Cold War, but he's also been helping to position the alliance for the future. Some of you may have heard about uh, this process called NATO 2030, which is basically all about incorporating the views of young people, the priorities of people like you, to position the alliance for the next decade. So we will see if he can speak to the issue issue that you all see as the most important. And I lost our poll results, but uh, we'll come back to this for sure at the end. It looks like uh, a lot of you were still 
uh, putting in the numbers, so we'll come back uh, and check that in a second. I don't know if we can get the results up just before we go to the next session. Okay. Interesting. It looks like uh, the majority have chosen disinformation. Very interesting. So we will have to pick, uh, pick that up in our conversation with the Secretary General. So let me welcome to the stage uh, Mr. Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. I'm so great to see you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary General, thank you so much for making the time to be with us. It's such an important opportunity for the next generation of leaders to hear from you at this critical moment for transatlantic security. Thank you so much for having me, and it's a great pleasure to be here and to meet uh, this young audience, and also to meet with you, Lauren, and uh, many thanks to SEPA for, for organizing this event. It's really a pleasure to be here. Well, it is our pleasure and an honor to have you, um, and I wondered if maybe we could start with just I think the biggest issue on the table now, what's on everyone's mind, is the fact that we have a major war going on in the heart of Europe. Uh, I don't think that uh, our generation has ever seen anything like this, and I think indeed it's something many of our predecessors thought they would never see again in their lifetime in Europe. I mean, we're talking about tanks on a battlefield, but also the possible risk of nuclear war, and also this uh, humanitarian tragedy for so many Ukrainians. So what does this mean for an organization like NATO that was created to preserve peace in Europe? I mean, is it doing its job? So fundamentally, it means uh, that NATO is uh, more important than ever uh, because it really demonstrates the need for 30 allies from both sides of the Atlantic to stand together. Uh, fundamentally, NATO has two tasks in this uh, conflict. One is to support Ukraine, and NATO allies are uh, supporting Ukraine. The second task is to make sure that this uh, conflict doesn't escalate and become a full-fledged war involving uh, NATO and Russia, and that the NATO allies are attacked. And, uh, and both tasks are important. Uh, as you know, NATO allies um, are now providing a lot of different types of weapons to Ukraine to help them uphold their fundamental right for self-defense. This is a war of aggression. This is President Putin attacking another country uh, in a blatant way. And Ukraine, of course, has the right to defend uh, themselves. We help them uh, with that. Uh, but the second uh, task uh, is, uh, of course, to make sure that uh, the Baltic countries, Romania, uh, Poland, uh, um, all of the NATO allies uh, are not attacked and are not uh, uh, directly involved in the conflict. And therefore, we have uh, increased our military presence in eastern, especially in the eastern part of the lines. Uh, more than 40,000 troops now under direct NATO command in, the, in Poland, Romania, the Baltic countries, uh, to send a clear message to President Putin that uh, if one ally is attacked, the whole alliance will respond. That's deterrence, that's collective defense. And the reason to do that is not to provoke a conflict, but it's actually to prevent the conflict by, mm. by standing together. So, yeah. Briefly, that's, that's, that's what uh, NATO does. This is NATO's uh, 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 responsibility. Support our close uh, partner, uh, Ukraine. Uh, protect all NATO allies. That's great to hear, and it's a big job for sure. I know we'll come back to the, the war in Ukraine because I can already see some questions coming in from the app, so please feel free uh, to our crowd here and at home to send in your <coughs> questions, and I'll be looking for those there. But, Mr. Secretary General, to your point, I mean, NATO is now something that we hear about in the news all the time because of the war in Ukraine. Uh, it's in the daily headlines. And I think for a lot of us young people, that's something kind of new. Um, and so surrounded by all of these young leaders, I wanted to ask you a little bit about why NATO matters for them, particularly in their future. Um, a few minutes ago, we just took a poll to ask what do all of us think is the most pressing challenge for the uh, future of global security. Interestingly, the majority said disinformation. Um, so these are some of the non-traditional issues uh, that I know NATO has been working to, to adapt to and to incorporate some of the priorities of young people. Could you just tell us a little bit about how NATO has been adapting to incorporate the concerns of the next generation? Well, first of all, I think NATO matters for uh, everyone, uh, including young people, because NATO preserves peace. Uh, and of course, peace is fundamental for everything else. If you don't have peace, 
then you cannot have prosperity, you cannot have jobs, you cannot have a proper education, you cannot fight climate change. So this idea that in a way peace only matters for elderly people and uh, something else matters for young people, I think is absolutely wrong. Peace is important for everyone and NATO's core task, main responsibility is to preserve peace. And we have done that uh, successfully for more than 70 years and we are going to continue to do that uh, for uh, decades to, uh, to come. To enable people to live the, life, uh, uh, the lives they want, to enable people to do a lot of different things, uh, be it uh, uh, on, uh, on, on climate change or technology or whatever it is. Um, so that's my first response uh, to what, uh, why NATO matters for young uh, people. Mm -hmm. um, then, of course, many young people, young people in NATO and other countries today have not experienced war. Right. So for them, uh, they, sometimes you speak about that people live in deep peace, which in one way is good, because it reflects that people have not really experienced war in their own countries. Uh, but in one way, it's also dangerous, because if you take peace for granted, if you believe that peace will always be there, then you may make those mistakes that uh, create the conditions for a new war. So therefore, NATO's responsibility is to take actions uh, to prevent conflict, uh, to, uh, to have as the core message of NATO that an attack on one will be regarded as an attack on all, uh, and by, by doing that in a credible way, preventing any attack on any NATO allied country, as we have done for many years. Uh, this is also about disinformation or uh, adapting, because NATO is the most successful alliance in history for two reasons. Reason number one is that we have been able to unite North America and Europe. Uh, together we represent 50% of the world's uh, military might, 50% uh, of the world's uh, economic might, and of course as long as North America and Europe stand together in NATO, we are safe because we are by far the strongest and most successful alliance uh, in history and in the world today. So the one uh, what I say, reason for our success is the unity. The second reason for our success uh, is that we have been able to adapt to change when the world is changing. We, we, we did that during uh, the Cold War, after the Cold War, fighting terrorism, helping to end the ethnic wars in the Balkans, uh, and many other things. Now we have to focus again uh, fully on uh, uh, collective defense in Europe. Uh, we do that, uh, but also realizing that the threats are not always traditional military threats. Uh, they are still there. We see that in Ukraine. But for instance, disinformation uh, is part of that. Uh, NATO is pushing back. Uh, in, in the long run, I strongly believe that facts, the truth will prevail. Uh, so we are sharing facts. We are, we are pushing back when we see fake news, disinformation. Uh, I think actually the most important tool we have is a free and independent press. Journalists that are asking the difficult questions, uh, checking their sources, uh, criticizing people like me, uh, <laughs> being critical towards everyone, but by having a free and independent press uh, reflecting different views and different positions, uh, we are also uh, creating the best uh, ground for uh, uh, countering this uh, information. So protecting those core values is perhaps the most important thing we do to uh, counter disinformation. Absolutely. And we'll talk a lot about that more today. So thank you for the great preview. Uh, I know a lot of you have questions, so I'll ask our production team to get our mic out so we can get ready for those. But before I open it up for audience questions, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your own career path, because obviously we're surrounded by a bunch of superstars here and also online, maybe even a future secretary general out there. So uh, some of them might be following in your footsteps. And I wondered if you could just tell us a little bit about your own professional development. Um, I understand you got involved in politics back when you were a teenager. Uh, and so could you just tell us, you know, did you always know that you wanted to work in this field? And what is some advice that you might offer to these young leaders in their career journeys? So first of all, I'm very careful about giving advice to young people about their careers, uh, partly because uh, I think it's a bit pathetic when people who are in my age uh, give advice to you. Uh, many potential secretary generals sitting around here. Uh, um, and, and second, uh, the reality is that I never planned. I, I, I'm very, I, I, seriously, I, I, I didn't plan anything. Uh, it, it, it just happened. Uh, it's hard to believe, but that's the brutal reality. Um, but if there is one advice, uh, is that you should focus on what you do today. Don't think too much about the future. Don't think too much about career planning. <laughs> but just, if you are a student, focus on your studies. 
study hard, deliver good thesis, do the, 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 the real work as a student. If you're just starting a new job, focus on that job. And then I, I'm certain that new opportunities will open and then go for them. Uh, because if you are too eager to plan too much into the future, I think you, you get a bit uh, confused and people may also see that you are more focused on the next job than on the job you have. So, uh, so uh, that's perhaps my, my simplest advice. I, I didn't plan to become a politician. Uh, I, I actually I, I was engaged in politics as a young uh, teenager, but I decided to not become a politician because I decided to be something real, something serious. Uh, so I uh, studied uh, economics and mathematics and uh, statistics, and I started to work in the Central Bureau of Statistics in Norway as a statistician with a lot of mathematics uh, and uh, macroeconomic planning models, and that was my life. Politics, dirty stuff, science, that was me. <laughs> uh, then I was asked, uh, after two years, uh, to become the Deputy Minister for Environment. And I promised myself and my wife only for a couple of years. Now I've been there for 40 years in politics. I don't regret that, uh, but that was not my plan. My plan was to be something completely different. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so do as I have done. Don't plan, work hard, and then something nice will happen. That's some good, maybe unexpected advice, but I like it. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I'll ask our, uh, there's a few people that I'd like to go to for some questions. I'll ask uh, Irina Divoniak to start us off. Maybe you can stand up and go to the mic. Uh, we have a couple lined up here behind her, Federico Borsari, Emily Suzman. So if you all could get ready to ask your questions. But Irina, please. Yeah. Thank you very much, first of all, for this thought provoking talk. Uh, as Lauren said, I'm Irina Divanyan. Currently, I am a trainee at the European Commission, and I come from Ukraine. Uh, and my question is following. Um, in thinking about um, what could keep Ukrainians safe um, after Russian war, in your view, what might be um, a security guarantee um, that um, could be sufficient for Ukraine on the one hand? and also that um, the North Atlantic partners are ready to offer on the other side. Thank you very much. Well, so first of all, it is important to end the war. Uh, and it's uh, President Putin who started the war, and he can end the war tomorrow. Uh, so we will continue to put the maximum pressure on President Putin uh, to end the war by imposing sanctions, by providing economic support, but also military support to, to Ukraine. And we need to be prepared for the long term. Uh, it's a very unpredictable and fragile uh, uh, situation in uh, Ukraine, uh, but there is absolutely the possibility that this war will drag on and last for months and years. So uh, we are now uh, uh, at NATO, NATO allies are preparing to provide support over a long period of time and also help Ukraine to uh, uh, to, to transit uh, or, or move from old Soviet era equipment to more modern uh, NATO uh, standard uh, weapons and systems that will also require more uh, training. And we also welcome the US led uh, effort uh, uh, which took place on uh, the air base Rammstein this week to coordinate better among uh, NATO allies and partners on how to provide the support. So that's in, the mo in one way the most immediate task. Then, of course, Ukraine is and will remain a highly valued partner of NATO. And, uh, and we have worked with Ukraine for many years uh, on its Euro-Atlantic aspirations and supported Ukraine's move towards me uh, NATO membership. And we will continue to support those uh, efforts. Uh, but that's in a situation where we have peace, where we have been able to end the war. Uh, and then, of course, uh, what kind of security arrangements, what kind of uh, uh, frameworks is something also we need to sit down and discuss with Ukraine uh, when the war uh, has ended. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'd like to bundle uh, our next two questions because they're both related to tech. So, uh, Federico, I'll ask you to come up first, but also, Emily Susman, if you could get ready to ask just after Federico, because uh, Secretary General, maybe you can take these both at the same time. Federico. 
good afternoon. Uh, Federico Borsari from Italy, uh, working for SIPA. Uh, my question relates to um, uh, technological improvements and how is the alliance uh, working to, to sharpen its uh, technological edge given the, uh, the improvements of major adversaries such as Russia and China? And especially if you could give us some hints on how the alliance is also considering the use of armed drones uh, in uh, conflicts, uh, recent conflicts. Thanks. Thank you, Federico. And Emily? Thank you for having us. Uh, I'm Emily Sussman. I'm a policy analyst at Amazon Web Services. And I was hoping that you could speak to the upcoming release of the strategic concept and how you would like to see emerging and disruptive technologies represented in the planning document. And if you could also speak to uh, the role that private sector technology could be used to harness uh, EDTs for NATO's mission. Thank you. Well, technology has always been key to uh, NATO, and uh, uh, for NATO it is extremely important that we maintain what we call our technolo technological edge, meaning that we have the most advanced uh, uh, technologies in uh, the world. Uh, and of course, <coughs> sorry, and of course with a more competitive world, we also see, <coughs> of course, especially China investing heavily in new technologies. Uh, we need to uh, keep up uh, the pace and make sure that we uh, develop and invest more in technology as individual allies and as an alliance. So we have just established an um, innovation accelerator uh, for the North Atlantic. Uh, we call it Diana. Uh, we also established or in the process of establishing an innovation fund. And these are mechanisms to make sure that we work together with the private sector uh, to uh, uh, look into how we can develop and also use uh, new disruptive emerging technologies, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and many other te technologies as part of the efforts to make sure that we have the most modern systems and uh, modern technologies. Um, uh, this, of is this is, of course, something we do as nations, as, as states, but also the big advantage of NATO is that we have a very dynamic, vibrant private sector, and both the Innovation Accelerator and the Investment Fund is about linking the state sector uh, with the private sector to develop these technologies. Um, then on armed drones, so just say that <coughs> armed drones is one type of weapons, uh, and as and as for all weapons, they need to be used within uh, the limitation of international law. So it's not as if armed drones is very different than uh, cruise missiles or planes or artillery. Uh, weapons uh, can be used to protect freedom, democracy, uh, self-defense, as we see in Ukraine. But they can also be used for destruction, for aggression, for uh, uh, oppression. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, uh, weapons can be used for uh, defending human lives, but also to uh, commit uh, atrocities, uh, uh, war crimes. So regardless what kind of weapon we speak about, for NATO that is always the fundamental thing, that we are a defensive alliance, we are to defend NATO allies and protect our values. And, and armed drones is one of many uh, uh, weapons which have been used uh, to, for instance, protect NATO soldiers in NATO missions and operations. That's really helpful. And I mm. think you're right that it's not just about one type of technology. It's about being able to capture uh, a suite of technologies mm. for a, a capability. And uh, I think <coughs> relying on the private sector is key, given that they're driving so much of that innovation. Um, I'd like to take uh, one question from our app here, and then I'll ask uh, Ben Wheeler to get ready, because I know he has a, a question brewing. So Ben, if you're in the room with us, I'll ask you to come up to the mic. Um, but the question here from the app that I think is t very timely is, will Finland and Sweden potentially joining the alliance? If that uh, happens, would that boost the security of allies or would it risk conflict uh, with Russia becoming even more likely? First of all, it is for Finland and Sweden to decide whether they will apply for membership in NATO or not. And, and NATO will respect the decision regardless or whether it's yes, we will apply, or no, we will not apply. Uh, that's exactly the opposite of what Russia does. Because they try to intimidate, they try to, to, to coerce, they, 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 they try to threaten countries uh, to do what Russia wants. 
we actually respect the sovereign right of every independent nation to choose its own path. So if they apply, we welcome, we sit down and we negotiate and, and, and we have the NATO enlargement uh, over the last decades has been a great success across uh, the whole of Europe and has helped to spread democracy, uh, rule of law, uh, freedom across Europe. Uh, back when the Cold War ended in, uh, in, also in 1989 or in the beginning of the 1990s, NATO had 16 members, Western Europe, North America. Now we have 30 members, almost twice as many, and that of course with Central Eastern Europe, former Warsaw Pact uh, uh, countries, and of course that helped to spread democracy and, uh, <clears throat> and freedom across uh, Europe. So the right for every nation to choose its own path is fundamental for, uh, for uh, NATO, so we respect uh, Finland and Sweden regardless of the conclusion. Then if the conclusion is that they will apply, then we will welcome them with open arms, uh, because we believe that that will uh, strengthen Euro-Atlantic security. Finland and Sweden are already contributing to Euro-Atlantic security. We know them well. They are our closest partners. They are strong, mature democracies. Uh, they are our NATO's closest partners. We have worked for them for many, many years. They are EU members. Uh, so I strongly believe that uh, an accession uh, uh, process can go very quickly uh, and that uh, we will welcome uh, Finland and Sweden. And it will demonstrate to President Putin that he gets exactly the opposite of what he wants. He invaded Ukraine because he wants less NATO as at Russia's borders. What he gets is more NATO. It is the aggressive actions, the threatening rhetoric by Russia that has made so many nations in Europe decide to go for NATO membership. Yeah. And uh, if Finland and Sweden uh, applies, then that would be yet another example of exactly that. Right. And it's ironic because you know, part of President Putin's aims has been to divide the alliance and to weaken it by pitting allies against each other, but actually all of his actions have made NATO stronger and more united. So it's really uh, the opposite. Um, okay, so I know Ben is here with a question. So Ben, over to you. So yeah, on the topic of Sweden and Finland joining NATO, it is definitely a long-term trend of Russia starting low uh, intensity conflicts with those who seek to join the alliance. Is NATO willing to offer any security assurances during the application process to Sweden and Finland? I'm absolutely certain that we will find ways of uh, handling uh, and assure them during that transition period uh, from uh, a potential application to the final ratification uh, throughout the alliance. And just the fact that they apply and that we uh, uh, sit down with them um, and, uh, and negotiate an accession protocol will send a very strong uh, uh, message of commitment. We are all very close to Finland and Sweden. Uh, so I'm, uh, we are talking with Finland and Sweden on how also to, to, to deal with uh, and to provide the necessary assurances in that interim period. Great. Thank you. Mm. Great. I have one more question from the app here um, that I think uh, it would be great to get your thoughts on because I know, uh, as you mentioned in your earlier in your career, you spent a lot of time working on climate and environmental issues, and I know this has been one of the top priorities for you in terms of working this into NATO's agenda. Could you talk a little bit about how NATO plays a role in combating the security implications of climate change? Well, as you said, uh, in my previous life, before I became Secretary General of NATO, I was very much engaged in climate uh, change issues, actually since, since I worked <laughs> as a statistician in the Central Bureau of Statistics, because my, my first task was then, in the, this is in the 19, late 1980s and the beginning of the 1990s, was to just develop uh, proper statistics to, to count uh, emissions of greenhouse gases. Uh, and also to integrate emissions into macroeconomic planning models, which we use in Norway and many other countries. So if you have uh, uh, increased consumption or increased investments, uh, how will that affect uh, emissions of uh, greenhouse gases? So that, that is something I worked with uh, on for many, many years. And, uh, and just before I was appointed as Secretary General of NATO, I was uh, <clears throat> the UN Special Envoy on Climate Change, working on the preparations for the upcoming Paris climate change meeting that led yeah. to the pa pa right, Paris right. Accord. Uh, then, of course, when I moved to NATO, then climate change was no longer my main responsibility. It was peace and security. But climate change matters for peace and security uh, because global warming, climate change, has security implications. 
it fuels conflicts, it forces people to, uh, to move, uh, more droughts, more, more extreme weather, more windier, wetter, wilder weather creates uh, the, 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 the breeding ground for conflicts, more competition about scarce resources, water. Uh, so climate change fuels conflicts, conflicts fuels war, and therefore it matters for NATO. Uh, and we need to understand, and we have started also the work in NATO to, to fully understand the link between climate change and security. Second, NATO has to be able to adapt, because we operate, for instance, in Iraq. And uh, last summer they had several days, so more than 50 degrees Celsius. And of course, what kind of equipment, what kind of uniform, uh, what kind of supplies of water, everything you do is impacted by the climate that surrounds the, the soldiers which are operating there out in nature, without air condition, but in, uh, in, uh, uh, in nature. Uh, and second, melting of the ice in the, in the Arctic matters for the whole um, strategic situation up there with the opening up of new uh, sea routes uh, and uh, it affects the way our military can operate in the high north. So the heat in the south and the melting ice in the north matters for our security and we need to, rising sea levels will impact our naval bases. So how we operate, uh, where we are located with our bases, uh, what kind of equipment, all of that will be impacted uh, by climate change and we need to adapt NATO so we can exercise, uh, do our job in more extreme uh, weather. Uh, and thirdly, NATO has a responsibility to reduce emissions because, of course, heavy battle tanks, big naval ships, uh, jet uh, uh, planes, all emit greenhouse gases or uh, CO2. Mm. And uh, if we're going to reach global zero, we need also to reduce the emissions from the military sector. Um, but we need to do that without reducing our readiness, without reducing the capabilities of our armed forces. So the challenge is to find the technology which is clean, but also effective. Okay. I'm absolutely certain that that will happen, because if you look at the civilian sector, you see that the most modern cars, the most modern vehicles, are not fossil fuel, they are electric. So at some stage, it will be impossible for the military sector to continue with fossil fuel, while the rest of the society has turned to uh, green technology. So, but NATO has to be uh, ahead of the curve, we have to be uh, driving that process, towards greener military technology, which is effective also from a military standpoint uh, and a military approach. Thank you so much. I know we had one more question. Is there someone in the audience, uh, Elif, a young woman from Turkey? Um, perfect, I think you had a question on China, and I'm sorry to our production team, we need our mic back for a second. Um, perfect, and I'll just ask you to keep your question short because we're running out of time. Yes, of course. I'm Elif from Turkey, currently a student at the College of Europe, and my question was in regards to the rise of China as a power and how do you anticipate to be mentioned in the new strategic concept? Thank you. Thank you. Well, so I expect uh, to, uh, that China will be um, reflected in uh, the new strategic concept in a totally different way than today. Because in the current strategic concept, China is not mentioned with a single word as if China doesn't matter for our security. The current strategic concept was agreed uh, in 2010. Uh, now the world has changed. And of course, China, we don't regard China as an adversary, but the rise of China has consequences for our security. China has the second largest defense budget. They have the biggest navy, and they are investing heavily in new, modern nuclear uh, missiles, long-range missiles, hypersonic missiles, uh, China doesn't share our values. We see how they crack down on democratic rights in Hong Kong, the Uyghurs, uh, and, uh, and how freedom of press and, so, and, and, and freedom of expression is, is, are values they don't respect. And then we also see that China is coming closer to us. We see them in the Arctic, we see them in Africa, and we see also China trying to control critical infrastructure, for instance, 5G in our own countries. All of this matters for our societies, for our security. And therefore, NATO has to address those, reflect that in the new strategic uh, uh, concept. That includes technology, it was mentioned previously. It includes, uh, uh, of course, resilience of our infrastructure, electricity,
uh, roads, uh, 5G, our critical infrastructure. And it also uh, uh, makes it even more important that NATO works together with partners like Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea, like-minded democracies to stand up for our democratic values, freedom of press, democratic values uh, uh, around the world. NATO will remain an alliance of North America and Europe. We will not become a global NATO, but we need a global approach in this region, North America and Europe, because we are faced with global threats and challenges. One of them is the rise of China and authoritarian power working more and more closely with Russia. That matters for our security. That will be reflected in the new strategic concept. And therefore, I would just end by saying this. That reflects the success of NATO, that we change and the world is changing. So we are young as an old organization. I love that. Well, we have just one minute left, so maybe I'll ask you one final quick question, because I know many of us here uh, maybe one day hope to serve at NATO or in government or in some other international institution. What is the most challenging part of your job and your favorite part of your job? Uh, my main uh, favorite is to meet people. Also, I love people. I, I, I'm, a pol I'm, I'm still a politician. I, I try to hide it, but that's the <laughs> reality. Uh, so so uh, to be a politician, you, you need to like to be together with people, to, to, uh, to advocate, to campaign. Also, in my previous life, I campaigned for my party. Now I campaign for another uh, cause, and that is the idea of North America and Europe standing together. And I believe in that. And, and, and I'm inspired by being allowed to do that and then to work together with a lot of excellent, uh, dedicated uh, people in my staff. So that's a, a huge privilege. Uh, um, then what I like, no, of course, what I don't like is that we don't always agree. Uh, so then, uh, then it's like a family. It's better when we are, uh, as I say, there's a good family dinner than when you have a bad family dinners. So. Uh, <laughs> So sometimes we need to work on, on, on differences. And there is no, no way to hide, no reason to hide that when we are 30 allies from both sides of the Atlantic, with different culture, different history, different geography, different political parties in power, there are sometimes differences. And to deal with them, to, to, to find a compromise, to reconcile different views, is, uh, is perhaps the most important part of my job, but also the most, most demanding part of my job. But what inspires me is that despite all these differences, we always are able to agree around the core task to protect and defend each other. And as long as you do that, we are safe, uh, we preserve peace, and you can continue to do what you want. That's a great note to end on. And uh, thank you so much, Mr. Secretary General. Thank you to all of you for your questions. Thank you for all the work you're leading. And thank we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Fantastic. What a treat and a great way to start us off. Uh, next up, I have the distinct honor of introducing His Excellency Pedro Sanchez, who is the president of the government of Spain. Uh, now, some of you probably know President Sanchez will actually be hosting the next major NATO summit, which will take place in June in Madrid. It will be a consequential summit for sure, because it will mark the release of NATO's next strategy. Some of you NATO nerds in here have already said strategic concept, which is what we call NATO's next strategy. It will guide the alliance for the decade to come. So lots to come out on that. We've also already mentioned the possibility that at the summit we might be discussing two more uh, members joining NATO, uh, Finland and Sweden, perhaps. So there will be a lot to watch for. Let's hear what President Sanchez has to say about the upcoming summit and the role of all of you in shaping NATO's future. It is my pleasure to address this NATO Youth Summit only some weeks ahead of uh, hosting the Madrid NATO Summit in late June. This edition takes place in very challenging times when the Euro-Atlantic security architecture is being dramatically questioned by Putin's war against Ukraine. The invasion of Ukraine is not only a violation of its uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty, it is also a frontal attack to the core values of NATO and to the security architecture that has for so many years ensured peace and prosperity in Europe. We are facing the greatest threat to global peace and security since the Second World War. This is a turning point in our history. We must make the right decisions because they will profoundly shape the future for the generations to come, such as yours. First, we must maintain the unity of those of us who believe in democracy, in the rules-based order 
and in the protection of human rights and freedoms. Unity is our best deterrent tool. With our unity, with the unity of all NATO allies and that of uh, many other countries in the international community, we will send a clear message and forceful message in defense of the values and principles in which we believe. Second, we must remember that security is the precondition that makes our way of life possible. It is uh, what feeds a healthy democracy and supports our economy. This war has reminded us that we cannot take our security for granted. It is true that this war has high cost. However, I can assure you that doing nothing and allowing Putin to sweep through Ukraine would be the end of Europe. Europe itself is at stake, not only the present of Europe, but also its future, your future. And make no mistake, security does not come for free. We will have to invest in defense and security in the coming years. If we want to stop the war, our best option for the future is to strengthen our deterrence. For that, we need modern, powerful, credible and available military capabilities. Achieving these capabilities requires uh, high defense spending. It is an expensive policy, but uh, even more expensive in uh, economic and human terms is to fade an armed conflict. Third, we must make the Madrid-NATO summit in late June a great success. It will definitely be a historic summit for our allies. It will define the organization's strategy for the next decade. If we want to leave you a legacy of freedom, democracy and peace, we have to make decisions to strengthen our allies and provide it with the adequate tools and capabilities. We have to show our determination to make it fit for purpose for the 21st century. At the beginning of the 2021, a group of young leaders presented a remarkable uh, document uh, with their views of what uh, the NATO 2030 process should take it into account. This document uh, had a very inspiring title, Embrace the Change, Guard the Values. These six words uh, contain the goals that should uh, guide us in the coming years. To prepare ourselves for the deep change in our environment, but uh, without forgetting the values and principles of, for which we stand. These are precisely the goals included in the Washington Treaty 73 years ago. They remain valid today, democracy, individual freedom, and the rule of law. I can assure you that uh, they will continue to inspire and guide our action in the coming future. We have chosen to be on the side of peace and international law and not on the side of force and global chaos. We will uphold our commitment to our shared values and principles, but we need to do it with you. I call upon you to help us in this collective endeavor. Thank you very much. Well, many thanks to President Sanchez for that message. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our very first panel, which I think will cover the most pressing topic on everyone's minds. We've already talked about it a little bit, the future of European security. As Russia tries to redraw borders by force with its unprovoked and unjustified war in Ukraine, what will this mean for our Euro-Atlantic institutions? And what about the wider rules-based global order? These are tough questions, but we have a great panel to help us answer them, including some folks that are already joining us on stage, and well, as well as some folks that will join us online. Um, again, I will encourage everyone to go into the app and submit your questions there. Our moderator will continue, just as I did in our last session, to work in your questions that come in. So don't be shy. Please send your thoughts our way. And now I will hand it over to our moderator, Amy McKinnon, who is national security and intelligence reporter at Foreign Policy. Amy, thank you so much, and over to you. Thank you, Lauren, for that wonderful introduction. Hello, everyone. Good morning from Washington and good afternoon to those of you joining us from Europe. My name is Amy McKinnon. I'm a national security reporter with Foreign Policy, and I'm delighted to be your host for this incredibly timely discussion about the future of European security. Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February sent shockwaves around the world. Unspeakable images of bombed out cities and mass graves have evoked some memories of the darkest chapters of Europe's 20th century history. Images that many of us would have hoped were a thing of the past. 
It has also posed a direct challenge to the international security order and the stakes could not be higher for Ukraine's future and for that of European security. But just as the destruction of World War II opened the way for a new conception of Europe, the shock of the Russian invasion of Ukraine offers the possibility of re revitalizing the European security order and the challenge of navigating an increasingly contentious relationship with Russia. But what should that order look like? The, world in, the war in Ukraine has served as a clarifying moment for the alliance, which is now more united in its core mission. But as it approaches the Madrid summit and the release of NATO's next strategic concept, which will guide the alliance's goals for the decades to come, several questions remain. In our session today, we're going to explore the short and long-term implications of the new security reality in Europe and how NATO should adapt and respond. Joining me to explore these pressing issues, I'm very delighted to welcome our distinguished guests. We have General John Allen, President of the Brookings Institution. General Allen is a retired U.S. Marine Corps four-star general and former commander of the NATO International Security Assistance Force and U.S. forces in Afghanistan. Delighted to also welcome Angret Kamp Karrenbauer, the former Minister of Defense of the Federal Republic of Germany. We also have Captain Thorben Pfeiffer, aide de camp to the Director General of the NATO International Military Staff, and of course, Alina Polyakova, the President and CEO of the Center for European Policy Analysis. And before we dive in, I just want to echo Lauren's reminder earlier that you can submit your own questions, whether you're joining us online or in person using the, using the Summit's app. So given that we have so much to discuss, I want to give our speakers the opportunity to offer some remarks to help set the scene. Um, I ask you all, much as this is a very weighty topic, um, to keep your remarks as brief as possible and then we, around two minutes, and then we can really get into things. Um, I'd like to start with General Allen. Um, General, could you put Russia's invasion of Ukraine into context for us? Just how has this changed the security landscape for the NATO allies? Well, first, it's uh, terrific to be with this forum. <clears throat> I believe in it very strongly. The NATO Youth uh, Summit and, the, and this forum, continuing forum, is very, very important to the future, obviously. Let me just show you a quick picture. This is the front of my house uh, in Mount Vernon, Virginia. And on homes all over America, we're flying the Ukrainian flag out of uh, sympathy for and support to and unit solidarity with uh, Ukraine. Look, the whole rest of the world, the the future of uh, our economic future, uh, the security uh, of Europe, the security of much of the rest of the world relies on a stable security environment in Europe. And the Russian invasion of an unprovocative, peaceful proto-democracy, Ukraine was getting it sorted out and it was well on the way to being a fully functioning democracy. Uh, the unprovoked invasion of Ukraine is a direct assault uh, upon the security of the Euro-Atlantic region, uh, the European continent, and that has uh, ripple effects that can uh, affect security completely around the world. Now, as an American general, as an American who commanded uh, a major NATO force in combat, uh, my attention isn't just focused on the Euro-Atlantic region. Uh, clearly, uh, East Asia and Asia is also an important part of American security uh, considerations. And the four February joint statement between Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping, which ties China and Russia together in their own vision of the future of the security environment of the 21st century has to be uh, at the heart of our thinking about going forward. So as Russia and China have come together with their own vision of human rights and democracy and sovereignty, with their own view of NATO, with the whole issue of the denazifying of uh, Europe, uh, with their intention to work together on issues associated with internet security and security environment writ large, this is a much bigger issue. Even though as horrible as it is, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is something that should have our attention and the Ukrainians should have our support. While it affects the Euro-Atlantic security arrangement, it is a much bigger, it's a global issue, and we should be attentive to that uh, more broadly. 
And then finally, very two quick, very points. Uh, we need to think in Europe more carefully in NATO in particular, the EU and any potential members of Europe about economic security as well as military security. The challenges that we face uh, today in terms of bringing the private sector together with the resilience of our civil society and our legitimate security concerns, those have not been brought together as they need to. And so the evolving security concept or the strategic concept, which we hope to roll out at the Madrid summit uh, in June, that has to account for the economic security of Europe and the Euro-Atlantic uh, region going forward. Thank you. Thank you for those remarks, General. Um, I'd now, now like to turn to Anna Gret. Um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has triggered a major strategic shift in Germany in an astonishingly short space of time, from the ramping up of defense spending to plans to wean Russia off, uh, wean Germany, sorry, off of Russian energy supplies. What do you make of these shifts in German security and defense policy that we've seen over these past two months? So uh, first of all, hello to um, everybody. It's great to be uh, with you uh, here. And um, let me talk, um, so what's on the table right now? Um, I think uh, today it's day 64 of Russia's unjustified, brutal and devastating war against Ukraine. And Putin attempts to reshape the world poses dark questions to us, not just in Germany, but all over the world. We know that Putin will not succeed, but we also know that there is no possible return to the world order before February 2022. We now have to be determined about two big issues. First, what kind of world do we want to create? And second, are we, really, uh, are we willing, are we really willing to shape and defend the world we prefer. My answer today, it's very clear. We will not leave the shaping of the world to dictators who are using military aggression and criminal wars to advance their imperial ambitions. We will not leave order to self-empowered lifetime rulers who deny it to their people the liberty they crave and to exert violence and brutality at home and abroad. We, the like-minded allies in Europe, the United States and Canada, and our partners from the Indo-Pacific to the Middle East to Africa, do not have to agree on every single item, but we need to share the fundamental concepts on how we shape the world. If we accept this role, the starting point is quite simple. Our will and our determination need to be strong, really strong. We have to be ready to stand up against the enemies of a rules-based order, if necessary, also by military means. Let me, let me quote Konrad Adenauer. Konrad Adenauer, as chancellor leading post-war Germany into NATO, said in 1957, we can restrain the world's aggressor only if he knows that if he were to aggression, the blowback would destroy himself. I know that sounds terrible, but it is realistic thinking. And as things stand, we must think realistically. For some Europeans in NATO, and especially for my country, Germany, this is still a deeply disturbing, challenging thought. But the reality is right in front of us. Russia's war against Ukraine asks for Zeitenwende. And the true turn of times can only mean that we support Ukraine now with all means to resist Russia's brutal aggression. And more fundamentally, that we Europeans have to become first-class military powers ourselves. That brings me to my last point. Security, it's a long game, a multi-layered one. If we want real security, we have to discuss security in the same context as, for example, climate change or sustainability. Security is an issue of generational justice 
especially if security provides freedom. I ask you, the participants of the NATO Youth Summit, to be very tough with your governments at home. Make sure they understand the military side of generational justice. We need to make tough decisions today if we want a safe, free, self-determined and dignified life in the future. That is what the Ukrainians are fighting for. And that is what we must be fighting for as well. Thank you. Thank you for those remarks. And there is a lot to unpack there that I'm looking forward to discussing with you as we go forward. I want to, to bring in Alina now. Alina, what is your assessment overall of the transatlantic community's response to the war thus far? What more should NATO allies be doing or, or not doing, perhaps? Well, thank you so much for that question, Amy. And it's wonderful to see General Allen and uh, uh, Akaka, as we all uh, uh, call the minister, and to be here with you for this important summit. Um, a couple of thoughts uh, on your question. One, this has been unprecedented moment of unity for the alliance. There's no question about that. Um, as John also pointed to, and I think as uh, Madam Minister also pointed to, and as Secretary General said earlier in his remarks, you know, Russia wanted to divide NATO with this war in Ukraine, and has gone the exact opposite. Uh, we have a NATO that is far more united, and in fact, countries like Finland and Sweden, who since the founding of NATO uh, were determined to remain neutral and not aligned, are now seriously considering uh, being part of the alliance uh, for their own collective defense and security. So Russia has started a new trend of potential expansion of NATO that we did not predict happening at this time. And frankly, it's given NATO purpose. And when Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014, we have to remember this war has been happening now for over eight years. Um, this is the most recent phase, it's the most brutal, the most violent, um, the most uh, atrocious uh, stage of the war, but Ukraine has been a war for eight years. And when Russia invaded uh, Ukraine in 2014, that reignited NATO's purpose, that re-energized NATO, but we haven't seen the alliance united in the same way now. And I think it's not just on the security side. You know, we've seen incredible cooperation in Europe, the United States, G7, and other allies and partners on sanctions and economic pressures on Russia, because we cannot face uh, the brutality of what we see day in, day out in Ukraine um, as we think about this vision of never again. Never again will we allow genocide, will we allow uh, human violence against innocent civilians be as brutal as we saw during World War II. And of course, what is happening in Ukraine today is exactly what we wanted to prevent. So I think this has been an incredibly united moment for the alliance. Um, obviously, there's more we can do. And here's, uh, I come to just a, a quick second point. You know, we as democracies and as an alliance of 30 members, you know, we're, this is not an authoritarian uh, state. You know, it's not uh, Mr. Putin gives an order and the military does what he says. Now, we take time to make decisions. That is the nature of democracy, is the nature of a multilateral alliance. But what that also means is that in crisis situations, that means that we are often delayed because it takes time to organize, it takes time to make strategic decisions. I think now, uh, over two months into the war, we now see a United States that's provided massive amounts of security assistance in a way that we didn't see uh, at the beginning of the conflict. Uh, I think the U.S. has now provided almost $4 billion, $4 billion in military aid uh, to Ukraine. That's just since February 24th. We've seen the EU take a step towards that as well. And of course, we've seen uh, countries like Poland, the Baltic States, Germany, almost every single EU member now delivering arms and assistance um, to Ukraine. But I think there's much more we need to do because right now we're in, in a critical moment in the war. And I can't uh, under estimate or underemphasize how critical it is that Ukraine wins. You know, Secretary Austin said this very recently during his visit to Kiev uh, with Secretary Blinken from the United States, that our goal as an alliance, not just as the United States, has to be driven by a vision of victory for Ukraine. Why? Why is that? Now, why should we not settle for Ukraine that is, let's say, divided and partitioned, as Germany, unfortunately, was for many decades? I think we learned from that experience that those walls, those kinds of divisions of countries, of democracies, don't work. 
and seeing the kind of atrocities that the Russian military has unleashed in Ukraine, it is a moral and ethical question whether we would be, as an alliance of democracies, content uh, with that price of growing uh, violence, more refugees, if Russia does end up occupying a part of Ukraine. Because what happens in Ukraine today will determine the future of European security order. As General Allen rightfully said, this is not just about Ukraine, this is about European security writ large, so global security. If the biggest, if, the, if we are able to ensure the Ukrainians can not just defend themselves, but regain their full territorial integrity, that will be a huge win, not just for NATO, not just for security, but for democracy. Because that's really what we're talking about here. We're not talking about one conflict to one country somewhere in Eastern Europe. We're talking about the future of the democratic order. We're talking about the future of democratic societies versus a very different vision for our societies driven by authoritarian visions. And I think all of those uh, young, young people who are listening, who are um, in the room um, in Brussels and NATO HQ, I think you really need to think, we all need to really think about collectively what kind of world do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a world where we can enjoy all those things we've taken for granted, like moving across borders freely and being able to use our cell phones in any country, uh, to say the very least, uh, but to live in a world of peace and, and prosperity? That's really what's at stake. It's that vision of the world that's at stake in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. Um, I now want to turn to Thorben, who is joining us from uh, from Brussels, from NATO HQ, who's been waiting patiently. Um, <laughs> whilst welcome, uh, whilst Thank Russia is is likely to dominate our conversation today, I feel like I would be remiss if we didn't touch at least briefly on on the pacing threat from China. Um, and General Allen touched upon some of these things in, in his opening remarks, but. How should the alliance balance this acute threat from Russia with this pacing threat from China? And, and what does this deepening Russia-China relationship mean for the alliance? Uh, first of all, thank you very much. And as I saw some raised eyebrows here, uh, because before the sec gen was sitting here and now they are asking themselves maybe what the junior captain is doing. Uh, I think it's good to have a military uh, uniform um, uh, worn by a young soldier under 35 uh, here on stage. And uh, Amy, thank you very much for the question. Um, I think this balance is uh, very delicate because um, the threat, the imminent threat, uh, is on the table now. Uh, and everyone is thinking about Russia. Um, and this will be reflected, as the section said before, uh, also in the strategic concept. Um, but China is a very good example how we are entering now an era of uh, blurred lines, of blurred lines between uh, the condition of peace, uh, the condition of crisis, uh, and the condition of war. Uh, where are we now? Uh, we are delivering uh, weapons to support the Ukraine. Uh, are we part of this war now or not? Are we in a crisis? Is this still a condition of peace? Um, and of course, China uh, is always capable uh, to prick us uh, as an alliance uh, and also um, as an, as an uh, single uh, ally. Um, and uh, therefore, we have to be vigilant. And uh, what my uh, previous speakers have mentioned as well, uh, we need to be coherent. This aligned the alliance is coherent as it never was before, uh, to my mind. Uh, and I'm, like all of uh, you here in the room, um, one of the post-Cold War uh, generation, and uh, we took peace for granted, and uh, we have to be vigilant, um, not also concerning Russia, but also China, uh, to act also under the threshold of war, under the threshold uh, of a crisis, um, and we have seen the statistics. You know, the most of the young people um, saying, okay, disinformation is um, a huge threat to us. And this is what I see um, at first uh, in the conjunction uh, to China and uh, the emerging threat from there. From there. So uh, a balance is very delicate um, to protect and shield our one billion people. Uh, but NATO is capable and uh, NATO will be ready for this. 
Thank you for those remarks, Captain. Um, I'd like to stay with you for my next question. Something that many of our speakers have brought up is this remarkable unity that we have seen within the Alliance in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But there are already cracks beginning to emerge, particularly when it comes to areas of critical national interest, such as energy security. What can be done to maintain unity within, NATO, within institutions such as NATO, but also the European Union? And what are the implications if this unity fractures further? Yeah, coherence is the center of gravity. Yeah? So uh, we have the big institutions with very distinctive toolkits. Uh, we have NATO. Uh, with a very unique military toolkit. Uh, we have the European Union uh, with a very capable and very unique um, political toolkit. And uh, we need to try to stand together and to merge it together uh, as a complementary toolkit to give complex answers uh, to complex questions. Uh, the same as we cannot give uh, tactical answers to strategic questions. Uh, we are um, uh, we need to answer in the future. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, the coherence is the center of gravity. I can only stress it one more time. Thank you, Captain. Um, and as a reminder to our audience, you can submit your questions through the conference app. I'm already seeing some fantastic questions coming in, um, one of which I'm going to put to Alina. Um, there's no names on the question, so thank you um, for, for whoever submitted this question anonymously. Uh, but somebody asks, can Russia ever be trusted again? Uh, what would our conditions be to, to, to reintegrate them to European security architecture? And, and what will NATO do if Russia actually succeeds in Ukraine? This is a fantastic question. Unfortunately, um, given what's happening on the ground in Ukraine, um, and what we're seeing in terms of massive human rights violations, war crimes, potentially, even potentially genocide, um, it's very difficult to see how we return to some sort of quote unquote normal partnership with Russia. I mean, to be very frank, we have tried over and over again as an alliance, as the United States, to engage Russia, um, to have a policy that is stable and reliable with Russia to have a policy of reset with Russia, whatever you want to call it, we have tried to ensure that Russia can be a partner um, in the global world order. Um, Mr. Putin has very clearly said with his uh, invasion of Ukraine in February that he's not interested in that kind of partnership with the West, um, that he's interested in deploying military force uh, against a innocent country that did nothing to provoke this kind of violence. Um, and of course, uh, what we've also seen is inside of Russia, the narrative has been, um, you know, it's a different world that it seems like the Russian people are now living in because of the kind of disinformation that the Russian state media has been uh, deploying uh, to the Russian people. Uh, so the Russians do seem to, according to polls, or uh, always take them with a grain of salt in authoritarian state, obviously, do seem to be supportive of Mr. Putin's vision. So unfortunately, I think as long as we have this kind of authoritarian government uh, led by someone like Mr. Putin in Russia, there is no return to business as usual. And I think this is really going to end up in a really bad place for Russia. You know, Russia is not going to recover. Whatever happens on the ground in Ukraine, Russia as a country, the Russian people will suffer from this for a very, very long time. This is a huge strategic blunder by Mr. Putin himself, because first and foremost, he's destroying his own country at the same time as he's destroying Ukraine. Thank you, Alina. I now want to, to bring Angret back into the discussion. Um, on the day that Russia launched its invasion of Ukraine, you tweeted that you were angry at Germany's historic failure, um, which was the phrase you used. You said, we have not prepared anything that would have really deterred Putin. Can I ask you to expand on that here? And what did you mean by historic failure? Um, yeah, well, um, this was my, this tweet uh, was my very personal outcry of uh, deep uh, frustration. Um, I grew up during the Cold War. My first political experience was the heated and very fundamental discussion about uh, NATO's dual track decision. 
the deployment of Americans uh, pushing two missiles in Germany as a response to Soviet SS-20 uh, uh, missiles. Uh, that was a hugely successful decision. But later, we seem to have um, forgotten all lessons learned during this time. After the Soviet Union's collapse in uh, 1991, we all um, hoped, we all believed, um, me too, conflict between the West and Russia would be forever impossible. In uh, 2014, uh, Russia attacked Ukraine and occupied Crimea. And sure, NATO and uh, we as uh, its member states reacted to this aggression. Um, our intention uh, was to put pressure on Putin's uh, Russia and to prevent uh, similar attacks on other countries. Um, but we uh, have um, to, to ask ourselves uh, uh, today, have we been successful? When we look at Ukraine today, we must accept that we have failed. We were too hesitant. We did too little, too late. And that includes, sadly, and especially my own country. I want to stay with you um, for our next question. I mean, Ukrainian officials have repeatedly accused Germany of not doing enough to support Kiev and its war effort, um, accusing Germany of, of prioritizing its economy. And we have seen some shifts in that this week with the decision to provide more heavy, heavy weaponry to Ukraine. Um, but what do you make of these critiques from Kiev and how do you assess the level of support that Germany has given to Ukraine in the war thus far? So we, we, we must be aware the people in Ukraine right now are suffering unspeakable hardship, attacks, mass murder, rape, expulsion, the destruction of millions of uh, lives and hopes of a whole country. Ukrainians are fighting for their lives, for their homeland, for their freedom, and by the way, for our freedom as well. Ukraine is not a member of NATO. There is no Article 5. There is no fighting all for one. That makes it even more pressing that we provide whatever is needed, including artillery and other heavy weapons. And it means we have to stop, especially as German, we have to stop financing Putin's war machine to our energy imports and this as immediately as possible. Thank you. Um, I want to bring General Allen back into the conversation with us. Um, General, the war in Ukraine has really laid bare exactly where the borders of NATO lie. I mean, President Biden has vowed to protect every inch of, of NATO territory. Um, at the same time, of course, Ukraine has with support from NATO allies, with military aid, but has been on its own in this fight. What do you see as, how do you see the relationship with countries along the border of NATO evolving after this, after this crisis, after this war? What obligations does NATO have to countries along its borders, which are not members of the alliance? Alliance, but countries such as Moldova, Ukraine, Georgia, Sweden, Finland, not members, but whose own security is, is inherently tied to that of, of, of Alliance members? Sure, it's a great question. Um, let me come to a couple things first. I want to congratulate Germany and that young captain. If, uh, if Germany routinely produces captains like that, <clears throat> I think the future of NATO is in pretty good hands. Um, and let me come to Alina's uh, response to your question about trusting Russia. I hope we never trusted Russia, and I hope we never trust them again. Just look at the history, uh, the modern history, Chechnya, uh, Crimea. I was uh, deeply involved in the, the Russian intervention in Syria, where I watched them bombing hospitals routinely, civilian centers, bread lines. We, they, they are not trustworthy at all. We should engage with them, but we should do it with our eyes wide open and understand the history of the Rus and, and what they will do and the links that they will go to defend themselves, which is, which is playing out today every time we uh, recover a village of, uh, of Ukraine and see what they've done to the people. So we shouldn't have trusted them. 
we need to be very careful about ever thinking about that again. Engage, yes. Trust, no. Um, <clears throat> with respect to the border uh, of Ukraine, uh, and depending on whether Ukraine ultimately becomes a NATO member or not, uh, we've already seen under this Secretary General, and I have to I, I have to speak uh, uh, very uh, glowingly uh, and and very clearly, this Secretary General. Uh, and the senior leadership of NATO have provided extraordinary leadership in this crisis to this point. And then I really uh, commend uh, Jan Stoltenberg for what he's done. Uh, we're going to see uh, higher readiness forces, larger numbers of higher readiness forces in what I will call the frontline states. And I think uh, we should very seriously consider uh, the potential petition for Finland and Sweden to come into, uh, into NATO. Um, there's a lot of thinking going on in both of those capitals right now, and the public uh, view on becoming part of NATO is uh, has swung in favor of that idea. The issue is being run through Parliament, which is uh, typical of those uh, highly functioning democracies. And if they, if, if they petition to come into NATO, they, the process through the membership uh, action plan, uh, we should expedite that and bring them in as quickly as possible. It really secures the northern flank of NATO in many, in many ways. Now, people get very nervous about adding 830 miles of uh, additional NATO border to the Russian frontier. The Russians have, uh, have, I think, forfeited the right to have a, a concern about that, given what they are doing to Ukraine and what they're doing to the Ukrainian people. <clears throat> in Moldova, we should make it very clear that we'll support Moldovans. Uh, in their continued desire for uh, a so for sovereignty and peace. The Transnistria uh, sliver of the eastern side of Moldova uh, has Russian military presence in it. It's not consequential. And I, I think the Russians <laughs> in those motor rifle battalions uh, in Transnistria uh, would be very well served to not come out of uh, Transnistria into Ukraine. They're not going to last very long if they do. Um, but uh, those non-NATO partners have had a long relationship with NATO, the Partnership for Peace, uh, the uh, American relationships for Ukraine, and for example, called the State Partnership Program, where the California National Guard has had a long relationship with uh, Ukraine. The British have done extraordinary work in training the Ukrainian military, and the Russians are seeing the benefits of all of that uh, with, with their, uh, frankly, underwhelming military capabilities. Uh, coming up against what uh, looks what looks like a NATO force uh, in reality. So we have an obligation as an alliance to strengthen the eastern frontier, and we'll see that with enhanced readiness forces and larger numbers being based there now. Though they may be rotational forces, but I think we're going to see the basing there. Uh, and we'll also see serious consideration at the, at the Madrid summit of uh, inducting two new members, Sweden and, uh, and Finland. Uh, so you know, we'll see how this goes. Um, but I think that uh, the reconsiderations, as the minister said, the, the complete reconsiderations of the European security architecture is now on the table. And the worst nightmare that Putin could ever have uh, envisaged by this invasion of Ukraine is coming to coming to fruition and to reality right now. And we need to uh, exercise this moment uh, to strengthen NATO. Now, we have to be very careful not to inadvertently widen this conflict. And such comments as uh, the outcome should be to weaken Russia, that plays in Moscow like the potential for a regime change. And they may well widen their willingness to take certain steps to defend themselves. You know, the American president has said that Putin should not be permitted to continue to rule. Uh, so we got to be very careful what we say in public, because two things, it conveys a very clear message, uh, potentially an existential message in Moscow. You know, they probably deserve it. But it also has the effect in ad hoc uh, coalitions, and I created and led an ad hoc coalition against the, the Islamic State. People join these coalitions with a very clear mandate in mind. And the very clear mandate of this coalition was help Ukraine defend itself against Russian aggression with the hope eventually of a victory, whatever that means, and the expulsion of Russian forces from Ukrainian territory and the restoration of its territorial integrity. When we start to talk about something bigger than that, then people are going to have to think hard about in capitals uh, how they are able to justify that to their public. So we got to be careful to ensure that we control the escalation of this conflict and the widening of this conflict. It should be on our terms, not the Russians' terms, not Putin's terms.
Thank you, General. Um, I just I want to follow up um, with a question of something which has kind of puzzled me um, over the past few months, which is that in the build up to this, you know, starting in November of last year, we saw a real variation in degrees of alarm um, amongst European countries, amongst NATO allies, with the US really at the forefront of, of trying to raise the alarm about what Russia's intentions were. Other countries in Europe um, didn't appear to share that assessment. I'm wondering if, you know, first of all, what do you see as the reason for the for that discrepancy in the assessment of the risk and the build up to this war? And how can we make sure that um, ahead of future crises that NATO allies are more firmly on the same page? Well, I think the minister said it very well, and that is that national interests absent a major crisis and the invasion of Ukraine became a major crisis very quickly. But absent the invasion of a sovereign country, uh, national interests were uh, dominant in the thinking of countries with respect to how it would react and it, its willingness to react to what looked like a Russian military buildup, uh, long-term Russian military demonstrations along the border. Um, and so national interests really were very much uh, in, uh, in the minds of leaders in capitals. And we shouldn't be surprised at that. In the end, we're all democracies. Uh, and you know, thank God for what just happened in Paris. Uh, in France with respect to uh, that democracy. Uh, so I think what you saw was while these countries, our precious allies, um, all were still very committed to NATO, the idea that NATO would have to come together in, in the context of uh, defending its eastern frontier from a Russian invasion of a peaceful country on the Russian, uh, on the NATO frontier, uh, was still yet to be determined. And so right up to the moment that the first Russian tank turned to the south and uh, came down the main axis of its invasion to try to knock Kiev out of the out of the conflict very quickly and present us with a fait accompli, right up to that moment, national interests really were still very much in the minds of leaders. And once that invasion occurred, I think we uh, what we saw was, and Germany is a magnificent example of it actually, uh, the national interests suddenly were found to be very much in consonance with NATO interests and European interests and more broadly democratic interests. And let me just make a quick point. Freedom House, which is a think tank that has done a lot of work on democracy uh, and the state of democracy in the world, Freedom House has charted yet again for roughly the 16th year in a row the decline of democracy around the world. So, so many citizens of this global world that we live in live in less free or unfree societies. And so one of the things that we should do at a strategic level in this moment of coherence, in this moment of unity and solidarity is we need to think very, very hard about how the outcome of this strengthens democracy as a system of government and democracies in being able to see the world the same. Because I'll just tell the audience, please read the four February statement by the Russians and the Chinese. That manifesto, which is what it is, that manifesto is aimed directly at the heart of democracy as we know it. Uh, and this is why we should not be surprised at all that the Russians ultimately invaded. And we shouldn't be surprised uh, when people say, should we trust the Russians again? We shouldn't have to begin with. We should engage with them, but we shouldn't have to begin with. Democracy is really on the plate here. And the outcome of all of this should be how we as individual democracies, how we as an alliance, how we as a community of democracies globally, to include the Indo-Pacific, as the minister said, which has some of the finest high functioning democracies on the planet, how we as a community of democracies come out of this crisis, hopefully having a, a avoided catastrophe, but stronger as a system of government, stronger economically, and in a position where it isn't Russia and China who, who dictate the future of democracy and human rights and international law in the future, it's us the democracies who maintain the strength and our commitment to human rights and the rule of law and a system of government by the people for the people. Thank you, General. I think we have time for just one more question. And so I'd like to, to bring Alina back in to get her, her thoughts on, uh, on a very pressing question, which is, you know, the assessment now seems to be that I'm hearing from military analysts is that this could settle into being a very grinding war uh, with Russia looking to wage a war of attrition. 
What does NATO need to do to support Ukraine so that it can ultimately win this war? Well, unfortunately, um, I tend to think that those uh, assessments are correct. Uh, we've seen Russia, first of all, fail in its initial strategy uh, to quickly take uh, Kiev. Um, the Ukrainian resistance and the courage of the Ukrainian military pushed back that initial offensive. And now we've seen the Russian military regroup in the east, while at the same time launching uh, massive uh, attacks and bombings and missile uh, attacks on the rest of Ukraine to weaken it. I think what we're seeing now is that this is not about the short term. Um, as all of us, I think, here have said, uh, this is really about ensuring that Ukraine can defend itself going forward for the foreseeable future. And the more security assistance, the more weapons that the NATO alliance, the NATO member states uh, bring into Ukraine, that will actually make it much easier for Ukraine to eventually integrate into the alliance. Because de facto what's happening is that Ukraine's military force is being modernized at a much more rapid pace, of course, than it would have been otherwise. But I think it also presents several challenges. You know, if we're not thinking about the immediate short-term needs on the battlefield, how do we start thinking about investing in Ukraine's long-term military capabilities and democratic resilience? Very few democracies recover from a military conflict to become thriving <laughs> democracies once again. Of course, Ukraine is a young democracy. So we need to be thinking about now is how do we prepare, not just for what's coming around the bend tomorrow on, on the battlefield, but what is coming around the bend in six to 12 months. And I think from a security perspective, from a NATO perspective, that means we need to start thinking about how do we invest in modernizing Ukraine's military force? Um, how do we start building more partnerships to train Ukrainian military soldiers so they can use this new equipment they're being provided in a more effective way? Um, how do we ensure that they can maintain and repair the equipment that they have? Uh, right now, they're getting a lot of equipment that is you know, old Soviet-era main stuff because they can readily deploy it on the battlefield. But that's not going to last for the duration of the war, which um, you know, people like uh, General Milley here in the United States have said multiple times that this will be likely a multi-year conflict. So we're going to be in this crisis mode for a long time. And I think as... Uh, uh, minister said very, very aptly, for Europe, this presents also this broader challenge of dependence on Russia. You know, if this war isn't going to end, how can we morally justify continuing to feed uh, Putin's coffers by transferring billions and billions of dollars for energy supplies directly to Russia so he can, so Mr. Putin can continue to carry out this war? Those are the kinds of challenges ahead, and I think this is where the conversation is going. Uh, but it's going to take us a long time to really understand and start to put the kind of long-term capabilities in place to think about security, not just from a military perspective, but also from a broader resilience perspective. Thank you, Alina. Um, and whilst we could keep discussing this all day with, with our distinguished guests, I'm afraid we have to, to wrap up here. So General Allen, Annegret kramp karrenbauer Captain Pfeiffer, Alina, thank you so much for your time today, for sharing your insights with us. And I will now hand you back over to Lauren in Brussels. Thank you so much, Amy. Thank you, Captain Pfeiffer, for joining us in person. Such a great discussion. Uh, thank you all so much. So we've spent a lot of time now talking about the conventional warfare threat from Russia. But what about some of the unconventional ones? I'm talking about the ones that take place online, in cyberspace, in the information domain, on a digital battlefield, and in the battle for hearts and minds. Now I'm pleased to welcome Lucas Andriukaitis, who is Associate Director at the Digital Forensic Research Lab at the Atlantic Council. The DFR Lab does really fascinating work trying to counter disinformation and propaganda campaigns, even to disprove uh, and, and try and unpack crimes that happen online by breaking down all of the different pieces of evidence. So things like digital fingerprints and IP addresses, uh, geolocating photos, and uh, tracking social media posts. They played a role in exposing uh, the activity and presence of Ukrainian, uh, of, of Russian forces, excuse me, in Ukraine and also in Syria. They also do work to uncover election interference uh, across Europe. So really fascinating work. Today, Lucas is going to walk you through a geolocation challenge to show you what this work looks like up close and also maybe give you some tips to try it at home. 
So with that, get out your apps, please. There might be an interactive component at the end of this, so please go ahead and get ready. And with that, Lucas, take us away. All right. Uh, thank you so much for this kind introduction. My name is Lukas Andrukaitis. I'm an associate director here at the DFR Lab. And uh, as Lauren mentioned, we deal a whole lot with open source uh, techniques, methods, and, and other, other things to actually tell what is happening in, in various conflict zones. So it is very timely to talk about geolocation today. Uh, and I'm going to give you a brief, uh, a brief walkthrough. Uh, and at the very end, I'll give you a, a small, small challenge. So uh, for those who haven't stumbled uh, upon this wonderful method, uh, it's, it's basically a way to uh, figure out where exactly a photo or video was taken using various details and various other tricks. Uh, well, basically everything you can get out of the online, uh, out of the online space. So um, next slide, please. Uh, so basically, this is just a description. Uh, it's quite, quite, uh, all, all quite long and not as interesting. The way I like to explain geolocation is it's basically uh, trying to figure out where the photo was taken by looking at the details you can see that you can see in the background. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, yeah, if we see if we stumble upon something interesting online uh, before we can actually rely on it, we have to uh, we have to verify and figure out where it was taken. Next slide, please. So basically, by analyzing uh, analyzing what we see, we can pinpoint exactly where in the world uh, the photo the photo was taken, and hence make it into uh, open source online uh, online evidence. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we also try to visualize, but basically we try to uh, show every single detail uh, and contrast it with uh, openly available satellite satellite images, satellite maps, uh, and to prove. Uh, Prove that this photo was taken like that. As you can see, different colors, uh, different colors represent different objects between the photos taken and satellite maps. Next slide, please. Next slide. And basically, we have three very simple approaches for you to keep in mind: metadata, uh, reverse image search, and manual search. Next slide, please. Uh, basically, every single photo has metadata, and you can access access it uh, by using it, a, a lot of various online online tools uh, like Exit Viewer and, and so on. Uh, you can also uh, see uh, geotag data on, on on various social media outlets, which which can also give you some clues where it was taken. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, another slide, please. We also have the method of reverse image search, and we use it not only to verify where the, if the photo is genuine or not, but we can also try and find where it was taken. The idea is if the photo was publicly taken, most likely there are other similar photos of the same place online. And by doing reverse image search, we can find them quite, quite easily. Next slide. Uh, some of the tools that I, uh, I could recommend uh, is, of course, Google. Uh, so you, it's, it's very easy to use. You just click on the, the little Photo upload, uh, photo camera upload the photo, and uh, it'll give you all similarly looking photos uh, that the Google can find. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. And next slide. Uh, if you want to take it a, a, a little further, you can also install a by reverse image search or use Yandex, which is very good with uh, searching for for uh, various locations in the Russian space. Also, I can not, tell, not uh, emphasize enough how important it is to crop photos, basically to focus your uh, search on, on, on the part you want to see. If, you, for example, you're posting a, a photo of, uh, of, of this guy and you're interested in the, in the pool, uh, make sure to crop the, the pool because uh, then the uh, search engine can actually focus on the pool and give you better results. Next slide. And next slide. And lastly, there's manual approach which I could talk for hours, but basically it's uh, trying to basically like solve a, solve a riddle, try to figure out the deduct at all possible locations uh, and find it, find it like that. Next slide, please. So basically even in the photos where there's not a whole lot of, uh, a lot of details, we can still figure it out by reading, doing our due diligence and social media, uh, reading through various comments and, 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 and other clips. Next slide, please. Uh, 
And instead of looking at Himki region as a whole in Moscow, we can actually find the exact, exact hospital, which was also mentioned in this case uh, in the comments, the 19th hospital of Himki. Next, next slide, please. Next slide. So uh, once we do that, then you know the, the details start to uh, start to become clear. Uh, you can use Google uh, Street View or Yandex Street View to actually compare and contrast various details and such things as uh, the fence, as you see in the left corner, uh, starts uh, start showing a little easier uh, during daytime. Once you actually look on the Yandex on the Yandex Street View, you, you most likely would have missed that during the during the night photo. Next slide. And uh, here uh, we will try and do a geolocation challenge. So basically the idea is, is very simple. Uh, since um, a, a, big, a big thing in geolocation is to try and figure out how uh, 3D and 2D uh, sort of realities are, are uh, being combined. What I'm trying to say in, in fancy words is basically every single photo or video is in 3D. It has the X, Y, and Z. Uh, a coordinate axis, right? But if we're, talking, if we're dealing with satellite images, which we usually rely on uh, to uh, compare, compare it as a reliable source, we're dealing with 2D images. So it's basically only X and Y axis. So we need to make this little trick in our heads trying to figure out, hmm, if we see a photo of a truck, how would that truck look from satellite image? If we see a specific house with a specific roof shape, how would that, uh, how would that look? Uh, from satellite images. So uh, this is what I want you to try and do during these two challenges. I'm going to show you uh, two photos. On the left, uh, you're seeing the image I want you to try and geolocate. And on the right, you have two uh, possibilities, A or B. So uh, try and use the polling function to guess or estimate which, uh, which of the different pictures represents uh, the photo on the left. All right, uh, that's a very uh, uh, quite successful. Uh, oh, it's not, it's, it's not done yet. I'm actually, I don't see the final results. Well, uh, I think it's safe to assume that most likely most of you have more or less uh, guests. And uh, regretfully, uh, the correct answer, uh, the percentage is, is, is going down. The actual answer was, uh, was B. Uh, if you would have to analyze a little deeper and see that there's a distinct shape gas, gas station in the back on the right, uh, which can be also seen in the B picture on the bottom left corner. Uh, but let's try another time. Let's see. Let's see how how we'll succeed with the with the second challenge. Uh, the rules are exactly the same. Uh, the left on the left, you can see a photo of a car, and I want you to try and figure out where the truck is on the on the solid image A or on solid image B. Quite, quite interesting, uh, quite interesting results. Uh, for the, let's just give it a couple, couple more seconds. But uh, this time, you guys are correct. Uh, the the B, uh, the, the image B is the cor the correct answer. You would have to analyze a little deeper, uh, zoom in, and see that there's a network tower on uh, right besides the truck. And if you look really, really close, uh, you can also find that the same network tower on the picture B. So uh, the, the whole reason behind this exercise was to, to show you that uh, geolocation is not as hard, but it could be, it's very sort of uh, detail-oriented, right? Um, this time I gave you uh, options to choose from, 
But in reality, we have to deal with basically the whole world. Uh, most of the pictures can be taken anywhere in the world and no one gives us you know, different options to choose from. So uh, I hope uh, I hope this uh, this was an interesting uh, interesting experience for you guys. And if you're interested to learn more about geolocation, uh, don't forget to follow us on Facebook on the Far Lab. And on this note, uh, thank you and uh, give the and give it back to to Lauren. Thank you guys. Lucas, thank you so much for that fun presentation. Uh, I hope everyone learned something from that. Uh, sounds great. So we're going to stick with this theme of non-traditional threats, including in the information space, for our next session. We will have the privilege of hearing from people like TV producers and film writers and journalists and authors who work on this issue of uncovering truth in today's complex security environment. They will talk about how they use new media to help shine a light on the facts around us, to expose uh, atrocities and conflict zones, to help counter propaganda and disinformation campaigns, and really to speak truth to power. Now I will hand it over to someone who knows these issues better than most, Edward Lucas, who is a senior fellow at SIPA and also was a longtime uh, senior editor at The Economist. Uh, again, if everyone just would like to send in some questions via the app, we'll open up the Q&A session right now. And with that, Edward, over to you. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for taking part. Greetings from London, which is where I am. And what a fascinating presentation that was from DFR Lab. I can't wait to get going on those um, geolocation tools. And um, we have a blitzkrieg session here for just half an hour on the ex extremely interesting questions of information warfare and what we've uh, what we've learned so far. And I've got, delighted to be joined by um the three panelists, who I'm sure will be familiar to many of you, if not all of you, Jessica Aro, who was the um, Finnish journalist who exposed the troll factory and received a full um, onslaught of Russian um, attacks as a result. Um, Andrea Chalupa, who is a uh, journalist and author, Peter Pomerantsev, who wrote Nothing is True and Everything is Possible. And I, of course, am a senior fellow here at SEPA. So I'm going to get straight on to the discussion and I'm going to start off by asking all three of our panelists for a very quick two minute take on what have we learned since February the 24th? February the 24th was clearly a geopolitical game changer, huge wake up call for the many Europeans who weren't paying attention, a vindication for the many other Europeans who've been warning for ages about Russia. But in terms of uh, the subjects that we're discussing here um, about information warfare and the role it plays in influence operations, um, what have we learnt? What's the, the biggest takeaway since February the 24th? Peter, I'm going to start with you. And I'm sorry, I lost you for a second. What was the question about the 24th? And what have we learned since the 24th? What's, what, what's the take? What, 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 if you look back on the last eight, nine weeks of war, um, in, in, in the field that we're working in, um, mm. what's, what's, what's the big takeaway? What have we learned? I mean, that's, I suppose I'm, I'm still far too close to it to really say what we've learned. We've learned that we have absolutely no institutional capacity to engage the Russian people. We've learned that... Um, uh, we've learned that this huge challenge, which is really where the war in many ways will be will be ultimately uh, won uh, with a change of political course in Russia. We have really very few institutions, no research, no virtually no kind of like capabilities to start that discussion. Um, we completely abandoned any attempt at creating any kind of de democratic communications infrastructure after the end of the Cold War. And all we've had is one video from Arnie, which was incredibly successful. Alan Schwarzenegger did a video to reaching out to the Russian people, 15 million views in Russia, and that's it. That's been our attempt so far, and um, that's shameful. Well, thank you for that gloomy take. It, it seems to me there is, a, there is a slightly more positive take, which is that um, much of the Russian myth-making and um, operations in Western societies has fallen down absolutely flat when confronted with the reality of the Russian invasion. But let me go to you next, Jessica. Um, you're, uh, you're perhaps the leading exponent 
of this in Finland, which is a country where public opinion has changed very sharply since the start of the war to the point you're now on the verge of joining NATO, which I'm sure many of us will be delighted about. Um, but what, what's your take? Or what, has, what has surprised you most since February the 24th? And what would you like to tell us about it? Thank you so much. It's an excellent question. As someone who has been investigating the Russian trolls and their messages and narratives ever since 2014, it's uh, really disgusting and shocking to see uh, how the hate speech and anti-Ukrainian messages, the messages such as Ukrainians are Nazis and Ukrainian regime are fascists, uh, which is what the trolls have been spreading and the fake news have been spreading in the international information space coming from the Kremlin uh, across the West and especially inside Ukraine and especially inside Russia to see it play out, to see it being practiced um, in, in, in concrete world to see how Russian soldiers really seem to believe that and really seem uh, to not give any uh, human rights to Ukrainian civilians who they are ruthlessly and brutally attacking and violating and committing, committing uh, war crimes. So this is um, one of the key takes that um, <clears throat> why information warfare is so dangerous. It is being used uh, to agitate people into hateful actions. In this case, a genocide uh, in the heart of Europe is being fueled by uh, at least a decade of hate speech uh, being spread by the Kremlin amongst Russians and, and people who are now uh, uh, waging kinetic warfare against Ukrainians in Ukraine. So it's... Um, it's one of these old lessons of why disinformation, information warfare and hate speech are so dangerous. Thank you so much um, for, for that, Jessica. And you're absolutely right that we've had 25 years of venomous attacks on the Baltic states, on people who've dared to stand up against um, the, the Kremlin. And we've systematically underestimated their effect and ignored the pattern behind them. And now we are paying the consequence. And of course, Ukraine is paying it um, in, uh, in blood. We just play it in um, dis discomfort and dis dis disruption. So, um, <clears throat> Andrea, with your interest in um, Mr. Jones, the um, British uh, Welsh journalist who exposed the famine, there's a kind of deja vu about this. And yet again, atrocities are happening in Ukraine. But whereas with the Holodmoor, um, it was um, very, very hard to get the message across. We now see really intense international interest in the war crimes, the, the rapes, the destruction of artworks, and so on. Um, what's, your, what's your takeaway from this? Have we learned anything um, since the 30s? No, because it's the history of the Holodomor is, of course, repeating. You have bans on the Ukrainian language in areas that Russia is occupying right now in Ukraine. You have a hunting down of the uh, social fabric of the country, the political elite, the mayors, the journalists, and uh, just like you did during the time of the 1930s. It's, it's all Stalinist, the brutality that Putin is carrying out today in Ukraine and has for some time in areas that he's occupied. And so it's sort of like why weren't more people on our level and as alarmed as we were when Putin was, was bringing back the cult to Stalin and putting up all these statues to Stalin and changing textbooks and so on. Um, in all the years when I was researching the history of the Holodomor through the story of Gareth Jones, a young independent Welsh journalist, very idealistic, who risked his life and career to go into Ukraine, report on the famine and uh, keep reporting on it, even when the powers that be were trying to discredit him. And during all those years of research into Gareth Jones's story, I became very interested in issues of internet neutrality, internet freedom, because I really believe that if Gareth had Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, he could go directly to the people with his message, with his videos, with, with all sorts of things that could create the sort of social media narratives that we're seeing today that are driving support for Ukraine, that are, that are driving um, a sea change across countries like Germany. And that's all thanks to the social media army of supporters that Ukraine has around the world. Um, but unfortunately, now that I'm seeing this play out, uh, social, social media can not stop a genocide as we're seeing, but it can rally support uh, that Ukraine, of course, did not have in the 1930s. Yes, it's very 
tantalising to think what an effect um, Gareth Jones is uh, would, would have had if he'd been able to use um, Twitter and the and I think the kind of the citizen army of Ukrainians armed with smartphones who are documenting war crimes. And we're seeing this particularly with the investigation into into Bucha that there's an incredible amount of of, of, of evidence which is just lacking for the Holland Mall. I think I think I'm right in saying there are no moving pictures at all of the Holland Mall and only a handful of um, of black and white images so we are in a different age so i feel that the the point of this really is that we have the means available we haven't yet um taken advantage of the means we're not actually creating a climate of fear among russian um human rights abusers they think i'd better not do this and we've yet really i think to mobilize world opinion on our side it's very um, impressive the uh, way that Western opinion has shifted. But if you look, as I do, at the South African or press or the Indian press, um, it's seen there very much as a sort of uh, two, two sides or even sim sympathy to Russia. So let me get back to you, Peter. I know this is something you're working on very hard at the moment. One of our priorities has got to be to puncture the Kremlin's information Iron Curtain and get into Russia. And you've said very eloquently, we've lost, we've disarmed our institutional capability that we had during the Cold War with anything, everything from Samizdat to shortwave radio and many things in between. Um, in a couple of minutes, if you were able to address the leaders of the free world now and say, and they were tasking you with getting on, with getting into the Russian information space, what would be your, um, what would be your recommendations? Firstly, we need an analytical capability, which we, we, we really don't have. Um, we're relying on very, very dodgy um, and, and highly, highly specious uh, bits of polling. So the first thing is to really understand the analytical co capacity, to, to really understand audiences, listen to them. And that means using everything from, you know, various types of economic data, uh, various types of just talking to people in various fora, uh, qualitative research, and so on and so forth. So that, that, that needs to be... Uh, compiled and focused. Um, again, that's not doing something creepy, like cruel, like forget about this Cambridge Analytica um, propaganda nonsense. It's the absolute opposite of that. That's what the Russians do. We need to do the opposite, which is talk to people, listen to them, understand their anxieties, understand why they're, uh, uh, why they're vulnerable to propaganda or whether they are, because um, I see a lot of sociological research, which points to a lot of skepticism among Russians towards their own propaganda. So, um, we start with that. Um, and, and then we have to think of a way of reaching out to them, which is sort of the diametric opposite to what the Russians do to us. So they have an information war doctrine, which is based around disinformation, confusion, undermining. We need a democratic communication doctrine, which is about engaging people as citizens, informing them, listening to them, and inspiring them to be democratic citizens. Um, we have to do the opposite of what they're doing. Um, we actually live in a post-ideological age. I think the main ideologies that we have today are, are in communications theories. Both the Russians and the Chinese fundamentally think that people are, are sheep and that they can be manipulated and disinformed and manipulated, while we need a communications theory which ultimately looks at people as citizens that can be engaged. So I think on every level, there's a, there's a sort of theoretical piece, there's an analytical piece, and then there's the actual action piece. And I know we have the BBC, wonderful, ready for Europe, wonderful, but forever destined to be trapped in a liberal bubble by definition of who they are. We need to be supporting new media initiatives that, that talk to people in their own language, that talk to soldiers in the language that they understand, that talk to um, um, burats and Tatars in the language and the, and the agendas that they understand that matter to them, which is what you do in it if you're creating any media. You wouldn't just scream down at them saying, this is the truth, which is kind of what we do. Um, you'd say, guys, what, what's up? Why, what, what's, what are your concerns? What, what are your thoughts about your mortgages and your children's futures and conscription and corruption in the army? And, you know, what do you think about the fact that, you know, sanctions for the elite mean one thing and something very different for you and so on and so forth. So yeah. it's just, it's just good old democratic communication, but it needs investment and it needs strategic planning. Yes, it's of course, it's a big question, who's the we here? Is this something that's best done by national governments or is it something that we should be looking for? Um, the, the G7 has its counter disinformation unit. We're obviously hosted in part here today by NATO. Maybe NATO, NATO, NATO's got a role here. Um, I'm always very, but whenever I hear the we, the word we, I always say we who. Um, but Andrea, let's, um, I want to ask you on a slightly different thing, uh, which is that to me, the absolutely standout media earthquake since the start of the war has been President Zelensky. Now, I've been, like many people, I've been gnashing my teeth at 
previous years at Ukraine's inability to tell its story well. And we have fantastic NGO efforts, and we saw you know, tremendous operations around you know, the time of Maidan and before that, the Orange Revolution. But if anyone had said to me that uh, Ukraine's elected political leadership would be absolutely dominating um, the international discourse uh, uh, about an issue involving Ukraine, I'd have said um, maybe in some parallel universe, but not here. But, but President Zelensky has absolutely aced this and I wonder if you'd just like to reflect uh, a, a, a little bit on that and um, wh where you see this going forward. And we are just going to continue to see you know, he's, he's given video addresses to practically every registered in the world, and there's these wonderful nightly or early morning video addresses to the Ukrainian people. Um, is that just going to continue? What, what do you think of the Ukrainian, um, the Ukrainian effort? Well, Zelensky, of course, represents this younger uh, generation that's coming up. His his wife, of course, is is is, a, is part of that. She uh, wears sneakers with dresses. She's she has a wonderful, strong career of her own. Um, so they're this modern Ukrainian couple. Um, and so it's it's the younger generation that's coming up. Um, maybe they're born in the Soviet Union, but then they really came of age and built their careers through this internet age. And the freedom of, of expression and the freedom of thought uh, really reflects that. And this, this creative, uh, wonderful energy of this new Ukraine. Um, so that will certainly continue. The big question is, uh, Ukraine doesn't really have a pattern of re-electing its presidents. <laughs> so we'll see, given uh, the unity around Zelensky right now, whether he will break that. But what's for, for certain is that this young, youthful, creative, innovative energy um, is going to continue, whether it's Zelensky or someone else. Ukrainians have this wonderful, uh, culturally strong characteristic of self-reliance and, and resilience and the spirit of independence, which has gone through uh, generations of its artists from Tarasha Shevchenko to Les Ukrenka and others. So it's very much part of their, their national identity going back many centuries. And I just want to uh, comment on the earlier point where, uh, where you said, who is this we? Who is going to be the we that sort of breaks through to the Russians? Um, in, a, in a conversation I had with a Russian organizer, she was saying, you know, invest in us, invest in the Russians that were forced abroad. We're the ones that are keeping the, democ the flame of democracy for Russia alive. As, as anyone who's been following Ukraine's story closely knows, Kiev and, and other, other cities across Ukraine have been hotbeds for resistance movements of dissidents from Belarus and Russia. Those people are still there. They've had to, of course, leave Ukraine. But so it's in the it's in the people it's it's in the dissidents that we need to invest in. They're asking us to invest in them. They want immigration support. They want financial support for their programs for independent media. Um, they want um, cultural support so they can tell their own history. And and because one thing we're going to be stuck with is this genocidal imperialist mindset that has been glorified in Russia for far too long dictators depend on some sort of report. You can say whatever you want about the polls in Russia, but Putin does have genuine support from a sizable amount of the Russian population. And we have to um, support the, the dissident Russians to try to dismantle that, try to confront that. And one important way to do that is to help Russians tell their own history. When I was in Warsaw working on Mr. Jones, I met with a group of, of Russians living in exile, and they asked me a shockingly basic question. They said, how do we as Russians talk about our history? We don't know where to start because they've been so traumatized and gaslit yeah. under all these years of Putin. So we have to support them there because uncovering, exhuming that history, um, helping um, organizations like Memorial come back wherever they are yeah. internationally, really adding a lot of resources to those groups uh, will go a tremendous way in, in planting powerful seeds of hope for a democratic Russia. I absolutely agree about the seeds of hope. I, I noticed here in London, where we have a large number of, of Russians have turned up, that there's a lot of people who are here because they don't like Putin and they don't like the disruption to their lifestyle that's caused by the war. Their attitudes to Ukraine um, are not always as impeccably liberal as their attitudes to Russian domestic politics. And I think there's, um, there's plenty of room for um, uh, targeted information um, in, in, into that space, because I, there's a, the sort of liberal imperialist Russians who are, would be quite happy for Russian to win the war because they would like to get back to the life that they're enjoying in Russia beforehand. 
and, and there's something we need to look at on that. But I was very struck by what you said about self-reliance and this kind of Ukrainian grit. And it reminds me of this wonderful, un untranslatable Finnish word, sisu, which um, I'm going to ask Jessica to elaborate on a bit. Because I think one of, one of the things about information warfare is it's not just the information which flows from a perpetrator to a victim. It's the mindset of the people among whom it lands. And there's something about Finland which seems to mean that, that, that where disinformation just bounces off. And um, so, Jessica, just talk us through a little bit about Finnish resilience to disinformation. And do you think any of uh, you have everything from uh, strong public media through to um, kids in schools being taught disinformation to spot disinformation almost before they learn to read? Um, what elements of, of, of that do you think that Finland could bring to NATO, for example, if you if you join NATO, what, what elements are exportable? Oh, definitely. I love I love that idea of CISO. It's really something combination of adamance and perseverance and and the willingness to go through a grey stone, as they say, no matter what, and keep your head uh, calm and cool. But yes, definitely. Uh, Finland, unfortunately, has the um, experience of being under uh, Soviet aggression and having to fight itself through it and having its all uh, of the teenagers fighting for it as volunteers, as well as women fighting for it as volunteers. So we have this kind of like whole of society approach to defense. Uh, which guides us still and uh, many layers of society are in one way or another really well trained uh, to counter as well as recognize these operations. One really interesting example, for example, from recent years, from the information warfare years, the Kremlin tried to plant the Sputnik, a um, member of the RT family, uh, really aggressive uh, arm in Finnish language. Uh, back in 2014 and they started first they started recruiting journalists journalists and then they started put out uh, fake material but it just didn't last long you know why because no one read it because everyone knew it's russian propaganda so of course they then found other ways of attacking us in the information space but that's another story but yes this is um and what we do well, we volunteer, we help each other, uh, we uh, rally around people who become targeted, who become victims of, for example, Russian trolls. There's super active social media community uh, in, in Finland. And this is also something that um, I would love to see uh, being used internationally. To, because that really helps. When someone first spots a troll, uh, then they always also um, ask the others to, for example, report it to Twitter or Facebook. And then there are a lot of people going after these trolls and there is an, an ongoing uh, support to all kinds of anti-troll activities. Thanks so much for mentioning Twitter, because that takes us on to what I, uh, the topic I wanted to spend our last few minutes on. And golly, the time's gone, gone quickly. Um, Twitter is, is, I think, obviously far smaller than Facebook, but it's something that everyone in journalism and politics and international security regards almost as their default social media platform. And so it's of enormous importance what approach Twitter takes on two key issues. One is verification and the other is on content moderation. And I'm sure all of us have had the experience of seeing either ourselves or people we know impersonated on Twitter and the rather frustrating um, business of trying to get Twitter to take down um, accounts which are just uh, just uh, fake accounts. And we've also seen Russian trolls running rampant over Twitter and um, rather unsuccessful efforts in many cases to get them um, get them exposed. And, and we also see um, Russian um, embassy accounts um, not um, sometimes not labelled as Russian official accounts, or sometimes with a blue tick, sometimes without. So it's quite a mess, to put it politely, at Twitter. And now we have Elon Musk taking over. So I want you to imagine, um, dear panellists, for the final few minutes of this session, that we have Elon Musk on this Zoom call, and you are briefing him about how to fix Twitter, what his agenda should be. Um, so clear things that he should do, or maybe things that he should not do. And I'll go to you first, Peter. Advice to Elon Musk, please. Um, I, 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 um, 
I, I, I don't think anything's going to happen. I, I, I think I think Twitter is what it is. Um, I think sure the content moderation should be more transparent. Should be uh, should have more checks and balances and be more democratic. But but Twitter is what it is. I, I'm not scared of Elon Musk. I think he's just a, a showman. Um, and I think we're all just obsessing over nonsense. I'm sorry. I, mean, I, I, I think that there's a very strong argument for having um, <clears throat> making the blue tick verification um, really something crunchy that you can maybe with a zero knowledge proof you show that you've got a passport you don't have to give your passport details you show you've got a phone number and I think it would be it would al already make things better if, if everybody who was real could get a blue tick and that would put the the trolls into a second category um, I also think it's 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 quite important to know what, what the rules are for being chucked off Twitter and seeing whether and, and having some sort of appeal. Anne-Marie Brady, our great friend from New Zealand, was chucked off Twitter briefly for saying completely true things about the Chinese Communist Party. And that seemed to me to be a bit of an abuse. But Andrea, what about you? What would you what would what would you advise would you give Elon Musk? I would advise Elon Musk not to purchase Twitter and instead solve world hunger with all the money that he has. I think mm -hmm. that would be a lot more productive and pleasurable for him. I think uh, and, and taking over Twitter and the content moderation is going to be a huge headache, especially with regulations coming out of Europe. He's going to lose interest, I think, after some time. But uh, my advice to him would be to keep the label on um, anybody who works for a dictatorship. Um, I, I think when... Um, Putin's total war invasion of Ukraine, of Ukraine first started, and suddenly you had these, these Westerners who work for RT um, and other, or have shows with RT like George Galloway and others, suddenly got a mark, a, a scarlet letter on their Twitter account that said, um, this account is affiliated with Russian state media. I think, um, and, and that was a wonderful day for a lot of us who've spent a long time on Twitter being harassed by people like that. And I think that's important to have that there to really show who they are, where their values lie beyond any doubt, because what those agents, uh, those Kremlin agents, disinformation agents, uh, propaganda agents, whatever you want to call them, what they what those Western um, pundits do is they muddle the truth and, and they have no problem attacking others and trying to discredit others, even though they themselves are taking blood money working for Putin's propaganda machine. So I think keeping those labels on and is a good thing. Uh, and it should be limited to anybody who's taking money from a, a, a dictatorship. Yes, well, I, I, I'm, I'm certainly in favour of um, in favour of that, and um, I should say, by the way, that you, everyone who's watching this, should follow um, our panelists on on Twitter and um, engage with them. Um, but um, Jessica, you have, I think, uh, forty eight thousand Twitter followers, <laughs> um, and um, you have um, used Twitter extremely effectively uh, to get your message across, but you've also been the subject of some pretty appalling attacks on social media as, as well. Um, so um, what would your advice be to, to, to Mr. Musk, apart from um, obviously visit Finland, which would be a very good thing for him to do? Oh yeah, I would seriously want him to take into account these smaller language areas in which these Russian trolls are also active. And despite the fact that maybe uh, Twitter employees don't understand Finnish language or Finnish language Russian trolling or other small language areas Russian trolling, they should still um, listen to these user reports and actually start obeying their own community standards. At the moment, they are unfortunately not so. For example, Twitter bans already now, uh, supposedly, um, crimes as well as fake profiles on its platform. Well, when there are then Russian trolls and Russian propagandists using that platform uh, to attack other people, just like Adrian said, to harass and to uh, conduct a crime such as stalking or libel or aggra aggravated libel or things like that, uh, then uh, Twitter is nowhere to be seen fulfilling those community standards. So I would start uh, from there. And obviously it would be of great interest of academic, journalistic, uh, societal interest to receive information of new accounts that the Russian troll factories are uh, establishing there. So Twitter has in the past published um, big lists of these Russian trolls, but I want to see them published in the future too. So we have so little information
information about them, but it would be super helpful uh, for uh, national securities of many countries, as well as for human rights to receive information about these Russian trolls. And I love the idea that Adrian already gave about these labels. And it's also a big question whether these Russian embassies that on Twitter act like Russian troll factories, should they be kicked out already? Well, thank you so much for that, uh, Jessica. And I, I think this point about minority or small languages is super important, that there's something about um, the English-speaking world which is essentially very imperialistic and hegemonic. And if it, isn't in a, if it isn't in English, it basically doesn't matter. And that gets worse the closer you get to Silicon Valley. And I think that the, uh, the, the, the way in which social media platforms can be used, not just for disinformation, but actually for outright genocide, and it's happening in some language that nobody in Silicon Valley speaks, um, is goes proceeds with impunity, um, is absolutely shocking. And future generations are going to look back on us and say, how on earth did we let that happen? So it remains only for me to thank our three distinguished panelists, uh, my oh, dear friends, Jessica, so looking forward to seeing you atom to atom rather than electron to electron. Same goes for <laughs> um, Peter and um, Andrea. Thanks so much for your insights. The, um, this world of Zoom calls is gradually coming to an end, not before time. But in the meantime, I'm going to hand over to another friend, um, Lauren. Over, back, to, back to you. Thank you so much, Edward. What a terrific discussion. So wonderful to hear from those voices. Okay, so we are going to take a short break now to give everyone a chance to refill their coffee, whether you're here in person or online. But don't worry, we're not going to leave you bored. There will be some messages coming around on our screens. Uh, you'll hear from both senior voices, like former Defense and Foreign Minister Ine Eriksson Sarayda, as well as our own General Ben Hodges from SIPA. On social media, check out two young military voices, John Jacobs and Alex Landry, who will talk about their experience with NATO and how NATO is making a difference in the world. So, wishing everyone uh, a good break. We'll see you back here at 325 Central European time and 925 Eastern. Stick with us and see you soon. Dear all participants at the NATO Youth Summit, I'm really honored to be addressing you today and I'm really glad that the summit is taking place this year as last year and with a lot of participants also now. I'd like to take you back to October 2013 when I was participating in my first NATO Defense Ministerial. In October 2013, NATO had a guest at the table of the then Secretary General Anders Fogh Rasmussen. It was the Russian defense minister. He gave gifts. It was quite a good ambience around the table. And when we met again, just some few months later, in February 2014, the meeting took place at the same time as Russia annexed Crimea. And I say this just to remind us all that changes can come quickly, but they can also have profound impact. What we did in the eight years that followed was to strengthen NATO as an alliance both of military and political nature. And I'm really happy to see that the work has paid off. Now NATO is an alliance that is fit for purpose. It is an alliance where members are putting a lot of emphasis on the unity and cohesion. And what we're seeing today is a NATO that is stronger than ever. And it is also really needed because the shifts around us are deep and profound. The consequences of Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine is going to be felt for decades. There is no longer any talk of return to business as usual. This has had enormous impact not only for Ukraine but for the whole European security architecture. We're also witnessing something that I think many of us didn't expect to happen this soon, and that is the debates in Sweden and Finland on NATO membership. It's been really interesting and rewarding to follow these discussions very closely. And I can say on behalf of Norway that we would welcome Sweden and Finland, our very good and solid neighbors that we already cooperate closely with, as full members of NATO. That would have an impact on regional security in the north, it would have an impact on European security and transatlantic security. And all the impacts it would have would be very, very good. So I'd like you to 
spend time wisely both at the summit and also afterwards to continue to discuss European security policy, to discuss how we can strengthen the transatlantic unity and bond between us. Your voices are extremely important in the debate on transforming uh, NATO also in the future. This is something that we need to do together. And in the same way that allies have been stepping up, I think it is extremely important that young voices are heard in the discussions that we're going to have in the future. Thank you so much for participating and best of luck with the summit. Hey everybody, I'm Lieutenant General Retired Ben Hodges. I was in the US Army for almost 40 years. I, I first became a part of NATO and began to love NATO, our great alliance, back in 1981 when I was a brand new lieutenant serving in Northern Germany during the height of the Cold War. Um, at that time, this, this was the world that we all knew. And you had uh, the nations of NATO. At that time, there were about 12 or 14 of us uh, with, including the United States and Canada. Uh, and on the other side, you had the Warsaw Pact uh, led by the Soviet Union. And this was a test of wills after the end of the Second World War. And it was a commitment by millions and millions of Americans and Europeans who cared about uh, freedom and democracy. And uh, we, wanted to we wanted to preserve that. Uh, but none of us, including the United States, had the capacity to do that alone. We needed allies. We needed other countries with whom we could, uh, had, with whom we had shared values, uh, but also when you add together the combined economies and populations and militaries of uh, all the, the members of the Alliance, it, it gave us a chance to send a message to potential adversaries at that time, the Soviet Union, do not make the terrible mistake of attacking because we will, um, you will lose and we will protect what we care about. So here we are today in uh, 2022. Um, our alliance now has 30 members, and there are other nations in a queue wanting to join NATO. Why is that? Why, despite the fact that a coalition of 30 nations has well-known, well-documented challenges, there's frictions, uh, not every nation gets along with each other all the time, but at the end of the day, we are all bound by a commitment to come to the common defense of each other. And so that's why our alliance has grown from the original 12 up to 30. And there are several other nations that are in the queue wanting to join or, or else are seriously considering asking to join our alliance. Why is that? It's because they see that despite our challenges, despite the problems, that life inside the alliance is better than outside the alliance. That the, the protection, the security that comes from a shared uh, commitment to each other's defense, and bound together by shared values, um, that's that's why nations are in a queue. There's nobody knocking on the door of the Kremlin saying, "Please let me in." There's nobody knocking on the door of the Chinese Communist Party saying, "Please let us in." This is about democracy versus autocracy. Uh, and the alliance is what gives us the best chance to protect democracy in this contest. Now, um, every now and then you'll hear, you'll hear say, people say, uh, NATO's outlived its usefulness. And now look what's happened in just the last few months. We've been reminded that Russia is a threat. And we've been reminded that China, the Chinese Communist Party, is not interested in um, in stopping Russia. In fact, they look to take advantage of this. So we have we have real challenges out there. We need allies. That's why the American president made it a point on his in his inaugural speech back on 20 January last year, the, the emphasis on rebuilding our relationships with all of our allies. I have seen our alliance uh, adapt over the decades um, from it's Cold War mission. And then at the end of the Cold War, we called it the peace dividend. And then we had um, the, for the first time in its history, NATO went outside of its, of its boundaries uh, to help implement the Dayton Peace Accords in 1995. This was called the I-4, Implementation Force. And this was a commitment by the United States and Canada and Europe, all the allies, to stop genocide 
um, to help prevent a refugee disaster from taking place in the former Yugoslavia. It was very successful and it showed that NATO can in fact um, help solve security problems even outside of its border, problems that would affect the security of all of its members. Now, uh, again, we're, we're not perfect. We've learned a lot. Um, we learned a lot from our Afghanistan experience and now we're facing a challenge from Russia. And I think the Alliance, um, because of our capabilities, we're sure that Russia is not gonna attack any member of NATO. Now we've got to figure out, have we deterred ourselves? How can NATO prevent a disaster from happening, from growing inside Ukraine that will affect all of us? Welcome back to the 2022 NATO Youth Summit. I know that was a short break, so thank you all for bearing with us. I promise our next one will be longer. Uh, but it's so good to have you all back in. Uh, for those of you who might just be joining us at home, I am your host for today, Lawrence Baranza from SIPA. So earlier today, we had a bunch of great conversations already about uh, how NATO is adapting to incorporate the priorities of young people like all of you. And I know one issue that so many of us care about quite a lot is climate change. And so I'm so thrilled that we have a session totally dedicated to this topic, uh, which is really important. Uh, we have a fantastic panel of experts, both young activists, which we're so uh, thrilled to have with us, but also institutional reps to talk about how we're both making differences in our own communities, but also organizationally tackling the security implications of climate change. So thank you so much, uh, especially to our chair of this session, Jeff Goodell, who is such an expert in his own right. He's an American author and a contributing editor to Rolling Stone magazine on environment and energy issues. Jeff, it's so great to have someone like you driving this debate and guiding us through these tough questions. It's such a privilege to have you. Um, I'll just remind everyone once more to continue to send your questions in through the app so that Jeff can keep working those into his discussion. Um, and with that, let's kick off our discussion on climate. Jeff, over to you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, I appreciate that introduction. Uh, what a um, timely subject to talk about today, uh, given what's going on in our world. Um, I want to start just by um, framing the conversation with um, a story about um, my first kind of awakening to the risk, the, to the uh, urgency of 
uh, the climate crisis in the context of national security. And that was in um, 2016. I was visiting a Norfolk uh, Naval Base with then Secretary of State John Kerry. And uh, we were touring the base. And um, the commander of the base came up to Secretary Kerry while I was standing there and said that uh, due to rising seas, um, this base was going to have to be moved within the next 30 or 40 years. And the implications of that were, are so astonishing and so huge and so um, kind of mind blowing that it really gives you a sense of kind of what we're talking about here, which is, you know, this is the largest naval base in the world. And the idea of having to actually move it due to rising seas um, is something that is going to change everything about American security, about how we think about force deployment. Um, and it really gave, opened my eyes to sort of the, the, the sort of big picture risks that we're talking about here, both on the climate impact side, as well as on the sort of military and force deployment side. And so now we have um, the war in Ukraine. Uh, which is obviously uh, the subject of the day. It is obviously not a climate war per se, but fossil fuels and um, uh, decarbonization are at the center of the debate uh, about what we're, how we're responding to that, about our dependence on fossil fuels. This is all stuff that I would love to talk about today. I have a great panel to talk about um, these, these issues. Um, I have Nasheed Shafi, from the, the co-founder of the Arab Youth Climate Movement, Qatar, uh, Alex, Alexandria Villasenor, the founder of Earth Uprising, who is there with you. A lucky, lucky Alexandria. Uh, Jill Dugan, the executive director for Europe for Environmental Defense Fund, joining us from London. And James Epithuri, the assistant secretary general for emerging security challenges at NATO. Um, so I want to ask each of you sort of one question to start off the conversation. And, and James, I'd like to start with you. Um, talk to, tell, explain to us w w what the role is for NATO uh, in thinking about climate security. I mean, climate security is a issue that is mostly considered, you know, done, dealt with by nations, by governments. What, what role does, does NATO have in thinking about this? So thanks very much for that question, and it's great to be here. And, and um, I think three years ago, I wouldn't have been able to give you much of an answer because NATO wasn't actually paying much attention to the security implications of climate change. We had references to it in our documents, but frankly, there wasn't that much work going on. And, it's all really changed. And actually, when I went, I used to do all sorts of things at NATO. I've been at NATO longer than, than she's been alive. And uh, I, uh, I used to do, I was the NATO spokesman, and I used to negotiate with the Russians. But when I went home and said that I was going to be working on, on the security implications of climate change, my son said, finally, you're doing something useful. Uh, and, uh, and I could see from his point of view, you know, why that, that was really the case. And I think that NATO, you know, more broadly has really come to grips with the fact that uh, climate change is going to affect security, and we need to adapt to that. So uh, the first thing is that we need to understand what's happening, and NATO is now focusing on that. Uh, and I think all of us know, you know, in broad strokes, what the security implications of climate change are. And you just mentioned one of them, what's going to happen to the coasts, a lot more disasters and extreme weather. Uh, the Arctic is going to be opening up because the ice is melting. It's going to be more conflicts over resources, uh, more extreme temperatures. You know, we could go on and on. So first, we need to understand uh, what the implications are. So we're studying that. Second thing is, are we have to adapt our forces to that. Uh, meaning, for example, in my country, Canada, uh, when I was at the Defense Department, we very rarely had a soldier working inside the country on disaster relief, like once we had an ice storm, because uh, that's what we have in Canada. Uh, but now, it's all the time. Floods, fires, that's true in all the NATO countries. So they're going to have to do more of that. Uh, we need equipment that can operate in heat and in cold, uh, more extreme than it was. And that means buying it now so that you have it later. We need to, of course, adapt all our coastal facilities. Uh, need to be able to operate up in the Arctic. 
So we need an adaptation process. It needs to start now. It needed to start yesterday. And then the final thing we need to do is contribute to reducing carbon emissions. So we need to get to our facilities, see if we can reduce uh, what our bases uh, emit, we need to be more efficient for our forces, both to reduce their requirement to have you know, fuel, uh, but also to see if we can't reduce the burn uh, from our forces. So these are all the reasons why NATO is turning to this. In the Madrid summit, you'll see a real focus on that. Thanks, James. So, Alexandria, let me ask you, um, you know, you work with a lot of young climate activists, um, uh, and I'm very in touch with them also um, as part of my job as a journalist. Climate security is not high on the sort of uh, agenda and awareness of, of um, people that I talk to here in the U.S. Um, tell me about how this is perceived and sort of playing with the activists that you work with. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, climate change is such a big issue to my generation. And I think that it's because every aspect of our life is going to be impacted by the climate crisis, from where we go to school to what kind of jobs we have. Um, a lot of young people are even having conversations about whether or not they want to have children because of climate change. And so I'm 16, and I'm already thinking about kind of how every aspect of my life will be different. And so it's such an important issue to us, but then also there's such an important aspect of the security reasons. First of all, um, climate change is, um, you know, threatening uh, our resources and our planet's resources, and that is really going to be um, a big issue when it comes to uh, a threat on security all around the world because there's going to be, um, you know, our life support systems that are going to fail. And so because of that, that will lead to conflict. And so there's a lot of young people, especially in um, countries who are most affected by the climate crisis, who contributed the least to it. And those are the ones whose voices really need to be heard, especially because of the fact that they aren't really being included in a lot of the discussions. And so those are the ones that are going to be impacted the most. And um, they don't really have the safety and support from countries all around the world. And so it's a big issue to young people. And that's why we're continuing to talk about it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Um, Nishad, you know, you obviously work with, also work with a lot of climate activists in um, the Middle East. Uh, perspective there, I'm sure, is very different uh, and we don't hear a lot of, um, at least here in the U.S. Uh, and presumably uh, in Europe also, uh, about the perspective of activists there. Um, I'm interested in just your broad outlines of how this question of climate security and the implications of that uh, are playing among the activists you work with. Well, thank you, Jeff, uh, to bring up that. Of course, um, uh, the youth activism from the region has been not quite known in uh, any part of the world. Of course, the region itself is going through a lot. Um, well, now we talk about energy and uh, climate just because of the Russian uh, invasion of uh, Ukraine, but the region has been always under invasion, either it's from Iraq, the Kuwait invasion of Iraq, and we have issues, uh, Israeli-Palestinian issue, we have Syria, we had uh, uh, Iraq war, we had the latest one in Yemen, all this contribute to make climate change the least uh, least discussed topic in much of the government level, at least. Uh, it also transcends to the young people too, because if you are in a war-torn country, the, the biggest uh, thing you look at is the safety of your family, uh, food on the table, employment. So climate change doesn't come, uh, you no know, climb up the stairs. But the climate change has a severe security issues here. It starts from Syria, when the, the many of the studies do indicate that the whole Syrian conflict has to do with the farmers, and the farming sector had critically impacted due to the worst drought they've gone through. A similar thing has been now continuing in many of the war torn countries, like Yemen, for example. It's, it is almost in a catastrophic position. The food security is the worst. The, the, the climate change would be exacerbating the existing situation to lead a lot of young people to extremism. This is a critical point, which is um, not seen by the governments or uh, our international partners. So over the years, and also with the impacts of climate change, the Middle East and North Africa is one of the worst and most vulnerable regions in the world. Does that uh, uh, translate it into action? To, to, to some extent, no. But does this uh, dangerous uh, uh, level of climate change impacts has been taken into discussions? No. Also, given the fact, you know, a provincial uh, 
such war zone areas been point to be a breeding ground for terrorism and extremism, which is quite frightening to a lot of young people in the region. This is the problem. So when you don't have the young people given the platform, like why mentioned, Jeff mentioned, where are these young people in the region? If they are not given the right platform to share what's happening in their part of the world, I think uh, people are, I mean, our Western allies or else are blindfolding towards us. So in a way, the extremism or counterterrorism point to should look climate, because at this point, the climate change would make things very difficult in our part of the world, which is already going through our worst, through war, or within, within the terms of climate, because we are already a very vulnerable region, a very water scarce region. It also has resource issues, even food or water. And you know, most of the North African countries are going through civil wars. So the climate change would be only making it difficult. So if you don't have the right strategy, things would be really out of hand in this part of the world. That's, that's a very, very great point, I think, and the, the risks of extremism. Um, uh, so, so, Jill, um, I want to ask you about the war right now. One of the things that's, um, you know, happening here is this question of, of um, well, we're going through a transition, right? We're getting off fossil fuels. You've worked very hard and Environmental Defense Fund has worked very hard. Uh, trying to accelerate the transition away from fossil fuels, which are, of course, the reason that we're talking about um, these climate impacts. And there's, we seem to be at this sort of balance point right now where, where we're seeing fossil fuel industry um, kind of resurging, our dependence upon fossil fuels could becoming more urgent. And at the same time, it's a great opportunity to move away. And we're seeing that, you know, the leverage that Russia has over Europe right now is due to, of course, fossil fuels. Zelensky said this morning, just before we, this conversation started, I logged on and saw that he said Putin is using oil and gas as a weapon. Um, how, how are you seeing this playing out as far as the um, larger challenge of decarbonizing our, our energy systems off of fossil fuels? Well, obviously, the quicker we can transition away from fossil fuels, the less dependent we are on autocrats who use them as a weapon. Um, and of course, one of the things that we're seeing in Europe and the United States and elsewhere is as energy prices are rising post pandemic, not all due to the war in Ukraine, but exacerbated by the war in Ukraine, there is a there is talk about should we be drilling for more oil or, or using more gas, or what should we be doing? And obviously, in the short term, there is going to be a need for diversification of resources, particularly in Europe, away from the dependence on Russian oil and gas. But at the same time, we need to be ensuring that we're accelerating this transition. Otherwise, we just make the situation worse for ourselves. And you can see that as you see leaders around the world who, in an effort to move away from Russian oil and gas go to a variety of other countries, and not all of them look like you know your your best best future friends. Really, it's sometimes moving a problem from one place to another, and the only way to to really deal with that in the medium term, and it's very difficult to do it in the short term. But offshore wind and wind resources can be got up very quickly um, in certain circumstances. Is, is to move to renewables. Renewables are less attractive to autocrats. They don't give huge amounts of wealth because we can't kind of capture the sun and the wind as personal resources in the same way that we can oil and gas reserves. They tend to be available in some measure um, if we give the right technologies. And that is a question for developed countries to ensure that, that the technologies are available globally for all countries to be able to use these resources. But at this particular moment, I think we've got to recognize that there'll be some difficult short-term choices about where oil and gas come from and the need to you know, bolster our, our resilience in the next year. But we should, we should deeply resist any investment in fossil fuel infrastructure because we really need to see this as an opportunity to move away from fossil fuels, but also from that sort of dependence on autocrats and unstable states and unfriendly states and ensure that globally we see this as a big push to ensure that all countries have increased access to renewable resources. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Jill. So, so James, I, I'd like to follow up with you on this. Um, you know, you talked in the beginning about, you know, the sort of NATO's awakening um, to the risks 
to climate risk. How specifically would you say what's happening right now in our world with the war uh, and all the things that Jill just talked about, this urgency of the transition, but more broadly, how is it waking people up to climate risks? I mean, I know that you obviously cannot divorce the sort of resource war aspect of what's happening now with climate risk, but is is there a, a is 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 this a changing is this a, a transition moment for not just our dependence on fossil fuels but our dependence uh, 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 entering into this new world that we're obviously doing very quickly of changing security risks from a rapidly warming world. I mean that's a great question. Uh, I'd say a couple of things. One is, I think three or four until three or four years ago. Uh, climate was always sort of in the background, the security implications of climate change. It was in the background. It was something we could get to if there was kind of nothing else going on that day. I think what's different now here is that the current international security context includes climate. In other words, it's still a priority. It's always a priority. So the word crisis, you know, we deal with crises here at NATO, but uh, climate has moved onto that list. Um, so as we prepare for the Madrid summit, the ambassadors here are about to start negotiating what we call the strategic concept, which is our guiding document for the next 10 years. And if there's one thing they all agree on, and it's kind of only one thing uh, right now, maybe a couple more, it's the importance of climate. And that will be prominently in the document. And that means our military structures, uh, our political structures are all going to have our marching orders to keep this very high uh, on the agenda, no matter what's happening in the security uh, sphere. Second thing I would say is every one of our governments on a national basis is wrestling with this. Like they're all deploying their forces to deal with these problems now. They're all facing the health problems, the security problems, the food problems. So it's, it's not going to disappear from our agenda. It's going to remain uh, important. The third thing I would say, uh, building on, on uh, what we just heard about Russia, is it's absolutely right that we need to take this opportunity. You know, there's an expression, never uh, waste a crisis. And this crisis with Russia is an opportunity to pivot away, not just from dependence on Russian oil and gas, but to invest more quickly uh, in uh, renewables. There is a challenge to increase uh, the amount of renewables that we're putting on stream, and we've just literally been discussing that uh, 20 minutes ago over uh, across the street here. But uh, I would add also that we need to keep our eyes open precisely along those lines about uh, creating new strategic dependencies. Right now, renewables are heavily dependent on certain materials like rare earths, where we actually in the West and the democracies don't uh, control the supply or the processing almost at all. Uh, and you know, to be very open with you, China owns the materials and the, in particular the processing facilities. We don't want to create new strategic dependencies. So this is another complication as we look forward uh, to doing this. But in the end, uh, we will have to include renewables as a greater part of the mix. It has become more urgent as a result uh, of the Ukraine crisis. Um, but the overall adaptation of our forces that I just outlined to you, uh, based on an assessment contributing to net zero, that's going to have to happen as quickly as possible. Yeah, right. Uh, as a friend of mine uh, who writes about climate change often says, in this world, speed is everything. And I think that's very true, the, the, the urgency of this transition. Um, just a quick note to the audience, please um, submit any uh, questions you have. I see a few that are coming up here. Uh, I'm happy to, um, to ask our, our panelists about them. I, I want to ask Alexandria one thing. Um, Alexandria, you mentioned in your first comments about the sort of overwhelmingness of the climate crisis, for, especially for a lot of uh, young activists and young people in general. And I think that's very true, uh, obviously. Uh, and there's a lot of concern about that in the sense of like, you know, is it too late? Are we, how screwed are we? And in certain ways, I would think that, I wonder how you think about that in the context of this war. Um, is, is, 
Is this something that you see as contributing to that sense of, oh my God, our world is in chaos and what the hell, I'm gonna you know, go to the beach and you know, uh, just try to forget about it all? Or do you see this as a uh, you know, moment of, how, how do you turn this into a moment of engagement, of, of getting people activated to really understand uh, what's at risk here? Mm -hmm. I think that there are definitely a lot of young people who are feeling overwhelmed by everything, especially because uh, we are seeing more climate fuel disasters. And I live in California, and we're having more wildfires every single year. So it's, it's hard to ignore climate change when it's literally outside of your doorstep, and you're seeing it, and you're seeing these climate fuel disasters happening. And so I think that when it comes to what is happening in Ukraine, I think that a lot of young people are feeling overwhelmed because they see it as something that climate change is fueling itself as well, because it is um, a kind of a war on, on resources. And so um, Russia is going after Ukraine's energy grid. And as well, there is uh, an area in um, Ukraine that is especially being targeted that is a coal mine. And so, um, you know, there are more conflicts that are going to arise when it comes to resources and certain countries trying to get their, their hands on coal or oil and gas. And so because of that, I think that there's a lot of young people that are feeling the need to put pressure on their governments to start getting off of um, you know, coal, oil, and gas and um, start focusing on renewable energy. And I know we were discussing this as well. And so I think that this is a very real opportunity that we have to start focusing on renewable energy um, because the more that we start ramping up oil and gas in, uh, in response to what is happening in Russia and uh, in the United States as well, um, right now Biden is starting to ramp up this coal and oil and gas to become more independent. But that is the wrong thing that we are doing. We need to start focusing more on renewable energy and um, starting to you know, focus on being sustainable for the long term because when we have that focus on renewable energy, greenhouse gas emissions will, will start to go down and that's what we really need to focus on is lowering our global greenhouse gas emissions. And so um, I think that this is an opportunity and I think a lot of other young people see that too. Um, and so we're, we're starting to come together and really put pressure on our own countries, but then also focusing on um, you know, supporting uh, those in Ukraine and uh, in the youth climate movement, we focus a lot on mutual aid. And I think that when it comes to what is happening right now, mutual aid is such an important aspect of this. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think in a certain way, you could make the argument that in a, in a terrible way that, that, that Putin is a, uh, you know, a pretty excellent advocate for the urgency of decarbonization um, uh, because it's, this war is making clear exactly what's at stake. Nasheed, I want to ask you about something you mentioned before, which is um, the risk of extremism uh, among activists and things. That's a very interesting idea that we don't hear a lot about uh, in the West, I, at, least, at least in the US. Um, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Oh, well, uh, definitely. See, so we are already, in, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, the current climate change is already exaggerating the fragility of some of the countries, which are already in conflict or undergoing or post-conflict transition. And uh, there is a, a struggling uh, bunch of young people, you know, who has a growing population in the Middle East and North Africa has the highest young people who are below the age of 30. Uh, and this growing uh, number of young people who, uh, who, are, who doesn't have any jobs, um, like decreasing uh, or volatile uh, oil prices and some of the weak governance, and the, the, the latest and the fallout of pandemic is making them so vulnerable that this whole issue contributes to the proliferation of armed groups and intensifies conflicts over natural resources and make it easier for the you know, extreme organizations to attract young people as their recruits. So to address this, definitely the government must approach the climate change as a public policy issue and see that the threat or the interconnection of how these challenges can uh, combine together in, in, in a way that they can make sure that the young people, uh, you know, future has been taken care. So fragility and the current crisis is making it more difficult and the young people finds, you know, such extremist groups as a resort to find wealth or make life better. 
which is a wrong notion. If unless our government acts in the right position, it will be extremely difficult to bring them back. So climate change and in that aspect uh, within the youth sector hasn't been not even discussed. Uh, forget it, it's not even studied. So there is a huge you know, vacuum of knowledge or information required in this regards. And quite often it is being undermined. Right, thank you, thank you. So um, Jill, what, what role should NATO be playing in this energy transition and in the, you know, the, the push for decarbonization? I mean, we all know about national goals and, you know, um, we know about, uh, you know, the climate, climate agreements, IPCC climate agreements and things. What's not clear though is what role NATO should be playing in this, if anything, is what, how, how can they help in this acceleration of decarbonizing our energy system? Well, if you, if you don't mind, I was kind of thinking about how can we help NATO at the moment? <laughs> Maybe that's much better, yes. And um, so one of the questions that's very much on my mind and I think on the mind of a lot of people is um, with rising energy prices, how can the NATO, you know, we, we obviously want the NATO coalition to hold together um, in the face of that, in the, the face of whatever comes. So we're, we're supporting Ukraine without getting involved in the war, but we're obviously watching this very carefully. Now, we've talked about the transition and, and to renewable energy, and we've talked about decarbonisation, but of course, one of the most important things that we need to do is reduce demand for energy. And in Europe, 40% of greenhouse gas emissions come from buildings. And you may have noticed that the buildings in Europe are often quite old and they need insulating and they need, you know, th th there's a lot of things that need to happen first for us to reduce our demand. But I think the International Energy a Agency, I think estimated, and don't quote me on this in case I'm wrong, but you know, turning thermostats down by one degree can have an enormous impact of up to 6% of the gas saved. So, you know, we need to look at what we can do as citizens, I think, in, whilst we're carrying out that energy transition to renewables about how do we reduce demand for energy. And there's been enormous successes with appliances, with reducing the amount of energy that TVs and washing machines and things use. But we also need to really look at what we're, we're all doing and whether particularly in the coming year, whether we need to take that car, car journey or whether there's another way of, of, of moving around that's not going to use as much oil, whether we can you know, put on an extra sweater rather than having the, the thermostat up. And that, that accounts for countries which are not in the direct threat, not had the gas switched off by Gazprom, but the rest of us as well, because everything we can do to reduce our demand for energy will keep prices lower, will mean that less money goes to um, uh, fight this war um, from those who are supplying gas and oil, and will also help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So I think there is, you know, we're, we're all very good at this for about 10 minutes and then we forget, or we, you know, move on to something else. But I think over the coming years, we really do need to think about, are there practical things that all of us as citizens around the world can do to reduce our energy needs as much as possible to allow those that are energy poor to be able to access it at reasonable prices and to stop those who are misusing their power over resources as well by, by gaining huge, huge rents, huge amounts of money from selling them. So I, I think we need to kind of look at those two things together as that's the short term action that we can all try and take that, that there is no downside to really, whilst we, we move to the energy transition. Great, thanks. Um, so I'm scrolling through some of the uh, questions from you in the audience here. Um, one interesting one that's come up is um, uh, the person who's writing the question points out that, you know, uh, climate change is, is uh, affecting uh, migration. Uh, obviously, uh, we, have, we have people who are moving because of uh, food shortages, droughts, uh, extreme heat, flooding, displacement. Um, how is that changing NATO's sort of mission? And the, the specific question here is, is NATO looking into disaster relief as a means of peacekeeping? 
James, do you have a, some response to that? Well, that's a good, that's a very interesting question. And um, I'd like to answer more than one question, or at least add, add to that, because uh, I think it's important. But in terms of uh, disaster relief uh, and, and peacekeeping, it, it is quite clear that uh, NATO forces on a national basis are going to be called upon to do that more and more. They already are. Uh, we definitely want to be able to continue to provide support to partners when they need it and ask for it. We've done that in the past uh, in response to, to natural disasters, for example. I wouldn't draw a direct link between NATO and, and migration, though I absolutely share the view that you know, people are going to be moving because where they live has become uh, uninhabitable. And you know, that's, that's a reality we're going to have to, to adapt to. Uh, I'd like to, to come back just a little bit to the, um, you know, everything is bad. Uh, it's, you know, we should go to the beach or however you uh, framed it. And I think it's important also for us to look at the positives. And uh, I didn't actually see that many positives till I took on this, uh, this job. But, um, you know, as I was reading all the data, I'm like, oh my God, this is really bad. Uh, but then I actually also see and start to see more and more opportunities that can make a difference. And I'll give you an example, uh, which is biofuel and synthetic fuel. Uh, so these basically don't produce carbon emissions. So I went to see uh, Boeing and I talked to our militaries and uh, we can, if there were enough, fly all of our aircraft on synthetic or biofuel. The technology exists, uh, the raw materials exist, what we don't have is processing because there's not enough of a demand signal from the commercial aviation sector or from the military aviation sector. But what the air airlines say to us is, if you can add to that demand signal by pushing more into this, it'll encourage industry to start building it, and then we can feed it in. The Swedes just flew one of their fighter planes 100% on biofuel, with basically uh, an 80% reduction in, uh, in emissions. So there are technological solutions out there. If we adopt them, you don't have to invent it. It's not fusion reactors. It's there, here right now. So I say this because you know, it's important for us to realize there are big solutions that can make a big difference. And I'll give you one more example. The US Army has decided that all of their facilities, all of their fleets are going to go to net zero by 2035. The US military is the biggest fleet owner and landowner in the United States. When they make a decision like that, it makes a statistical difference to the emissions of the United States. And we're going to be looking at the best practices of all of the allies, making a compendium of them and sharing them with everybody in June so that all of our countries can lift up to that high standard that the US Army is now, has now decided publicly to take. So I think, you know, I'd love people to leave here recognizing all the challenges, but realizing also that there are real solutions that we can find with political will and new technologies. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, I think one of the um, difficulties of uh, um, the politics of talking about climate, the climate crisis and climate security is, is this sort of, uh, we all talk about the problems and the, and the, and the you know, impacts, um, the droughts, the food shortages, all, all of the sea level rise, all these kinds of things. And we, we forget that this is a um, opportunity to build a much better world, right? To change things, to, to get ourselves off of fossil fuels, to reimagine cities uh, in ways that are perhaps more humane, uh, more livable. Um, this is a great kind of transitionary sort of moment in, in, our, in our civilization. Um, and so I want to ask, just open for the panel, all of you, um, what do you think is the best way to inspire that, in, especially at a moment like this, right? We're in a dark moment with the war, with um, the carnage that we're seeing all the time. It's easy to forget that we also have an opportunity to build a, a much better world, that we're fighting for a better place, not to go back to what we used to have, but trying to reimagine our world and political alliances, you know, how we live, where we live. What would you say is the sort of one thing, the one tool that you hope people will think about and, and inspire people 
to kind of grasp that this is not a fight. It's a fight against kind of darkness, but it's also a fight for light. And, and I just want to hear what each of you have to say about that. Uh, I can start with that. Um, I think that, first of all, um, I kind of want to start on where people can get involved, because sometimes I get asked, well, I want to do something about climate change, but where do I start? And I think the first thing is it's really important to start having conversations with your community, talking to your friends, your family, um, just anywhere. And then from there, I think it's really important to find your climate story. And what I mean by that is everybody is experiencing the climate crisis right now all around the world, but in different ways. And there are some people who don't even realize that it's happening. And so I think that it's important to find out what your climate story is, because from there, that's where you find your motivation. And so I have, a, I have a lot of love for my hometown, and I want to protect it and keep it safe. And so I think that once you see where your inspiration is coming from, that can show you where you want to get, invo get involved in climate activism. And so I also think that um, you know, it's important to focus on systemic actions as well. Mm -hmm. And so when people get involved, sometimes they just focus on recycling and um, you know, transportation. But it's, impor it's important to focus on systemic actions, because right now, 71% of global greenhouse gas emissions come from 100 companies all around the world. And you aren't going to change that by just not using plastic for one day. And so when you start by talking to your politicians, organizing with other young people, protesting, so turn, being less of an individual and joining with a collective movement of people. And so that is where you're really going to start to see more action happening. And then I also want to add that right now we have within seven years of our carbon budget. And um, with that carbon budget, I think that it's an important reminder of the time that we have left, and that's a certain urgency that we have. And once you see that timeline, that will remind you constantly what we have to do, and also remind others that we have that timeline. Great, thanks. Um, we're running out of time. I want to hear from the rest of the other three uh, panelists briefly on their thoughts about um, about this. Nasheed? Yep. Um, I would look at the, the, the whole Russia um, uh, Ukraine invasion war is that even the most, the climate leader was supposed to be Germany, was also vulnerable. I thought Germany was doing great in terms of renewables and how they were looking at. Um, I see all the German uh, and other European Union countries flying into the Gulf oil and rich countries to make sure their energy budgets are ready for the upcoming days because you've been going through the worst winter. So I think the, the whole idea is that no country is that prepared, self-resilient in their own climate action. This showed how vulnerable all these countries are. It opened up the hypocrisy in the climate action. They all were claiming they were doing amazing work in their home and only for me to see almost all the foreign ministers were in the Gulf countries during the whole Ukraine war. So. I think the countries has to realize that you know it's, it's a security issue now coming into their picture, how vulnerable their country will get. I mean, you are you're bargained based on energy, like how our colleague mentioned in the call. You have to be using this as a way to make sure you are self-resilient, your energy system is owned, nobody dictates you. I mean, that would be a big learning lesson from this war. Thank you, that's a great point. Uh, Jill? Um, I kind of reiterate that really. I think during the pandemic we heard talk about we would build back better or build you know in a, a this is the wake-up call that actually it's climate is climate change is here with us now we're experiencing it but it's also causing security problems and health problems and there should not be another building built that requires huge amounts of energy we ought to really learn from this that our future depends on thinking about what we do now and look at it as a real opportunity for changing things. Right, right. Okay, James, um, you want to wrap this up and um, your your sort of final thoughts on on this? Sure. Um, and and I, I just add two thoughts. I really fully agree with what everybody has said, in particular about how you need systemic change. But let me add one more point, which I think is relevant for for young people uh, who are also um, involved in other areas. I think technology is going to be crucial for getting us beyond the situation we're in now. I don't really see societies making gigantic individual changes to the way we live, so we're going to need technological solutions. And in my division, we're applying 
artificial intelligence, big data, technological innovation, the whole technological ecosystem to climate because that's where we're going to find big systemic changes, the way they've applied it now, for example, to fusion technology. And for the first time, you're getting more energy out of a fusion reactor than you're putting into it. So again, a hopeful technological change which would have massive beneficial effects when it comes to climate. And the last point I would make is uh, we can get involved also inside the institution. So right across the street, I have a young intern who is now, uh, she's an expert on climate. She's finishing the first draft of the NATO climate change impact assessment that NATO heads of state and government are going to look at in Madrid. So her pen is going to make a big difference to how these leaders uh, see things. So and if everyone watching uh, can make that kind of a difference. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, this has been pretty great, I have to say. <laughs> Thank you to my panelists uh, who have been quite inspiring. Um, and uh, I guess that will wrap it up. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful afternoon and um, continued discussions there in Brussels. Thank you very much. Well, an inspiring session indeed. Thank you both so much for being here in person. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, we'll move to our next session now. <laughs> Fantastic. So now we are going to another non-traditional security issue that affects all of us in our daily life, cybersecurity. I'm sure all of us have at one point or another received one of those emails where a company you shop with online has some kind of breach and now uh, your credit card has been compromised and you have to go change one of your billion passwords. But we've also seen that these cyber attacks and cyber crimes can happen on a massive scale with really serious implications for our militaries, our societies, and our economies. So in our next session, we will have the opportunity to hear a little bit of storytelling from the deputy head of NATO's cyber unit, Chelsea Slack, who's going to help paint a picture about how these cyber threats happen and what they mean in real life. And after she's finished, we will have a quick opportunity for a Q&A. So please be thinking ahead. And with that, please join me in welcoming to the stage, Chelsea Slack. Fantastic. Chelsea, over to you. Thank you very much, Lauren. Today, our cyber story begins and ends in Ukraine via Copenhagen. When the worldwide container tracking logistics operation at Maersk was knocked offline, do you remember what happened five years ago? You might have seen the Wired magazine story about it, the most devastating cyber attack in history. Just in case you didn't see it, here's what happened. On a sunny afternoon in June 2017, Maersk's tracking logistics operation was wiped out. In the words of one IT staffer, I saw a wave of screens turning black, black, black. A computer worm made its way from one small software company in Kyiv, Ukraine, to machines across the world. Some of those machines belong to Maersk. Based in Copenhagen, Maersk is the world's largest container shipping firm. According to one statistic, Maersk's ships carry up to 20,000 containers, and they arrive in a port somewhere around the world every 15 minutes. In all, this represents approximately one-fifth of the entire world's shipping capacity. Not to mention the global disruption to the delivery of all sorts of goods making their way across the oceans to us. But it wasn't only Maersk that was affected. While originally targeting entities in Ukraine, the malicious code spread across the world, affecting everything from our mail to our medicine. FedEx 
TNT Express, Merck, Mondelez, even a Cadbury chocolate factory in Tasmania was affected. Long before the pandemic, when the word viral took on a completely new meaning, the NotPetya cyber incident really did go viral. It was global in reach, and it cut across sectors. The total damage of the NotPetya cyber incident is estimated to be about $10 billion globally. And in the words of Andy Greenberg, the author of the Wired magazine story on NotPetya, distance is no defense. Fast forward five years later, back to the streets of Kyiv, a brutal, wholly unprovoked, and unjustified invasion of Ukraine by Russia. The war is happening in the physical world, but it's also taking place in the digital world. Cyberspace was used to open the invasion, to disable Ukrainian communications, and the ability for the government to communicate with its people. Attacks with data wiping malware targeted Ukrainian entities in government, commercial, and energy sectors to paralyze computer systems. Ukrainians attempting to check in with loved ones to see whether they were safe from harm were denied access to the internet by cyber attackers. But some of these effects were not just limited to Ukraine. Thousands of miles above the Earth, a satellite called KASAT provides high-speed internet to people across Europe. Just before the invasion on the 24th of February, the satellite connections were interrupted. Tens of thousands of people were knocked offline across Europe, from the Czech Republic to the UK, from Poland to Germany. More than 5,800 wind turbines across Central Europe lost connectivity. Many of them were disrupted for weeks. These cascading effects are significant, and they're serious, and they could have easily been worse. Cyber attacks can affect our ability to turn off the lights or to access our digital lives. At worst, they can even threaten lives. They can have physical effects, such as disrupting the transportation of people trying to flee violence. They can have cognitive effects by creating chaos, confusion, and uncertainty in those that are vulnerable. Cyberspace is also a place where not just governments are actors. Looking at the war in Ukraine, the role of non-state actors is striking. From Elon Musk delivering Starlink internet, to social media companies restricting access to Russian media state outlets, or to businesses withdrawing their support and their services in country. Not to mention global hacking collectives unleashing so-called cyber war on both sides. It was reported that Ukraine's IT army has more than 300,000 members on its Telegram channel. You wouldn't imagine that an army of citizens could suddenly take to fighter jets or to warships to support their country's war effort. But in cyberspace, the dynamics are different. The barriers for entry are lower. Actors can buy malicious software on the web and pose a considerable threat. So Lauren, why does all this matter? From the NotPetya cyber incident five years ago to the cyber attacks we're seeing today in Ukraine and beyond. Cyberspace is on at all times. It's a contested space. We are constantly connected. We have countless devices. The impact of technology on our lives is real. It underpins practically everything that we do. So while today's cyber story might begin, and it might end in Ukraine, it can have impacts across the world. 
These impacts can take us offline, disable our ability to communicate, disrupt energy flows, and distort the way we understand the world. So this makes it a matter of concern for us all, from Ukraine to Copenhagen to Tasmania to right here in Belgium. Thank you so much, Chelsea. And you're right, cyber is something that just doesn't discriminate can, and have an effect on everyone at the same time and it can spread so quickly and so easily. Um, so thank you for highlighting that and painting a picture. We have just about one minute before we'll transition to our cyber simulation, which I'm really excited about. But um, I think one of the questions all of us are thinking, based on what you outlined, is what, what is NATO doing to help bolster its defenses and to counter some of these cyber attacks and these challenges that you just highlighted? Yeah, thank you very much for the question, Lauren. I think you can think of the activities that NATO and allies have been taking recent weeks, months, even years, as we recognize uh, the evolving threat that cyberspace poses. You can really consider it along three main lines of effort. So the first is we see there's a lot going on in cyberspace. And so how do we make sense of this so that we can then inform our leaders to take decisions? So the first thing that NATO's been focused on with its allies is really trying to connect the dots, ramping up information sharing, using NATO as a platform where everyone brings their pieces of the puzzle so that you have a better idea of what's happening, so you have a better idea of how to advise on what responses could be. So the first really is around information exchange, using NATO as that platform for overall situational awareness. The second piece, which is linked to it, is if we have an idea of what's happening, how then do we prepare and guard against it? And here, you've heard also through the discussion today around critical infrastructure. So how do we help allies using NATO as a platform once again to enhance their resilience to guard against some of these threats? And you've seen several allies in recent days releasing advisories, warning publics, warning critical infrastructure operators of some of the risks that we're seeing. And last but not least, cyberspace is a shared space. And so NATO and its allies are working very closely, not just among the 30 allies, but also with partners. And uh, we're providing practical support to Ukraine. Several allies have offered even more assistance, looking at really how to support in defending against these cyber attacks, but also working with the private sector, recognizing that we're all part of this collective of enhancing our resilience and security in cyberspace. So those are the main areas around trying to understand what's happening, guarding against some of the risks, particularly to our economies and our societies, and then working with others who all have different pieces of the puzzle to put that together and be more resilient in the process. Resilience, such a key word we hear so much about these days. So thank you so much for that. We're going to stick with this set of issues on cybersecurity and now move, uh, while we stay on stage here, will take part in a quick cyber simulation, which is something I've been really looking forward to. So I'll ask everyone again to go into the app because we are going to respond to a series of questions that are going to be led by our terrific SIPA senior fellow, Jason Israel. He's gonna walk you through a scenario where all of you will have to demonstrate your skills in responding to a cyber attack. Uh, let's see if we're better at this than geolocating. Um, so, First, to see what challenge we have to tackle, let's go to Danica from Sky News Australia, who will give us a scenario before Jason picks us up virtually. I'm Danika DiGiorgio, and we're, of course, back to this major developing story of suspected simultaneous cyber attacks on shipping ports in Europe and the United States. While many details are still unclear, here's what we know. Earlier today, Europe's two largest shipping ports in Rotterdam, Netherlands, and Antwerp in Belgium reported within minutes of one another suffering technical problems that forced operations to a halt. Shortly after, across the Atlantic, the port of New York and New Jersey, one of America's largest was forced to shut down due to similar issues. The severity of these problems, along with the simultaneous occurrence, have had over the past several hours many experts speculating this was likely the result of a cyber attack. Rotterdam and Antwerp together process over 100 container ships each day with 2 million tonnes of cargo. And in the port of New York and New Jersey, an estimated 200 billion US dollars in goods move through each year. All are heavily relied upon for US and Europe's imports and exports.
This just in, we are now receiving reports that electrical power grid fluctuations have been reported in southeastern Europe and two transmission system operators, ESO in Bulgaria and Trans Electrica in Romania, have activated emergency system defence to attempt to restore electrical power to its normal state. These effects are in sections of Europe's continental Europe, Cycronius area, the largest in the world, serving 35 countries and over 400 million people. We can now report that both Europe European and American authorities have confirmed suspicions that these ports and electrical grids were targets of an unprecedented cyber attack, with the attackers at this point a mystery. The many uncertainties surrounding these extraordinary developments have sent global markets reeling, while all European stock markets currently remain open. Declines in New York, London, Frankfurt and others illustrate the global nature of the situation. We are told that the European leaders and the US president have been in communication. All also, that the NATO leadership and the NATO military committee will convene shortly to discuss security implications of these developments. We will continue to monitor the impact of this astonishing news. Simultaneous cyber attacks on US and European ports and the European electrical grid, with volatility in the markets currently open as we await more information and official statements from Washington, Brussels and throughout Europe. More to follow after a short break. Hello everyone in Brussels. I'm Jason Israel. Thank you, Chelsea, and thank you, Lauren, um, for that perfect introduction to what we just saw, the, situa the situation uh, that, is, that Danica just reported on of these unprecedented cyber attacks. I would like to invite you to take yourself from Brussels, uh, where you are there in the studio room, or wherever you're watching remotely, and take you to Washington, DC, to the White House Situation Room, or to Brussels, to the NATO Military Committee, to The Hague, to Albany, New York, to Trenton, New Jersey, to Sofia, Bulgaria, to Bucharest, Romania, where during this situation, all global leaders are poised and fixed their attention on what's happening with these unprecedented cyber attacks. Now, you are those leaders. And I'm going to ask you a series of questions that are gonna help guide us a discussion about how the world can respond to an attack like this. First of all, the question I have for you is to define the severity of this situation from the perspective of national security. Would you view this as an armed conflict, a security breach on critical infrastructure security, or is this a private sector business risk issue? I'd like to give you a little bit of time to look at that. Okay, so now taking a look at these results, as I go through each one of these, the reason that these questions are so difficult and these factors are not, not necessarily easy to define is because many of the laws and policies related to armed conflict and related to security have been built for the, for the physical world over the last uh, decades and centuries. Uh, so when it comes to cyber, these are not as easy. So of course, you look at the uh, the unprecedented coordinated nature of these attacks. And it definitely looks like whoever is perpetrating these attacks has done it to affect a national level attack. And to that point, it looks like armed conflict. Um, however, for these other two options, security breach on critical infrastructure and private sector business, we just have to remind ourselves that many of these, uh, these targets are private sector entities. Um, so whereas a military base being hit by something may relatively be easily defined as a armed forces target, it becomes a much more difficult to define from both a domestic legal and an international legal sense when we think about, uh, when we think about the severity of the attack. Okay, good job. Let's keep moving along. Now we have to figure out how we're going to react to this. Of the following options, what would you view as the best immediate response? Would you 
immediately follow all of the standard technical procedures to bring services back online that companies like ESO in Bulgaria and Transelectrica in Romania have put into place? And would you, or would you convene the international institutions and governments to decide on response first? Or finally, we've developed computer emergency response teams throughout these nations and throughout the, uh, the alliance. Would you inform them and rapidly deploy these computer emergency response teams or what we call CERTs? I'll give you a little time to, to go through that. Okay, now the big point on this question is, Danica, in her introduction to this, had breaking news that it is confirmed that this has been a cyber attack. That particular point is one of the most difficult during this whole process. We have private sector companies often reporting that it can be days, weeks, sometimes even months after a cyber attack where they found out that they've been attacked because they wouldn't necessarily see the effect like this. Um, and so part of it is an investigation to whether you even have a cyber attack. So in this scenario, as we've said, companies like ESO and Transelectrica have moved automatically into their system defense mode. That would be their local technical procedures, partially because they didn't understand it was a cyber attack at first. They were going through their normal procedures. Now the next two, convening international institutions and governments and deploying computer emergency response teams, these would come when you start to know a little bit more about what is happening, what could be the cause of the attack. And remember, we don't even necessarily know who did the attack yet. But when we're actually trying to decide what the national or international response should be, we're going to have to want to figure that out. And to do that, we're going to be collecting information and intelligence on what we know when it comes to who conducted the attack. And having all of that information resident in each one of the countries across the alliance, uh, as well as at NATO headquarters, brings up another question. As we move forward and we start to get more information and we start to get more intelligence we're sharing across, team, what is the appropriate media and public communications policy as we get more information? for a cyber attack of this scale, would you recommend we be proactive and provide all information to the public with continuous updates? Should we be more passive and respond to questions only and include only fully confirmed information? Or should we block and deny reported information or refuse to comment uh, because of the implications of sharing that information? I'll give you another little bit of time. split. Yeah. Okay. Now look team, the reason that I'm giving you these questions and these particular solutions are they're not easy. And of course, always it depends. Right? So I'm bringing these questions up because if you think about the movement of information about how these attacks took place, who might be responsible has, comes into one other you know, major hurdle, which is how can information be shared across the Alliance, across the Atlantic um, and between different institutions and at what speed? So picture one individual nation finding out what they believe is confirmed information about who the attacks were. And I'll just broadly categorize attackers that could be a state actor, like another country that's actually trying to do this, or it could be a private group that's conducting cyber terrorism, or there could be something in between where there's a state that rather than using their own personnel to conduct the attack, they're doing a space, they are sponsoring another group in order to do it. So it makes it much more complex. 
And if you think about it, the, we, we, when we think about conflicts at any time right now in Ukraine, when we're looking at these horrific numbers and these horrific reports of warfare within Ukraine and the human toll, we kind of understand it because we've been raised listening to history and understanding what the toll of physical warfare is. But if we're educating the public real time during this situation where the shipping, is effect, the shipping of the world is affected, the markets are reeling because of it, electrical grids are fluctuating and power is going out, there's also a key sense of education that has to happen when we're proactive. And to be a government leader, to be a public sector or private sector leader, providing that assurance that across the alliance, we are doing everything we can to address it. But at the same time, if we're sharing information, we're sharing intelligence publicly, that could actually aid the adversary because they, we are reporting what it is that we know. And if the adversary, the attacker, can see what it is that we know, then they might be able to more effectively continue their attack. So it's very difficult in this scenario to also determine um, how you move forward when it comes to your, your public media stance. So we have heard from Chelsea. We've heard from Lauren and Chelsea discussing NATO's preparation. We've gone through this scenario a bit together, and we've gone through three questions that we, uh, as leaders of, in international institutions and government leaders, uh, have to face as we go through a scenario like this. So lastly, before I provide some, um, some closing thoughts on this and we move ahead, I would like to just hear from you in an open uh, few words, seeing this and as we prepare and move forward, knowing what you know now, having seen this scenario, what do you think needs to be our first priority in improving cybersecurity? You can list one word or a few words. <laughs> That's a good one. Guys, we're the digital generation. We can't go analog. <laughs> <laughs> I do like the thought, Lauren. <laughs> it's a valiant effort. Sometimes, right? Yes, I'm just gonna give this a few more seconds, but I'm really enjoying um, seeing your response form for responses formulate here. Thank you. So yes, so that's why we're here. We're here in a forum where without this actual scenario taking place for real, we can educate on what does it feel like to actually Recording see in this progress. Report, to see this report. Recording stopped. To see this, what is it like to see this scenario? What does it feel like? Just taking that moment to picture a day where that news clip actually comes up for real and thinking through all that you've done and being able to look back on this session and think, what is it that I started to prepare myself for? How did I educate myself? How did we cooperate internationally to move forward a little bit better when it comes to this? And so just a couple of key points on that as we move forward. One is cyber is thought of by a lot of people to be something that computer scientists or programmers are the ones that get into. And I want to tell you that throughout my journey working with what is now U.S. Cyber Command uh, over the last 15 years um, since we've worked to build the U.S. Cyber Command, we need people that are thinking about policy, people that are thinking about marketing, people thinking, that are thinking about uh, language uh, translation, people that are thinking about history, um, philosophy almost, trying to understand um, where, does, where does cyber fit into this world as a public good versus being a risk as well. Um, so no matter what field you're in, cyber affects you. And not just because you're an internet user. It can be something that you get more uh, both educated in, proactive in, and then ultimately um, can enact more leadership in, which is, as you can see from this scenario, something that we definitely all need. And finally, my point, and then I'd love to turn it over to Chelsea for a couple minutes, please, um, after your wonderful introduction, to just see if you have any um, closing thoughts from the NATO perspective on any of this discussion is just to say that the physical world, again, for decades and centuries, our, our history books and our understanding 
about what a, what a missile impact means and what escalation means when it comes to firing back with a missile is generally understood in the field of warfare. But I think that in the field of cyber warfare, we're still writing the, the forward to the book, maybe even chapter one of the book, when it comes to our understanding of how to respond to a cyber attack and how to move forward in a, in a situation like this. So I'll begin to close my remarks now based on everything that we've gone through just in review. What is the severity of the situation? Armed conflict or are we going around trying to make arrests? Is it a legal issue? Is it a critical infrastructure issue? Or are we relying on the private sector to be able to, uh, to handle it itself? When it comes to responses, are you following local processes? What does it mean to convene uh, on a for a cyber security and cyber attack incident and across governments and across international institutions? When it comes to your media posture, do you share everything? Can you even share anything if it's classified or if it's intelligence? And then what are the education and of course public confidence elements of that? And finally, your wonderful word, uh, uh, words that you used for improving cybersecurity, primarily in education and international cooperation and others. Chelsea, we've just been through an amazing cyber attack and I'm really impressed by this team and how they've uh, come, come to just in just a few minutes, understand the realm of responsibility when it comes to responding to a cyber attack. I would love to hear your thoughts um, from your perspective, perspective before we move on. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. And, and thank you, everybody. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted that one of the words that appeared up there was international cooperation, because obviously working for an alliance of 30 countries founded on the idea that we can achieve more when we work together, that's absolutely critical. And as we saw from this scenario, too, often it's not just governments uh, or the state that are owning or operating critical infrastructure, for example. So then, as the scenario showed, working then with the private sector, working with uh, those that actually have that expertise to operate and own this infrastructure is absolutely critical. So I think it goes back to what we discussed at the very beginning, this idea around trying to connect the dots and have as much information as possible. It's very challenging at the beginning, especially because you're trying to understand what's happening, so you can then advise on what responses are appropriate. Next, who's taking the lead? Who needs to be involved? What are the different roles? Do you remain at a national level or even a local level if it starts there, a national level? And then how does that international cooperation piece fit in? I think in addition to the notion of international cooperation, once again, this highlights the importance of resilience and the importance of being prepared to deal with the range of cyber threats, which is something here we're working uh, very closely to do. And last but not least, it was mentioned in some of the earlier sessions, but would really encourage everybody, whether you like in this field to work for the private sector or the public sector, a national administration or an international organization, including this one, uh, really, it's a field uh, that needs the experts, the ideas, and so would really encourage you to consider it. Thanks, Lauren. Super. And maybe, uh, Jason, if you'll allow me just to jump in here, because uh, we have about one minute left before uh, we wrap up this segment. But there's some really interesting questions coming in the app here. And I wanted to take advantage of having you both here, because there's a question about, does NATO have offensive cyber capabilities? We've talked a lot about resilience and trying to defend against cyber attacks and mitigate risks. But what do you make of offense? How does that work? No, that's a great question, Lauren. NATO is a defensive alliance. Allies have been very clear about that notion. Um, NATO, as such, relies, like in the other domains, air, land, and sea, on the capabilities and the assets of its allies. Cyberspace is no different. And so allies have agreed to volunteer the range of their capabilities for the benefit of NATO missions and operations. As you said, Lauren, to make sure that we're defending in this space, but that we're also able to carry out the core tasks, including collective defense, crisis management, and cooperative security. So the bottom line is, like in the other domains, NATO relies on allies for the range of capabilities, and it is for allies to then offer those the effects of those capabilities to ensure that NATO can carry out its core tasks. That's great. And Jason, in 30 seconds, could you give us a perspective from a, a U.S. Cyber Command? How is the U.S. thinking about cyber offense? Yes, well, absolutely. And Chelsea nailed it. It is exactly right, is that each we work with each one of our partners to determine what is an offensive cyber capability. But if you haven't learned uh, um, this in the last 20 minutes, in cyber, it's always just a little bit more difficult. Why? Because what is even constituted offensive 
can actually be different in cyber in one example area, which is we think of computer network of defense. You have a big uh, wall that you're using. What if you set it up such that if something hits it, it automatically hits back at something that's been attacked? That's a response action. And the big question, and it's a policy question across different countries is, is that an offensive attack or is it defensive? Your network just being able to plug something. So um, just that additional question is something that we can continue to educate ourselves. So if that day comes where it's hopefully not, that a cyber attack happens like this, then we can all be reading um, off the same legal and policy definitions as an alliance. Jason, thank you so much. All right, shall we check in with Danica and see how we did? Yes, absolutely. Thanks all. I'm Danika DiGiorgio reporting on this rapidly developing story of multiple coordinated cyber attacks in the US and Europe. As we await formal comments from US, European and NATO leadership, we can reflect on the unprecedented nature of these incidents. The level of coordination and the widespread effects on trade, electricity and markets suggest today marks a new era that many have predicted, but that we all hoped would not come to be, where cyber warfare is employed on a massive scale with little regard to the devastation in its wake. We can all hope that today's leaders and, importantly, the emerging leaders of tomorrow are preparing to stay a step ahead of the attacks such as those we see in the US and Europe today. We'll be back with more as this story unfolds. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Chelsea, for joining thanks. us. Many thanks to Jason for that scenario. And thank you all for your responses. Fantastic. Thank you. OK. So we have just seen that there are some issues like cyber that affect everyone. They don't necessarily discriminate. But there are other security challenges that do actually have disparate effects on different groups, uh, depending on their gender or their religion or their race or some other factor. So our next segment is going to focus on this concept of identity and how that shapes our perceptions of security and the importance of having diverse people in security policymaking to help account for that. So to kick us off, we're going to start with a special interview of the US Undersecretary of the Air Force, the Honorable Gina Ortiz Jones, who was the first gay woman of color and a military veteran running for office back in 2018 in Texas. She's also a first generation American and has a really interesting perspective to share on diversity and identity. She will be interviewed by Taya, who is a young ambassador of Italy uh, from the organization Inspiring Girls International, which is a really cool organization that looks to raise the aspirations of young girls by connecting them with role models around the world. So take a listen to their conversation about the Undersecretary's own path to being a leader in national security. Hello everyone, I'm Tam. I'm the Italian ambassador for Inspiring Girls. Today I have the huge honor to get to speak with the Undersecretary of the US Air Force, Gina Ortiz Jones. Good evening. Hi Tia, how are you? I'm really good. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, very excited to be uh, to be speaking with you. And uh, you know, when I think about how I uh, enjoy spending my time, you know, ranking right up there is speaking to the next generation, and certainly given world events, um, talking about the importance of NATO moving forward. So really looking forward to this conversation. I completely agree with you. I'm really excited to get to have this conversation. So. My first question for you is that every day as the Undersecretary of the US Air Force, I personally assume might represent new challenges or new possibilities. So can you possibly describe the day of your job for us? And which are the aspects of your job that most challenge you or reward you? Yeah, well, Tia, thank you again for, uh, for, for hosting this. And um, I must say, when I um, start my morning, I actually start through obviously walking to my office and um, it's not lost on me every morning still, right? Almost almost 10 months into this, um, the, uh, the feeling of awe uh, that I have when I walk through the halls of the Pentagon. Uh, not only as I think about those that came before me, but then as I also think about, um, you know, frankly, the power I have, um, the power that those of us in these uh, in these positions entrusted to lead at these levels have uh, to make sure that we've got uh, the best airmen and guardians, uh, um, as well as making sure that they've got the resources to be to be successful, um, as well as making sure their families are also well cared for. 
Um, so I must say that, you know, starting that off every morning with, with a walk in is, is, is truly inspiring and very humbling. Um, every morning, though, the secretary and I, we also get an intelligence briefing and it shows us, um, it really kind of lays out those things um, that challenge uh, or potentially try to challenge our ability uh, to maintain um, air superiority and space superiority. Uh, the Department of the Air Force includes both the Air Force and the Space Force. So as we think about threats moving forward and opportunities and challenges, we think about those in the air domain and in the, and in the space domain. Um, and so the Department of the Air Force, uh, the secretary is charged with, you know, organizing training and equipping. And what that means is, you know, how is the force ready for those, um, for, for those challenges um, in terms of investments, long-term investments that, need to, that we need to make, as well as maintaining certain capabilities in the short term, um, uh, given, what, given what may arise, certainly as, as what's happening in Russia and Ukraine are showing us. Um, again, uh, you know, threats to uh, threats to um, uh, our democracy and threats to security um, are never going to go away. So, how do we make sure we've got enough um, uh, we've got enough capacity there? Um, but you know, every day is is again just a wonderful opportunity to make sure that our airmen and our guardians have what they need to be successful. That we're retaining uh, the best talent. That we're also recruiting the best talent. So it's really a, a balance between ensuring we're preparing for the high end fight as well as being sure our people can serve to their full potential. So I'll tell you, I spent a lot of time kind of thinking about the budget, uh, but a lot of my day is really spent asking three questions, right? Which is why, why not, and where is the data, right? This again is about how we make investments, but also are we ensuring that we've got policies that ensure that all of our airmen and guardians can serve to their full potential. So I must admit that is really probably the most rewarding part of this job for me is ensuring that we've got the next, uh, the best talent, we're keeping the best talent and we're preparing our airmen uh, and our guardians and our civil servants to be successful in a high end fight. I find your job to be really interesting and I can only imagine how much effort you put in to get where you are today. You went from joining the US Air Force to working at the Defense Intelligence Agency, serving in the office of the U.S. Trade Representative, running for Congress, and now you're serving as the U.S. Undersecretary for the Air Force. Can you possibly tell us how you got where you are today? And what's your biggest piece of advice for young people that are just joining the service or even other career paths? Yeah, well, you know, Tia, when I think about my own story, I mean, it's certainly when I've been honored to the, the number of ways in which I've been honored to serve our, our country kind of in and out of uniform. Um, but really what what also has um, helped me um, and to help me get to where I am is, is my family's story. And, uh, you know, I'm a proud first generation American. Uh, my mom actually came to the U.S. Um, as a domestic helper. She graduated from the number one university in the Philippines, but wanted a chance at the American dream. Um, and so she just reminded my sister and I every single day that we were very lucky, not smart, right? We were very lucky to be born in this in a special country and we'd have to give back to a country that has given us so much. And so, um, you know, that that personal experience is, is really what has, has motivated me uh, to commit my life to a life of public service. And so it's always been about, you know, how can I best serve? How can I give back to a country that has given me and my family so much? Um, and, uh, and, and I think through uh, you know, national defense and my time in the intelligence community um, has only shown me the, frankly, again, the importance of, of American leadership. Uh, it's indispensable. Again, it's not something uh, that we can you know, face our challenges and, and our opportunities singularly though, right? Again, we do these with our partners and our allies and we do it through institutions like, like the NATO Alliance. Um, and so again, really uh, it's, an honor to, it's an honor to serve and it's an honor to make sure that, that those behind me have the same exact opportunities uh, to serve to their full potential. Um, you know, I will say when I served uh, in the Air Force, I served under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, uh, which at the time was a policy that said uh, you could serve as a member of the LGBTQ community, but you could not be open about, about who you are. Um, and I think, you know, as we think about, again, the challenges and opportunities that we face as a country and as an alliance, we need all hands on deck. Right, we need everybody giving their 150% every single day. And so now to be able to serve as the 27th Undersecretary of the Air Force, where I have a direct role in making sure that we, um, we have the best of rightists coming in to the Department of the Air Force, and, and as well as taking, making sure we take care of their families appropriately, it is really, a, it's truly, truly an honor. As someone from a newer generation, I love the message of equality and inclusivity that you give off. 
but unfortunately there are many people that aren't as positive. So I was just wondering, as a woman that comes from an immigrant family, have you ever had to overcome seatbacks or discriminations based off your ethnicity or gender? And if so, how did you manage to do that? I think you've always, regardless of, of what path you you select, right, and, and how you choose to, to spend your time and, and dedicate your, your kind of your energies, I think you've got to be very clear about why you are doing that, right, because that is going to what is that's going to sustain you, uh, because to your point, you know, you're, um, there are always going to be folks that kind of question kind of how you got there and why you're there and frankly, whether you deserve to be there, um, as if that has anything to do with them. Uh, and it really doesn't. And so you've got to be clear about why you're doing things. Um, and for me, it's again about being driven about public service and, and, and making sure those opportunities that I had, uh, that I similarly give back and make sure that those behind me have those same, if not better opportunities to serve. Um, again, because American leadership uh, is indispensable and it's too important to the, uh, not only to, to uh, our national security, but to, to global security. Um, and so I would give the, the piece of advice uh, that I, um, if anyone ever asked me for, for career advice, I tell them the same three things. Um, one, you got to be kind, right? Be kind. Uh, don't be a jerk. No one likes a jerk. Uh, secondly, you've got to work hard, right? Don't get outworked. So make sure that you, I didn't say, you know, work smart, uh, but also work hard. Don't work hard, just for work, working hard sake. Um, make sure that you are um, working hard, but doing so in a, in a smart way. And then lastly, you've got to be so good, they cannot ignore you. Right, be so good, they cannot ignore you. I think those three things, really regardless of what you're doing, whether you wanna be a lawyer, you wanna serve in the military, you wanna do both of those things at the same time, I think regardless of, of, of uh, you know, the career path you choose, those three things um, I think will serve you well. I hope they do at least in the way that they've served me well. Again, I just find your message so inspirational. It's just amazing. The last question I have for you today, but definitely not the least important one, is what's something you wish your younger self would have known before entering the army that you know now? I think sometimes when you are um, new, certainly to the workforce or new to an environment, you can um, maybe um, be a little bit scared to, to ask questions. Um, but I think if you've done your homework, right, and if you've put in um, uh, the work to, to better understand as best you can, I think the best thing that you can do for yourself and for the organization is to ask those tough questions, right? Because it is in the interest of, of doing a good job, in the interest of best serving the organization. And sometimes, you know, again, you bring a different lived experience. And so that experience, that experience, excuse me, is as important as any other. And that'll come across in the questions that you ask. Um, and then certainly then the question, the, um, but don't be afraid of the answer, right? Because then if you get the answer, you've got to be able to have the courage to take the action uh, to move out on that. Um, I think secondly, uh, trust your gut, right? Trust your gut. Um, you, you know what you've done to prepare yourself for that moment to serve and to excel. And so if something doesn't feel right, um, you know, trust your gut um, and make sure that, uh, um, that, that you can frankly look yourself in the mirror um, every evening, every morning and say that, um, that you've done your absolute best. I just want to end this interview by saying that this has been one of the most honestly inspirational conversations I've ever had. It's been a huge honor getting to speak to you. You've, you're a very interesting person and it's been amazing. Thank you very much for this. Well, thank you, Tia. I mean, this is a really important conversation, uh, certainly given the time. Um, but I think when we always think about inspiring the next generation, certainly into public service, but also reminding them of, of, uh, of the values that we hold dear um, as, a, as a democracy um, and what it takes to um, sustain that, right? This, this doesn't just kind of go on um, in perpetuity without threats. And so uh, reminding ourselves of, of why NATO is important, why the next generation understands it's important is, is so, so critical. So I wanna thank you uh, for your leadership and, and stepping up today. I truly believe that having a conversation between generations is one of the most important things we can do. So I completely agree with you. It's been absolutely amazing. Thank you everyone for watching. And again, thank you Undersecretary for having this conversation with me. Goodbye everyone.
Thank you so much to Taya. That was a great uh, preview for our discussion. We're going to stick with these issues about gender and identity in security and peace with our next panel, which is full of inspiring women, so many. It's honestly staggering. I'm so honored to be on the stage with all of you. We also have two speakers that are joining us virtually. We're going to dive deeper into some of the issues that the Undersecretary uh, and Taya raised. Uh, but before I hand it over to uh, Daria Nashat, the co-founder of Women in Politics, who will be our moderator for this session. We're going to see a quick video that is a snapshot of some of the work that one of our panelists, Shiran, is leading with the Listen to My Voice campaign. She will explain more about this in the panel, and we'll have a an opportunity to talk about it. But we'll see the video first. And just a quick warning to everyone, this is about domestic violence, which may be triggering to some. But I please encourage you to take a listen to this video, and then I will have Daria pick us up. Thank you. I was Michal Sera. In 2019, I was murdered by the man who was my husband, the killer, Elivan Malouf. And today, after I lost my life, I call on you. Listen to my voice. If you are in a relationship or were in a relationship and he is jealous and obsessive towards you, if you are afraid of his reaction to parting from you, share it with a close person and a domestic violence expert will help you separate safely and return to your light. Listen to your gut feeling. Do it today. Listen to my voice. Listen to your voice. Hello and welcome, everyone, and uh, good afternoon, good morning to those coming from the virtual space. Hello, I see we have our other speakers uh, joining us virtually. Uh, welcome as well. I'm Daria Naschert, I'm the co-founder of Women in Politics, and I'm also a steering committee member of WISE Brussels. It's a real pleasure to be here today, and I am thrilled to have amazing speakers on this panel today. I would like to introduce them uh, as we, I will start with, Irene, Irene Fellin, who is uh, the new special representative at NATO for Women, Peace and Security. A warm welcome. I will continue with Shiran Melandowski Somek. She's the vice president of Impact DID and also the entrepreneur behind the Listen to My Voice campaign, which we just saw one video of. And I will, would like to welcome, of course, as well, Samina Ansari. She's the founding director of Aviana D Diplomacy and a senior consultant at Vector Consulting. And now I would like to welcome our uh, guests and speakers joining us virtually. Um, I would like to welcome Miriam Gonzalez Durantes, founder and chair, Inspiring Girls International. She is the person behind the campaign, uh, hashtag this little girl is me. Heart, a warm welcome to you as well. And of course, Corey Flazer, non-resident senior fellow at the Snowcroft Center for Strategy and Security Atlantic Council. Warm welcome to all of you. I would invite you to give a round of applause to our speakers and a warm welcome as well. It is such a pleasure to be here today, and uh, we are going to speak about women, gender, identity in peace and security. Gender and identity play an important role in how we experience security and how we are affected by instability, violence, and war. And in this session, we want to explore how security and peace can become more inclusive so that everybody is safe and secure. With other words, how do we create inclusive cultures and systems that ensure peace and security for all? How can we ensure that those who are most affected by insecurity and violence are at the core and become the co-creators of 21st century security architectures that serves all equally. 
how do we move from distrust and polarization today to communities of belonging, which make everyone feel safe? And what different ways do we have? And this is where we come to our distinguished uh, panel and speakers. Uh, what ways do we have to do it differently? Are there any, any new ideas, innovative, innovative approaches, tech? Uh, we've seen something uh, dealing with the tech, the possibilities to use tech. So I'm very thrilled again to have five experts and uh, speakers with me who will share very briefly some of their lessons and insights. And we will then open for questions and we hope to have a very interactive conversation together on this important topic. Irene, I would like to start with you. You are the new special representative here at NATO, and I am curious if you could share how does conflict disproportionately affect women and girls, and what is NATO doing about this? Why does it matter to NATO? Thank you, Dara. Thank you very much. So I'm very pleased to be here with you today. You said I'm new, yes, I joined NATO in my current capacities in January, but I have to say that I rejoined NATO because I used to work here around 10 years ago when I, maybe I was not young, but I was certainly younger than uh, today. The fact I uh, belong to a different generation is because I come with my papers on the stage instead of tablets or technology. Uh, but for me, it's extremely important to uh, engage with you, and I will come back uh, to this maybe later. Uh, because I would like to frame around the question made, what, why is this important for, for me, for us, and for the alliance I'm, I represent uh, here today working on this agenda. Uh, I'm sure that uh, many of you, I know some of you personally that are familiar with the resolution 1325 on women, peace, and uh, security, but maybe not all you uh, are so. So let me just uh, explain in two words why this is important. It was already introduced that uh, uh, security is different for the, for the population, for the individuals, and the, for the communities. And this is due to our role, the role we play uh, within the society, the gender role, the role, so the expectations that are built within a given society uh, on the, what uh, people, the others, expect from us as men and women in the way this is constructed. So what is are the expectation and how we should feel about this. The point is that we as an individual, we are uh, have specific needs and how we perceive society is something very uh, different. And then this, the genders are more complex and diversified. It's not just a binary system. So it, talking about women and men, is the starting point where we that start in a binary way, but then we have to add the, the intersectionality and the different component to have really an inclusive approach. And we look at the, if we look at the conflict and how this have a different impact on women and men. I would like to take uh, two examples that are also connected with the current situation in uh, uh, Ukraine. You, we all heard about the terrible crimes, war crimes that are going on, especially related to conflict-related sexual violence. This is nothing new, unfortunately. If we look back at the history, this has been a component of many conflicts, I would say, of all conflicts. Uh, this affects uh, uh, women and uh, girls most, uh, in a higher way, but doesn't exclude uh, men and boys as well. And the point is that this is really used as a tactic of war to harm women and then to uh, throw out, use the women to harm the entire society. And this is one of the elements we need to take into consideration when we analyze the conflict and we have to develop solutions. But I would like to take another example uh, as part of the conflict analysis when we want to provide some uh, help, humanitarian aid to a conflict. Uh, some, the UN... Um, release some data about the women who are going to deliver in this month uh, uh, in Ukraine uh, under the conflict. And they said last month that uh, they were expecting 80,000 women to deliver. You know that after you deliver, uh, the stress caused by the stress generally, if you have under stress, uh, the possibility that you can breastfeed and, and produce milk is 
is uh, limited because the body reacts to the stress. This means that giving birth in the underground, on, under the bombs, will have as a consequence, most probably, the fact that women will not and mother will not be able to breastfeed their children. So imagine the situation of women in Mariupol giving birth underground where they cannot receive any food, not only for themselves, but they cannot even feed their newborn children. So this means that when we as institution, international organization, analyze a conflict and need to provide solutions, we need to have this gender inclusive conflict analysis, which means asking ourselves, what, is the, what are the different needs of men and women in that given situation? Because we are different when women and the different all the genders that are there, the different people. And this was also a point uh, I would like to raise because we often talk about uh, women as a target, but as I said, gender are multiplier. The fact that men couldn't leave the country in Ukraine because of the martial law, because of the fact men between 18 and 16 were requested to stay and defend the country, was the there was no gender analysis in that sense. So we can also understand why the, the the circumstances, the emergency, but we are here for discussing and trying mm -hmm. to understand how we can do our business better. Transsexual people were not taken into consideration, so uh, all men, all individual born men were requested to stay. And so this is one of the elements when we say the need of having a, a gender analysis of the conflict, why this is important to take it into the, all the aspects into consideration. And Thank so that, that's, I think, uh, uh, I wanted to give some example uh, on how yeah. this is important at a general level. And of course, NATO has developed some policies that are applying to what NATO does. So what, how do we, do we respond uh, to conflict and how yeah. do you, we prepare our collective defense to take into the gender perspective into mm -hmm. consideration? Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, and, and to get a, a different perspective, complementary from within NATO, and perhaps the question, what can NATO do to Samina? You know, what can organizations do to actually ensure that this problem is being addressed? If you would like to share some thoughts on this. Absolutely. And I think that just building on some of the points that were addressed here, I mean, gender is not about womanhood. And, and when it comes to women in peace and security, women are not only victims, but they're also actors. And I think we need to do more work and, and actually shifting the narrative, speaking about women in, in war as like, you know, only as actors that are being violated, but actually also speaking about how we can empower them. Uh, and just sharing some experiences from my work in Afghanistan, um, one of the key things that I realize in my work is that uh, when we speak about gender and identity, we forget that we're actually talking about diversity and we're talking about diversity in the mind uh, more than anything else. And how can we actually include this diversity in identifying solutions, finding sustainable ways to work towards peace, but also for NATO as an institution to see how we can use diversity to build technology, to build better ways of actually supporting the nations that we're involved in. Um, and I think for NATO, uh, it's, a, it's an institution that is an incredible role model for so many nation states and to change the language that goes from victimhood to actor and also at the same time finding ways to look at this the way that for instance private sector does right now in more and more countries where they see this as a systematic a project and they see it as a very active project because we need to start by measuring what does it really mean for us and then moving on from that to actually work step by step on ways to include minds and also ways to find uh, diverse solutions because we live in a complex world and we need everyone on board to um, tackle some of the challenges that we're faced with. Thank you so much. Yes. I would like to continue and also ask Corey to share your views on this. What can organizations and institutions do to better address this issue and perhaps share some of your findings and, and insights with us? Well, good morning from Washington, D.C., and good afternoon to you all in Brussels. And thank you again to NATO and CIPA for the invitation to participate on this truly impressive panel of experts and for organizing the important, um, this important summit. I, I wanted to use my opening comments to reflect on a few things I've learned that I think help transform institutions like NATO to account for these intersecting identity characteristics, gender being among them, 
um, and this nexus that they have with security. My colleagues on the panel have spoken eloquently about why these issues are important. So the focus of my comments um, shifts more towards what institutions can do. And so I'll say upfront that ultimately I think we're, we're trying to transform these institutions from within, recognizing that they are often being pushed to transform from outside the organization by civil society. And I think this is where civil society plays a key role. You know, civil society is vast and diverse um, and it includes these very important actors that help tell defense institutions where they need to be and what they need to do to get there. So I'll highlight three actions um, among many um, that I think help uh, the perspectives of civil society transform these institutions beyond the continued dialogue they conduct on a regular basis, which is very important to continue. So first, defense institutions need dedicated people who are smart on the issues, smart on navigating the organizations they work for, uh, and serve as internal allies to civil society actors. You know, when I first started working on women, peace, and security for the military, um, I felt confident about my ability on, um, or my knowledge on gender and security. But what I realized is that knowing where to insert that knowledge into the bureaucratic processes that drive the organization is another important skill needed among those of us who work inside these institutions. And so for civil society actors, I think it's helpful to leverage these internal allies who work to understand the processes that drive the organizational change. I think this is absolutely key, this relationship between these two. Uh, my second point is on policy. Uh, establishing policy for an organization that tells uh, it what something is and what the organization must do is absolutely necessary. I can't overstate this. Putting words on paper matters for these large institutions. And yes, I know that drafting policy and getting it published may be painstakingly slow. It also might be a little boring. Um, and I know this is sometimes difficult because organizational change is hard for defense institutions in particular. But you know, the example I always come back to is that because of my age, I will only ever know a NATO that has a women, peace and security policy. And that's because the policy was published before I graduated from university and entered the professional workforce. So I've always worked with a NATO that knew its position on women, peace and security. And with this in mind, I often remind myself that sometimes we don't write policy for the people currently in the organization. Yes, it does help them too. But establishing policy is particularly important for those who inherit the organization, so the next generation, because it gives this generation a starting point to continue advancing that cause. And then the final point, and I want to emphasize this, is that policy and paper is only as good as it's implemented. And that's where I think resources are certainly needed. If we want defense institutions to actually implement these important considerations for security, the organizations must fund it. And this is where I think the role of um, national governments gets involved. They can earmark dedicated funding to their defense institution for these issues. And defense institutions can also request funding from their governments for them. So these resources then in turn can be used to hire those dedicated staff to help implement the policy in the various ways described. And I know this is constantly the most difficult part because we're always in environments of competing resources, but I do really think that the critical, it's, it's a key critical step if defense institutions are truly serious about incorporating unique and different perspectives into how they operate, they must be resourced to do so. So in sum, thank you. dedicate people, establish policy, and secure resources. Uh, thank you for your time. I'm happy to participate in the, the question and answer well, session. Thank, thank you for raising these important issues, and I hope we can come back to them as well in the discussion that will follow. I would like to invite Shiran to share some of her work, which we already uh, saw a little mm -hmm. bit of at the very beginning. How are you using technology? What is it that you do? And how do you empower women and girls by using technology? Would you like to share with us? Sure. Thank you, Daria. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to see you all, all these young faces here. Uh, so I would like to share how we use AI technology and media to create social impact and even give you some inspiration to do it yourself or within your organization. Um, a warning trigger, I'm going to talk about domestic violence. It's a bit hard goal, hard goal content. Um, so in the video that you saw, I want you to, to meet Michal Sela. Michal Sela her story is one of the most important and fascinating stories in Israel. Michal got everything for her life. She was 32 years old. She, was, she came from a loving family. 
She was very smart, full of joy. She had a lot of friends. She was a qualified social worker. She lived in a nice village near Jerusalem. She was married and had a, a baby daughter. She lived her life like she was a colorful flying butterfly. However, two and a half years ago, her husband stabbed her to death in front of her young baby. For her family and close friends, was, it was completely shocked. It seems like it came from nowhere. And I, I know it, it's difficult, but this is exactly one to create in our video. We want to take people out of the comfort zone. We want them to look in those women in the eye and listen to the children's story. And this is how we triggered and create uh, emotional reaction. And this is why this campaign was very effective. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. We have another um, speaker here who has uh, set up a campaign to empower women and girls. And I'd like to invite you, Miriam, to also share you know, what inspired you and how did you organize your campaign to achieve more girls and women to be empowered and to feel strong in our world. Thank you so much, and I'm sorry I cannot be with you in person today, uh, but let me frame a little bit wh where we see this debate from inspiring girls, and perhaps to say that out of the, the whole uh, range of issues that we are discussing today, what we focus on is, is women, and women in peace and, and security, so I will um, talk particularly <laughs> about that. Um, but from where I see it, the issue is that when it comes to security and to peace, women tend to suffer disproportionately when there isn't peace and security. And crucially, that is not given the priority that it should be given. So that, that is, to me, the core, of the, um, the core of the problem. And we can see it in many different examples. I always, because I'm somebody who, in my the other side of my life, I do um, international trade. Uh, I tend to focus on something that is a key instrument of foreign policy, which is sanctions. You would see lots of countries, and sanctions are very fashionable now, you will see lots of countries taking sanctions for imposing sanctions for lots of different reasons. Pretty much no country, including all the NATO countries, imposes sanctions because of systematic, persistent, systemic violations of the right of women that are human rights. So you could find, like those examples, many others. NATO is doing an enormous amount of wonderful work in this area, but we are still quite far away. To us, the question is, why is that happening? And we think that one of the reasons why those um, aspects are not given the priority that they should be given it is that we do not have enough women in positions of leadership raising those priorities and ensuring that they are put in the focus of everybody. And that is very clear when we come to uh, women in positions of uh, leadership and the amount of women altogether, not even in positions of leadership, in the military, whether it is in politics and the political bodies that are taking the decisions. And that is only a reflection of what happens in society, that in some sectors there are many more women, but when you go higher up, mm -hmm. uh, you tend to lose them. And that is the area where we try to, to work. You know, If you look at the ranges of women in the military, for example, in NATO in different countries, kind of from 0 0.3 to 20, 20 something percent, well, we are 50% in society. So obviously we have an issue in that respect. How do we change that? And that is where we work. We think that you can change that with the power of role models, making sure that we break the stereotypes and this, the defense area and the security area is one of the areas where you find most stereotypes. It is not only because there may be legislation in some country that prevents women from having those roles. It is that even in countries where you don't have those obstacles, you do not get enough women because it is perceived that that is an area of men, that men protect and that women are protected, that 
patriotism, that nobility, that courage is a value of men and that runs very deeply in many societies. And I should say that those of you who think that that is only happening in the past, it is happening now where I am based, for example, right now in the US, there is a whole debate on reclaiming masculinity and those values as masculine values. So what we do in Inspiring Girls is to try to put together women, women who are already in those roles, with girls so that they can tell them about their story, they can inspire them, they can answer any questions they have, they can show them all together the different roles that women have. And I can assure you, I have spent eight and a half years working very intensely in this area. Many girls have no idea of the different roles that you have in this area, what you could be doing. You know, they tend to think about the military in a very stereotype manner again. They don't know anything about the roles on data, on research, on space, on cybersecurity, on intelligence. So we show all yeah. that to them. It's very much like the interview that you have seen between Gina and Thea, but obviously with, with much more um much more time to be able to get yes. deeper into the yes. issues. We do it in 28 countries and we do it through a variety of means. So we send women back to schools, we do it uh, in social media, we do it virtually. And one of those campaigns was the Little Girl Is Me campaign. Yes. It was super Thank successful you. and yeah. we would be delighted to do more of that. Thank you so much, yes, uh, for sharing this. I was uh, also inspired by your campaign, which I saw on social media a while back. Yes, uh, I see there are already some questions coming in from on my iPad here, and I wonder if there are questions in the audience here. Before I open the floor, I would like to give the opportunity to uh, you to whether if you have a question for each other. Anything that you want to ask, anything that you would like, uh, or something that came up while the others were sharing and speaking. The floor is yours. I think I will just give the opportunity for people to ask uh, questions if there are. But uh, just uh, a small point. How do you all feel the fact that the, we have very little diversity right here at this very panel? How do we feel about that? I think this is an interesting point, what you're saying, because this is a panel we are talking about women, for women, and there is no men here. So I think this is a very interesting point we should address in the next panel as well. Would you like to comment? For me, it's, it's very interesting. I was sharing this, you know, uh, I, as I said, I came into my new role uh, only Less, uh, three months ago, and I'm still in between my previous life and my new one. So in this situation where I see diversity and many topics coming in, I would like to have a very long conversation because you see the diversity of the topics, but then you can see this fil rouge that where we know that there are all the, the same challenges, just you know that uh, you have to address them with uh, tailor-made solutions, but the problems are the same. But at the same time, also for me, it's where uh, now is the, the role where what the, the role that NATO brings, how we address this agenda, and how important it is that this agenda is to take into consideration. And the alliance is doing this, uh, uh, investing a lot. So I was glad to hear about mentioning the policies because sometimes it's the frustration between. Uh, the need to have the policies and then not to see enough implementation. We are all gone throughout this, you know. But this is where we have to start, the conversation about mm -hmm. the language to frame this. And then what is important is that uh, we don't stop there, that the organization doesn't stop by taking the box and say, oh, yes, now this is done. No, this yes. is just the beginning. But it's an yeah. important beginning because if we don't frame the work, and then also that's, that's a starting point, and we can build on that. As I said, I was here 10 years ago, and I can say that a lot of progress has been done by the alliance and of course at the global level as well is a trend you know we see the uh, the agenda moving forward not enough we are know that we complain that is not um, quick enough yeah. but it, it's happening and now to the uh, meetings like this summit it's important for me because this is for me uh, another turning point this is why, why, uh, where I see how the uh, agenda and also NATO's commitment to this agenda can evolve again, 
Women, peace, and security, important to keep the focus on women. This was just a shared the need to have more women in leadership position and everywhere. I mean, that's the mm -hmm. key message, uh, of course. And um, if I, yes, if I may come in, because I have some questions on this exactly. Oh, okay. So I want to come in. Um, there is the question indeed of whether, you know, the focus on women and security, and there is a question here on how is NATO tackling intersectional discrimination, and another question also, uh, a person wondering, you know, how can NATO help specifically to protect and include LGBTQ plus folks in countries that limit their freedoms? So it is about expanding the definition of uh, what NATO is doing. If you sure. Um, you know, we are an alliance of 30 right now, uh, allies with diverse culture and diverse, uh, uh, I mean, it's everywhere. So. The, the alliance work by consensus. So when we adopt a policy, it's the policy with the language and the ideas that the third allies, and in the case of women, peace, and security, it's plus a number of partners, choose to, uh, um, I mean, where there is consensus of what we want to do. And the way, uh, and this, the, our policies is to how uh, women, peace, and security in gender perspective can support uh, NATO when we are mostly in, uh, in operation in our collective defense and cooperative uh, uh, security. How we do address this is, is in uh, uh, the diversity of men and, women, men and women in a diverse perspective. When it comes to intersectionality or LGBTQI, this is not part of our policy as part of the women, peace and security policy and how this is implemented by the Alliance, but those are policy and work that the Alliance uh, at NATO and the Secretariat I do in, re in respect of the diversity, so there are the group of the staff working and addressing this as part of the uh, diverse gender and diversity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. offices, uh, uh, which is separate from the portfolio I am uh, following. Yeah, thank you. Are there any questions in the audience? Yes, please. I see one and then, yeah. <laughs> you are too high, Sofia. Hi, everyone. My name is Sofia. I'm Ukrainian and I work as an independent consultant and I focus on women, peace and security and feminist foreign policy agenda. And my question is related to the question I have been asking myself for the past two months, is how do we ensure that what is happening in Ukraine right now and the whole issue of militarization of NATO allies still keeps on the agenda the values we have related to women, peace and security agenda, the human security. And I'm sure that some of the participants here have the same question of, with a lot of, yeah, with, with the rising priority of militarization and arms control, how do we keep the human security question at the table? Thank you so much. I would like to open the floor and I also know um, that Samina, you've been working on human security as well, uh, but anyone who would like to comment? I mean, I think that the example that I will be using is not uh, a very successful one because it is about the, the situation in Afghanistan that is completely forgotten uh, these days. Um, I have not read much about in the news what's happening in the country right now. But basically, NATO was in Afghanistan for almost 20 years, and they were great achievements. And one of the areas that um, the uh, allies managed to actually do incredible work is in the field of empowering uh, or creating the situation for Afghan women to empower themselves. Um, and, and I think for, for a lot of Afghan women, the, the future right now is very unknown. Um, and I don't know what um, the international community is doing to, to keep some of those gains uh, alive. And, and I really hope that the faith of Ukraine uh, is not the same. Uh, because I think that as an alliance, when we engage with, with countries uh, and we achieve um, incredible things, we also have to ensure, um, as individual nations, but also as an institution, that we continue uh, to work on uh, maintaining some of those gains. Thank you so much. I have uh, another question here, and then I haven't forgotten about you. Yes, I will go uh, to this one. How does gender and sexual inequality within our institutions undermine an effective and cohesive security response? Anyone would like to 
address this question. I wonder if there is um, if there's any data on this actually. Uh, uh, you have been working also on human de security and data collection, so I'm wondering, sex disaggregated data in the context of peace and security, are we using them already enough? Is that something that could perhaps help to ta tackle inequalities? That's an important point, and we are using them, but not enough, for sure. So we are also, uh, I think it's not, it's not become an, an automaton yet. So there is a need to do with, this is something we are working on in, within NATO, and we work with, across the alliance with our colleagues uh, so to ensure that the data we, we collect are um, disaggregated. Uh, but is it for the gender inclusive uh, conflict analysis, th this is absolutely necessary. But this is a problem everywhere, not only related to conflict, the lack of uh, um, sex and mm -hmm. gender disaggregated data, but yes. then, then gender yeah. is not the only issue, the yeah. race, ethnicity, age, you know. When we talk about this, we cannot say women, one woman represent the entire women, the diversity. We, we know among us, this, it's very important, so it's... Uh, when we talk about having women participation at the peace negotiation table, it's just not that you take one woman as a token and you <laughs> invite her, her to sit at the table because she cannot be the voice uh, and represent uh, mm -hmm. the entire world, feminine yeah. world. Uh, of course, I mean, she could if after like uh, agreement and negotiation, but so diversity is extremely important. And data are uh, as much important as policies. I think they are part of this framework we need to develop in order to uh, provide a solid basis for our work. Yeah, thank you. And yes. I'm happy to, to, to build on that because um, I think the question of data is incredibly crucial. Um, and, and I think what data actually does is that it gives us a very neutral picture of uh, where is it that we have pain points. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes some of these pain points can be in ways that we can address them in a systematic way. Because right now, the, the question of inclusion and diversity is not a gendered war. It is, um, you know, we have errors in systems and processes. And what are the, the errors and, and where are uh, these errors occurring? And I think data can give us a much uh, better picture of what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to continue to measure whether it is at NATO or whether it is at NATO operations abroad or any other institutions to continue measuring to see how far have we uh, how close are we to our goals? How far have we come? And what needs to change? Thank you. Yes. Perhaps, perhaps I can add a yeah. little thing. Yes. Um, then. Uh, to, to me, the only point to, to add to that is that data, of course, is crucial because there is a big risk in this area that there is a lot of action, but that not all that action moves the dial. So that, that is the key question that we need to keep asking ourselves. All the seminars, all the research, everything that we are doing, does it move the dial? And if it doesn't, what are we going to do differently? Mm -hmm. And we suffer from having a lot of activity sometimes in this area that okay. does not really lead to any results. So we can only see that with data. Thank you. Yes. Yes, so... Um... Wait. Okay. I'm going to leave it here. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, for being here. It's amazing to see all these amazing women and learn from you all. Uh, my question comes from a perspective I have. So I'm the general manager of Bucharest Model NATO's ninth edition, which is a NATO simulations for, teenager, uh, for teenagers in the world. Now, you talked about the importance of, ha of having women in leadership, and I want to ask you, uh, what is an important quality, or maybe the most important quality, a woman should, ha should have when she's in a leadership position, especially in a NATO setting or in a security setting? Thank you. It's me? <laughs> Any, well, anyone. <laughs> I would say it's also in general. I think mm -hmm. it could also be. Yeah, it, it is general, yes. I mean, I'm happy to answer that because I don't think that it is specific qualities that women, men, or other genders need to have in order to be good leaders. 
Uh, I think at the end of the day, it's about creating situations where you have equal opportunities for, for everybody. Um, and I say this because uh, in Afghanistan, I worked with female social entrepreneurs. And sometimes I felt that these women in Afghanistan were taking responsibility for the planet, for the people that we all have. Uh, and so at the end of the day, I think that regardless of your gender identity, um, it's all about uh, access to resources. Um, and I think once you have access to resources, then there's so many different types and forms and ways you can be a leader. Mm -hmm. And if I can add, so I think from my perspective, it's, it's important for women to be aware of, of the existing bias. Because sometimes we are not behave the same uh, as men are doing, and we maybe feel not comfortable with that. And it's good to be true to yourself. Just bring your quality to the table and be aware that, they are, that your quality is good enough. So you don't have to behave like a man. You don't have to argue and fight and be winning all the time with all argument. Um, but you have your own way, and this is what you can bring to the table, and I think it's valuable, and this is the power of diversity and inclusion. We should, there should be enough room for everyone. Can I add two fingers to that, if I may? Um, I, I do think about this constantly because I would like to be in a leadership role at some point in time in uh, my future career, so I, I do think constantly about sort of what are these traits that I see in leadership that I want to emulate and kind of copy and repeat, and which ones would I rather just leave behind? Um, and I know that leadership as a woman is, is on, it, it's inherently gendered. Leadership is inherently gendered. Maybe we should just get that out on the table. Um, and I'm really looking forward to maybe the next generation of rising um, women um, and, and people of different identity groups coming and redefining what leadership does look like. Um, because I think we have these historical models that are traditionally white, traditionally male, traditionally um, hetero. Uh, and I, I think that's, that really does shape sort of what sort of values, behaviors, and things that they do. And so things that I recognize that I truly want to emulate um, are, are, are taking care of the people that I oversee as a leader. I think this is one thing of, um, that maybe the Undersecretary uh, of the Air Force emphasizes being kind and taking care of people. Um, and there's a way to do that while still, you know, sort of maintaining the, the sort of leadership role that you have and being looked up to as a leader, but, you know, maintaining this idea of, um, like, transparency, openness, um, providing clear guidance to your people, um, asking clarifying questions and admitting maybe when you don't know the answer or you don't have the answer. Um, and then I think also, you know, trusting the subject matter expertise of the people on your team, because as a leader, you can't possibly be expected to know everything, or at least I hope you're not expected to know everything. And so I think it's particularly important to look across your team, like know how it's being composed, know what different um, subject matter expertises are being brought to bear by those different people, um, and knowing how to lift up their voices when they can really contribute to the mission that you're overseeing. If I, if I may add to, to that, and perhaps just to keep the debate uh, going, because I'm one of those who believes that there is not a female way to do leadership that is different to the male way to do leadership, and that everything is, is related to the individual. And, and to me, the two characteristics that are, are crucial in leaders, no matter in which area, but also included on defense and, and security, is understanding risk and knowing how to deal with risk. And, and then perseverance. It takes a long time and you need to keep there uh, trying. But the, the point that I wanted to make is that in this area, the issue is not only about having more women in leadership. It is about having more women, period at all the different levels. And if you look at all the different meetings, the summit, for example, where it is very striking how many more men than women are. If you look at the second, third, fourth roles, there are still many more women than, uh, many more men than, than women. So it really goes at all levels. And we certainly in Inspiring Girls try to work not just with very successful women who are at the very top of the range, but in all the different levels, including those who are starting. Thank you. If I may I, just yeah. to conclude, I think that's a very interesting debate that we are always having. Is it's a question of representation and numbers because we want to have women because we have the half of the society or because we want women because we bring a different perspective as women and a different leadership style. I am from that 
team because I think that female leadership is different. Of course, there is the individual uh, mm. elements and specificity that can aim. Not all women have the same style. Maybe their style sometimes is not good, but this is, that's the individual part. But generally speaking, and based on my experiences, yeah, yes, I can say that based on my experience, there is a difference. Uh, and we could see this also in some how COVID crisis was managed different by female leaders and how the task force in some countries and, uh, were only ma male dominated or exclusively male, they didn't address some of the issues that women needed. So, and I suppose that having a female leader managing it would have had led to a different uh, approach. So by, based on my experience, I mean, I uh, share some of the, many of the points that were made uh, before the, the listening, caring, but keeping this balance that mm -hmm. it's, it's listening and caring about the others, but being a strong model at the same time and not being afraid to be uh, more empathic and to care about the people and to bring this institutional cultural change. Institutions were made by men, but that, that's part of the history. We recognize that things are changing. And if we want to be part of this change, we have to recognize this as well. Society, families, our composition are different. So I give an example, the Italian people must know this. We have an astronaut, a female astronaut, that left yesterday to go Samantha Cristoforetti back in the space, and she has two children. And in one TV show very recently asked, oh, you have two children, who will take care of the children? You are living for six months. Their father, I mean, it's a fact, I mean, they, she doesn't abandon the, the children in the middle of the streets. We are, now it's different, women work, in the same way men work, so if one of the parents lives, the other stay home. Look at the military, this is the same. If we want to enable f women to be in the military, we need to enable the family, you know, mm -hmm. structure and the wealth to support both parents. Yeah. Yeah. So women think in this way and approach the, the dynamics and the problem in an holistic and inclusive way. Men do it less, and this is why you have special representative, because we still need to address this as a special issue, and it shouldn't be the case. Yeah. Thank that you. is a great, yes, thank you. I, um, I would like to invite, we're coming to the close already. <laughs> we could have continued for hours and days, probably, on this topic. So thank you very much. But I want to give everyone the opportunity to, to share something as a closing reflection, a closing word, um, and perhaps even since we are at the Youth Summit, if you could give your younger self a piece of advice, what would it be? So I think for, for, for me, um, uh, just going back to the question about data, um, 267 uh, is the number uh, of years it will take for uh, men and women to come closer in terms of economic opportunity. So 267 years. Um, and I was looking at this data and I was trying to like figure out how far have we come since I have been on this planet. I am 30. And the last 30 years, uh, women's income have only increased by 5%. And that progress is is just insane to me. It's very, very slow if you compare it to progress in so many other areas such as technology. Um, so I wish I could tell my younger self that the, the topic that I was working on would not be relevant, but it's still very relevant today, and I think it will be relevant for another 30 years. Thank you. And so I... Um, the others, yes, and yes. we have to keep it short. Yeah, yeah. If I, you I will can. keep it short, yes. and uh, also I want to go back to your comment for my conclusion. You said about that we are not diverse panel, and it's came pumped into my head, and, and I really think data is important, and having the session of uh, only for women, it's, it's a good starting point, but I think we should be much farther than that, like we are in the second stage. And also related to the campaigns that we made, what was so unique in it that it was campaign from domestic violence, but however, because of our unique approach and how we use the technology. So we also engaged men. We were 
almost 50% of men visited in our website, and a third of the viewer were men. And if we want to really create a change, so we need to bring both gender together. This is the only way we create a real change. And to the younger me, so believe in yourself. There is a will, so there's going to be a way. And, and, and keep this in mind for along the way. Thank you. Yes. I would like to build on what you said uh, on the NATO perspective. I mean, what you mentioned, working with men, that's for me, it's very important. And this is why it's important to engage with uh, you today. Because as part of my mandate in these uh, coming years, I would like to work more on the youth peace and security agenda, which is a complementary agenda to the women peace and security based on resolution 2250. And it was adopted in 2015, so 15 years later, 1325. So for me, it also represents a different perspective where the focus on women can be integrated with a focus of both young women and young men working together for peace and security. Thank so you. I would be very happy to see that. And to the young men, you just pick mine, you know, believe in yourself <laughs> and in your uh, dream and exit your comfort zone. And that's, right. I think, it, 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 yeah. it's very important mm -hmm. because sometimes, you know, you can see things from a different uh, uh, perspective and find that the solution is right there. Thank you. And just two very short comments from our guests online. Yes. I'll okay. jump in and go. Oh, go ahead, Miriam. Go ahead, Miriam. Uh, to me, the, the main message really is for young people to understand how powerful their voice is in this area, not just for young women, but also for young men. They have changed the debate in other areas, like the environment. I think that if they put their voice in this area, we can make the change that we are missing them. And the advice to my younger self could be undertake more risks. I think that many uh, girls are brought up with fear of failure. We see that in the analysis. Uh, and we all have to understand that we cannot succeed, succeed if we don't fail. Thank you. Yes, Corey, you have the last word. The final quick comment. Thank you for giving it to me, a true honor. Um, so I, two points. I would offer that, you know, to really talk about gender is to talk about intersectionality. It must be intersectional when we talk about gender. It cannot be binary. It should and include things like race, ethnicity, religion, sexual identity, orientation, expression. These things are what it truly means to sort of holistically talk about gender um, and then looking at it from a conflict scenario. So I wanted to make sure that point was come across because I think that's particularly important when we start to look into the conflicts of the future. And the second yes. point, you know, things that I tell my younger self, I work on a team of 20 and 30 year olds and we always look across, you know, our cubicles and say, go boldly. You know, we, we encourage each other to take those risks, to take chances, not to self edit and to really show up who you are in the workspace because I think that is what really forces institutions to accept the fact that there's a new rising generation of people coming into their institutions who want it to look differently um, and potentially account for um, a more comprehensive look at security and what it does. So I'll leave with that. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you. It was a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you all so much. So inspiring. I'm glad we have a short break coming up after this because I think there's uh, so much to process from this panel and I'm really looking forward to have a chance to discuss with all of you. So for those of you who are in the room here, please feel free to grab a coffee and you can go outside using these back doors over here. Uh, and everyone on home, stick with, with us. We'll be back in about 10 minutes at 12 p.m. Eastern time and 6 p.m. CET. See you soon.
All right, everyone. Welcome back to the 2022 NATO Youth Summit, Securing Our Shared Future. I am your host, Lauren Speranza from SIPA. Uh, we have had a fantastic program so far, but I would venture to say that we're heading into my favorite part, where we're going to hear from even more youth voices than we already have. And to kick us off, we're going to start with someone who is the best advocate for the next generation of allied leaders. She is the original hashtag NATO nerd, if you can believe it. And uh, you may know her as the US ambassador to NATO, the Honorable Julianne Smith, who is going to share a special message with all of us. Let me start by congratulating SIPA and the NATO Public Diplomacy Division for organizing this second youth summit. This is such an important gathering, and I regret that I can't join you in person today. I'd much rather be with all of you there in the actual venue, but sadly, by the time this summit takes place, I'll actually be out of town. But I did want to say a few words about how important this particular gathering is, especially right now. I think it's absolutely critical that NATO finds ways to engage younger people about the importance of this alliance and to answer their questions uh, about what NATO does and why it's still important today. We've looked at recent polls and we've discovered some troubling things about the younger generation. We're discovering that those between the ages of 18 and 35 actually seem to have less interest in national security more broadly. They seem to be perhaps less informed about the NATO alliance, less attached to its history, which is understandable. And we've also seen in some other polls that the younger generation isn't that interested in the nitty gritty details of US national security and foreign policy. But here's what we do know. We know that the next generation, that the people represented at this particular summit care deeply about issues like climate change, that they care deeply about human rights, that they care deeply about global poverty. And the important thing is that all of those issues actually tie to the security issues that we tackle each and every day here at NATO headquarters. NATO was created many, many decades ago in the face of the end of World War II, and the emphasis then was on security. Security so that the economies in Europe and in North America could prosper. And NATO's been very successful in providing and ensuring that security. And as a result, we've seen what can come when democratic allies join forces to tackle common challenges. So after all of the progress that the Alliance has made over 70 plus years, the Alliance is now focused on new challenges. First and foremost, we're coming together in this moment to work with other democratic allies to provide Ukraine with the support that it needs in this moment. And we're also coming together as a transatlantic family to apply unprecedented levels of pressure on Moscow to get them to stop this unprovoked, unmitigated war. And we're turning our attention to future challenges here at the NATO Alliance. We're looking at challenges like cybersecurity, emerging and disruptive technologies. We're looking at space as a new domain. And we're also looking at climate change, because climate change is a national security concern. When we see regional conflicts and instability, we can take a closer look and often find that climate change can lead to these types of regional conflicts and breed instability. And for that reason, here at NATO headquarters, we are taking on climate change as a national security issue. So NATO is evolving and changing all the time, but we can't do it without the people in this room at this event right now. We need you to be engaged in this alliance. We need 
need you to care about the values that we're protecting. We need you because you bring the innovation, you bring the know-how in tackling things like climate change or global poverty or addressing human rights concerns. You also bring exposure and ideas to technology in ways that my generation never will. So thank you for taking the time to join this summit right now in this moment. Thank you for asking the hard questions and thank you for your interest in what NATO does. And I hope that at some point in the near future, we can actually have this conversation in person. So again, I salute I salute the efforts of, of those at SEPA. I salute my colleagues in the NATO Public Diplomacy Division and wish you a, a wonderful couple days at NATO headquarters. So wonderful to hear from Ambassador Smith. And after that very fitting intro, we are going to move into our next session, which is our policy pitching competition. We get to hear from all of you. So SIPA and NATO, in the run-up to the summit, ran a policy pitching competition that basically asked contestants to pick a policy challenge that they thought NATO ought to be paying more attention to. They had to articulate that challenge and then make a concrete policy recommendation or an action that NATO needs to take to address it. We had more more than 100 entries, uh, more than 40 different countries represented, and we had a panel of experts choose the top three based on their originality and their feasibility and also the explanation of the subject matter. So we'll now have an opportunity to hear each of our top winners pitch their ideas, and then we have an excellent panel of experts who will help us unpack some of the ideas that they raised and react to their pitches. So over to our winners. everyone attending in person in Brussels. My name is Katarina Kiritisova. I'm a policy fellow at the European Leadership Network and a Wilson Center Global Fellow. I was happy to learn that my pitch was selected and very much look forward to your feedback. At the Brussels summit last year, members of the Alliance agreed to work towards reducing their military missions. The outbreak of the war, additional defense spending, and the provision of fuel, weapons, and ammunition to Ukraine all of which are necessary, might affect NATO's military missions reduction plans. Yet, the very same week that Russian tanks started rolling into Ukraine, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released its latest report, which gave the bleakest warning yet of the climate change impacts and the time we have left to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees. So despite the war, climate change is not going to go away. With fuel supply infrastructure being attacked in Ukraine, the war has also shown that dependence on fossil fuels is a big vulnerability for our militaries. So moving away from fossil fuels makes sense, not just from a climate point of view, but also for our military survivability. NATO needs to step up its efforts in this regard. How? It could shift away from single fuel policy towards more sustainable alternatives. It could develop green minimum capability requirements for each ally to meet. It can update existing policies and standardization agreements, and also rethink what counts as a defense contribution. As allies invest more in defense, and before the contracts have been written, we need to think carefully about what capabilities we need, and make sure that these additional budgets are also used for innovation and development of green equipment. In Madrid, there should be a clear political signals that we are going back to collective defense, but we are also going to stay the course, stick to our ambition to reduce military emissions, and keep our focus on the effects of climate change, which will make future conflicts more likely. Thank you. My name is Rezvan Folcha, and I'm a student at the Babish Boy University of Cluj-Napoca, Romania. I'm working as an advisor to a member of the Romanian parliament, and I'm a former UN Youth Delegate of Romania. My policy proposal focuses on the vital need to involve youth, a generation of resilience in decision-making processes on security and resilience issues. In this sense, NATO can implement some of the following directions. Appointing NATO youth delegates for the member states, creating the role of a NATO youth envoy, uh, hubs for youth ideas, financing youth-led projects dedicated to uh, shaping solutions for massive challenges. Creating a scholarship for young people wanting to implement 
projects inside of NATO in order to empower the organization. A permanent consultative bodies for young people and constant youth resolutions and policies. Young people have proven to be an invaluable resource in addressing and facing uh, the massive challenges that we're uh, tackling right now in the present. NATO has a strong role in empowering them to be become actual stakeholders in all of these processes. Why don't we give them a chance to participate and to involve? Thank you so much. My name is Maria Luisa. I've just completed an advanced diplomacy program in Lisbon and my policy challenge pertains to WPS partnerships for NATO. As seen in Ukraine, the prevalence of women's rights violations plays a role in gender equality progress and the diffusion of WPS principles. Given that NATO is bound to Resolution 1325, the Alliance should expand its regional cooperation mechanisms to address a wider spectrum of gender inequalities, thus ensuring that WPS principles are fully implemented in the next decade. To do so, in the new strategic concept, the WPS agenda must be a cross-cutting uh, strategic pillar, and NATO should rethink its institutional partnerships with the EU and the UN, for instance, but also with civil society through a new, formal and resourceful WPS task force. This multilateral approach could benefit NATO through the development of a common language on WPS that reflects women's experiences and needs. It could promote exchanges on gender expertise, monitoring, transparency, accountability and funding tools. And it could allow NATO to look inwards and develop a broader and inclusive approach to WPS. Terrific. Congratulations to our winners, and thanks very much to all of them for sharing their ideas. Now we have a fantastic panel of experts to help us react to those ideas. Uh, are they good ideas? Are they realistic ideas? Uh, are they original ideas? Um, so first I will introduce uh, our panel, and then we'll go through and hear more. So we have the privilege of having with us Max Brooks, who is one of the foremost thinking minds on future challenges, future security challenges. He's the author of World War Z, uh, among many other things. Max, it's so great to have you with us. We also have Dr. Elizabeth Bra, who is the author of her latest book, God's Spies and the Defender's Dilemma, also one of the most creative thinking uh, minds in Washington and trying to propose uh, innovative solutions to today's challenges. On stage here, I am joined by Dr. Benedetta Berti Alberti, who is the head of policy planning in the office of the Secretary General here at NATO. And I also have Tanya Latic, who is Policy Officer for Security and Defense Policy at the European External Action Service. So thank you all so much. We have a really diverse group of voices here, different perspectives. So we had our three pitches, one on reducing NATO's military emissions, one on creating some kind of youth envoy to have more dedicated youth engagement at NATO, and the third on kind of institutionalizing the women, peace, and security agenda at NATO. So I'd like to start with just a lightning round from all four of you, like one to two minutes each, the top points from each of those. You can react to all three of them. You know, what did you like? What did you not like? What would never, ever happen in a million years? Um, and I'd love to hear from all of you. Max, let's start with you. All right, <clears throat> let's start with the, the first idea about uh, climate change and fossil fuels. And this has been a huge issue for the United States military going back to Iraq and Afghanistan. So I would encourage the author of this to look up Thomas L. Friedman's book, uh, where he talks about the Green Hawks. This is a unit within the United States military trying to get us off fossil fuels because it not only makes us dependent, it, straight, it weakens our supply lines, it stretches them and makes us more vulnerable to attack. So there already are allies waiting for these kinds of ideas. And I would encourage this author to find these allies within all existing militaries uh, because no general wants to be dependent on fossil fuels. And there could be a great alliance between the environmental movement and a smarter military. Right. As far as uh, a NATO scholarship, the second idea, great idea because scholarships are so important because they groom new talent for the future as far as long-term commitment. And the last one, 
the last idea about women's rights hits on the very core of the great struggle that is going to affect all of us. We'll be dead and gone, but the next generation will be grandchildren before this struggle is over. Democracy versus autocracy. We are in a struggle for human rights. In the West, in the Western democracies, it is all about having the right to exist as who you are versus these countries we are up against where you do not get to exist. And so there cannot be anything more important than a struggle for human rights and most importantly for values. If nothing else defines this great struggle of the next half century to a century, it will be a struggle for values. So well done. <laughs> Such an important point. Values has been one of our through lines today. Max, thank you so much for that. Okay, uh, Elizabeth Bra, I would love to come to you next. Uh, you've been thinking about how to think creatively on these issues. What did you think? I loved all three ideas. So let me start with uh, the first one about uh, fossil fuels. So that's, it, it's something that, that uh, the US armed forces, UK armed forces and, and others uh, are already thinking about. And why are they thinking about this? Because as, uh, as Max said, it's uh, the, the use of fossil fuels by our armed forces makes us uh, vulnerable. Um, and uh, I must say, uh, in addition to that, I think this, this war in Ukraine is demonstrating uh, so powerfully and, and quite painfully um, why it matters that the armed forces use fossil fuels because we, every time uh, 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 an oil depot is bombed that's that's uh, or struck by a missile that's a lot of co2 emissions going up in in, in the air uh, and uh, exacerbating our problem it's it's painful our, our, our climate change problem it's painful to watch every single time of course we want the ukrainians to win we want them to all be able to bomb as many russian oil depots as possible but nevertheless it's uh, co2 emissions uh, exacerbated every single time. So it's a fantastic uh, idea. I would encourage you to look at within your proposal how uh, armed forces and governments can work with industry uh, because without that cooperation, nothing much will happen, uh, which is why the, the progress has been so slow uh, to date. And, and also maybe look at what DARPA can do uh, to, to speed the process along by funding uh, innovative projects. Then the second idea, uh, NATO has obviously been concerned uh, for a long time about uh, how to work with, with youth and, and this, uh, this, this very event that, that we are at at the moment is, is, a, is a part of that effort to, to uh, reach more young people. So uh, I would encourage you to, to find a formalized process by which your youth assembly, which I, is an idea that I think is, is fantastic, how would that assembly feed into uh, feed it, uh, its ideas into NATO. So how do we make sure that it's not just an assembly that meets and then uh, and, and come up, comes up with lovely ideas and then everybody uh, goes home and that's it. There has to be some sort of dissemination of the ideas into uh, NATO, um, NATO HQ, NATO, uh, NATO parliaments, NATO governments. Uh, how would that work? And, and also how would these people be selected? We have to make sure that it's not just uh, a, a forum for, for uh, the NATO nerds out there, but for many others. Um, uh, and the third idea, uh, yes, nobody would be opposed to, to, um, to anything you propose, but again, what is the, the implementation? I think that's, that's uh, where the, the challenge is. It, 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 it stands in a long line of fantastic proposals, um, but uh, how, how, would, how would this, well, how, how would it go from from uh, being a, a sort of a, 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 a policy idea to to being uh, enacted by by the people uh, who are supposed to to uh, implement it? So yeah. uh, I guess the, the, the question for that, me that is, is more of a technical one. No, it's a really important point because I think implementation is always the hardest part. I think there's a lot of good ideas out there, but trying to get them into practice uh, is sometimes the hardest part. Um, now for another sobering perspective, I'm sure uh, our two representatives here who have their finger on the pulse inside NATO as well as the EU can offer some perspectives uh, about what they think. Benedetta, can we start with you? Sure, of course. And uh, I would start by saying that one of the things I like about this 
uh, three proposals is that they focus on three topics where n that are priorities to NATO. These are all areas where NATO is working. There's uh, on climate change, we have a strategy, we have an action plan, and I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit more in the rest of the conversation. So now just to focus on the conceptual framework of yeah. the idea, which I really liked, I think it's great that Katerina started from uh, highlighting this false dichotomy that sometimes we hear, whether it's yeah. Uh, you do more to increase your defense, you're going to have to relinquish other ambitions. So it's either climate climate actions versus defense. And that's not really the way, the way we see it. And I think that's a false dichotomy we really have to, uh, to question. There, especially when it comes to sustainable defenses, energy efficiency, there is a win-win space here. And it's a space in which we increase our operational effectiveness, we become more technologically advanced, more competitive, and at the same time, more environmentally friendly. And at the same time, we reduce our carbon footprint. So I think it's right, uh, it's right on the money to focus on minimizing energy dependency. That's also something NATO has been working on for, for many years. And I'm sure we'll have more time to return to the details of the proposals. But I do like that it combines two areas that are incredibly important to us as an alliance. Uh, I think the very same logic can be applied to our second proposals. Uh, this is one of the challenges challenges, I think, not just for NATO, but for each organization, but especially here. What we're doing here and now, we're deciding matters related to security and defense that affect everyone's lives. And sometimes the decision we're taking today will have the greatest impact on those that are in no position to influence them. Right. So there is this, uh, I think, more responsibility to, to an extent to be sure that those are, that are impacted, the future generations have a, an opportunity to express and to make their voice heard. And this is what today is all about. And it's also what we've been trying to do very actively at NATO. And just last year, we conducted this NATO 2030 process. And, it was, and that's how this NATO Youth Summit was born. And as part of that, we also, uh, the Secretary General was very keen to have youth uh, involved in providing recommendations, and it's actually great to have Tanya here because she's one of the young leaders we selected last year for this process, and uh, and and they provided fantastic uh, recommendation that really helped advance the NATO 2030. So yeah, spot on. And then on the integrating human peace and women peace and security into everything NATO does, I think that's that's absolutely the way we think about it. Uh, I will avoid the bureaucratic jargon of <laughs> saying we have to mainstream, but in reality, that's what we have to do. It has to become a reflex, not an add-on, but something that we consider from the get-go in developing policies and implementing them. And I would also say, and I'll stop here, that we are very much trying to do that, and we are also trying to do that when it comes to climate change considerations and human security at large. These are all issues that we need to integrate into our policy approach. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Tanya, over to you. My reaction to all of them is yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah, uh, honestly, to Katerina's proposal, I think, touching a bit on what Elizabeth said, I think there's an implicit question there. Are we able to walk and chew gum at the same time? Mm -hmm. Are we able to provide defense and deterrence while accelerating uh, our climate commitments? Yeah. And I think just this week, we have seen how um, our strategic dependencies are being weaponized. So I think there is an argument for why, yes, we have to walk and chew gum at the same time. And I think probably everyone in this room has the expectation from their governments, as well as the in different international organizations that we all represent here to do precisely that. And on, well, Katerina already mentioned the um, rethinking what a defense contribution is. I mean, mm -hmm. you know me, you've read the report. Thank <laughs> you for referencing it. I'm, I've always tried to make an argument for how defense is much bigger than the 2%. It's not a very yeah. popular argument, but I still think it's valid. And I think particularly when we discuss climate, that's it's very important to reassess what exactly counts as a contribution to our common defense. And I also think um, the, looking at EU-NATO cooperation and look, taking climate as a booster, if you will, for this topic, I think is, uh, is important because we do share uh, the same commitments here. And I think we all share the fact that, uh, or the ambition for, to accelerate them. Yeah. When it comes to um, Razvan's proposal, I think, again, we're not starting from scratch. I'm very glad that Benedetta already mentioned the NATO 2030 Young Leaders, and I also want to emphasize how diverse it was and how, you know, as Elizabeth, I think, said, it wasn't just NATO nerds. 
Yeah. It wasn't. So I think that diversity really added to, to the report very, very much. And I really like the idea of, um, of the youth assembly. And I think it sounds a bit like a youth wing of the NATO mm -hmm. PA. I mean, why not? So definitely, yes, NATO, do, uh, do take note. Um, on Maria Luisa, yes, again, of course, a very, very big uh, yes. I think th this idea, when I read your pitch of a transatlantic women, peace and security uh, task force or assembly, I think that that's very good because I do think advancing on the women, peace and security agenda is a direct deliverable of the transatlantic relationship, broadly speaking, whether it's EU NATO or EU US, I think that's a deliverable yeah. uh, concretely uh, un under that. So yeah, and shout Great. out to Maria Luisa for mentioning the strategic uh, compass in her pitch. <laughs> Yes, fantastic. Okay, thank you all so much. I want to come back to some of the details of these proposals and how we might make them happen in a second. But Max, I actually wanted to come back to you to zoom out for a second because you and I have had some conversations before uh, about kind of the need for good ideas and you've kind of yourself in your own work served as a bridge between the world of Hollywood and the creative community and the defense community and trying to uh, facilitate the exchange of new perspectives and new ways of thinking about things. Um, you know, some of your forward thinking in your novels and some of those things have helped inform how the military and institutions like NATO plan for future threats because it just offers a different perspective. And I think that's one of the challenges when it comes to, you know, taking making pitches like this and trying to put them into uh, the real debates that are happening inside an organization. So could you just reflect on that for a little bit about the need for those ideas and how you get them in the conversation? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I've always found that in the creative process, the problem is not finding good ideas. The ideas are there. The, the, the challenge is running those ideas past the department of no. And every organization has a department of no. And in that department of no, there are sub-departments. There's the department of fear, department of greed, department of arrogance, department of tribe. And they're, they're all different depending on which department you're up against. So the challenge when you have a good idea is identifying your specific department of no. And then you have to find the most important person on your team, which is a champion. Someone with the right skill set that can get your idea past that department of no. Like, let's go specifically to fossil fuel. All right. I can tell you the department of no is going to be a general or an admiral that's going to say, wait a minute, lives are at stake here. So I'm not going to sacrifice an ounce of combat performance in order to save the environment. I'm just not going to do that. So then you say, okay, I know a way around that. Don't focus on combat performance focused on logistics and support because the majority of all militaries is not combat units, it's support units. It's the trucks that get things from one place to another. It's the helicopters, it's the support aircraft that transport everything. Those can all be electrified and you wouldn't have to sacrifice anything. Uh, and then you would reduce the majority of fossil fuel dependence of military. So that's one example of getting past the department of no, leave the fighter planes, leave the tanks, let them burn whatever CO2 they have to. But when it comes to the logistics, let's focus on electrification. Interesting, thank you so much. Okay, I wanna encourage everyone just to keep their answers brief because I know we're already uh, on the clock here and I wanna give some opportunities for some of our audience here to chime in. Um, so maybe we could get a mic if it's possible from the production team here. Um, okay, super. So let me come back uh, to this idea of, uh, we talked a little bit about the climate proposal already. So I want to come back to this idea of uh, the youth uh, envoy and the idea of creating member delegates or some kind of youth assembly. Now, there's actually a lot of youth organizations. Some of them are sitting here in this room, YATA, Atlantic Forum, some others. Um, how could this idea be, uh, maybe solve a challenge at those organizations don't already tackle, or could it be complementary to that? Um, maybe, uh, Benedetta, you could just give a, a few seconds of response on that. Sure. Uh, 
happily, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still representative of those organizations in the audience, so it's, I'm very tempted to actually turn to them and say, how can we help yes, you? I know, that's why I want to Because they get are the doing fantastic work already. So I think that it's definitely not about creating new structure just for the sake, but it's, I think it would be working through the organizations that we have, uh, more funding, more resources, more uh, political uh, attention. There's a lot that we can do within, uh, within what we have, but I think that the, 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 the importance of the proposal is to put the emphasis on the fact that when we're making important policy decisions, we have to make sure we are representative of our society, and that means being diverse, being inclusive, and including youth. Then we'll find different forms to do it. But I think that's really the winning uh, proposition here. Yeah, I think that's very important. And sometimes we have a tendency of trying to create separate uh, platforms for youth, you know, and we risk the kind of kids' table versus actually integrating <laughs> youth uh, <laughs> sitting shoulder to shoulder, you know, exactly. put them inside yes. uh, the, the organization. Hire young more. people. Exactly. Mm. This, is why, this is why also at this forum, you know, we really tried to make an effort to have intergenerational panels, you know, young people sitting next to senior people and having that kind of dialogue. So um, such an important point. Um, Tanya, maybe as a, uh, I know you're offering the EU kind of perspective here, and uh, the Women, Peace, and Security agenda, I mean, not officially, sorry, not to put you on the spot, um, also need to but, uh, but the, the Women, Peace, and Security agenda, how much of this is kind of an EU set of issues versus a NATO set of issues, and who should actually be the one responsible for bringing that to life? Well, in general, I really try to advocate against using the versus there. Sure. It's an EU and NATO issue, I believe. And I think as international security providers, we both, both organizations have an equal responsibility. I mean, if we look at, I mentioned the strategic uh, compass, our latest EU security and defense strategy was just adopted. It has a very, very robust part on women, peace, and security, and how, not, how we don't only want to mainstream that when it comes to headquarters and in the EU institutions, but how we export that abroad in our own CSD what we call CSDP missions and operations. We have 18 of them. How we want to promote that even further and how we put that into practice, how we set higher standards in doing that. And again, I really think that as international security providers at home and abroad, the EU and NATO have a shared responsibility to do that and to do that together. Yeah, very important point. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Elizabeth, maybe I could come back to you on some of the climate issues because we have a question coming in here uh, from the app that is related to energy and environmental issues and kind of how energy has almost become a weapon of uh, hybrid warfare. And I know you've spent a lot of time thinking about this. I mean, we just see this in the headlines this morning, you know, Russia cutting off gas supplies to Bulgaria and Poland. Um, so as we think about what NATO is doing on uh, climate, you know, it's not just about reducing military emissions, although that's a really important point. It's also about countering uh, how resources are being used as a weapon. So what are some of your thoughts on how the alliance uh, can counter those issues? Uh, yes, it is about how much uh, energy we use and, 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 and all sorts of finite resources. And so this is where actually where the energy proposal, um, where the energy side meets the, the youth side, uh, of, of, of your uh, winning uh, ideas here, because uh, I think actually if we were, uh, if we look at, if, if NATO uh, were to issue an open call to, to young people to, to uh, submit proposals, you would get a lot of proposals from people who have, from young people who have no experience with NATO, maybe not that much interest in national security, but who feel passionate about the environment and who, who would maybe feel, uh, feed completely unexpected ideas into your process uh, by, for example, being elected on, on the basis of such proposals, being elected to the, to the youth assembly that, that, uh, that was just proposed. So, so, um, so I think uh, it's, uh, this is where, this is where uh, we have a, a potential win-win. I'm not trying to suggest that the Greta will solve NATO's problems, but nevertheless, if I, that sort of mindset where, where we are set out to solve uh, climate change can also help NATO. And we should remember that it's not just about reducing, uh, uh, as you said, Lauren, about reducing the, the resources that our armed forces use. It's about reducing the finite resources that we all use. So, for example, it, it, 
uh, the, the people in the room and, and Max and I, would we be willing to, uh, to turn off uh, power, uh, energy, uh, internet for, for one hour a day to help reduce our country's dependence on, on fossil fuels? And uh, it's not just, as, as we see this week, it's not just a matter of an abstract consideration. We have all done Earth Hour. I hope we have all done Earth Hour and turned off uh, our lights for, for one hour a day every 23rd of, of April. But it's, it's, it's a practical problem. If we keep consuming make more energy we will have more and, and if we don't develop renewables we will have this uh, incredible dependence on other countries whether it's Russia whether it's Saudi Arabia whether it's another country so so maybe um, well I hope those two first ideas can be combined and I think I, I'm willing to bet and, and, and come back next year and be proven right or possibly wrong but I'm willing to bet that if you were to open an uh, issue an open call to young people in, in different countries who are not involved in national security just anybody to to propose ideas for a youth assembly, you'd get uh, incredibly innovative ideas. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, I have about five minutes left. This session is flying, but I love it because we're having a really good back and forth. Um, I'm going to try and squeeze one more question out of each of you if I can. Uh, so Max, let me come to you because uh, in thinking about how to implement these ideas, how much do you think uh, depends on public opinion. You know, sometimes it's not just the matter of the will of a leader to implement some of these good ideas that their staff or whoever might be proposing, uh, but they are beholden to elections, to public opinion, to those types of things. So could you comment on that a little bit? Yes. Uh, one of the reasons that we won the Second World War was because in the West, we had two armies. We had the army that fights, and then we also had the army that communicates with the public, with the voter and the taxpayer. And we don't have that army anymore. We've seen this divorce for the last 50 years. It's been growing between the population and those who protect them. And now they're almost completely divorced. And we need to get back together. We need to have a new army of communicators, people who can take these big, crazy, broad, complicated ideas and break them down to the average voter, particularly the average young voter, and say, listen, this is why this matters to you. There used to be a whole newsreel in World War II called Why We Fight. We need to bring that back and rename it Why We Care. Hmm. Really important point. I think we'll talk a little bit more about that in our next session. Uh, but thanks so much, Max. Um, Tanya, maybe I can give you a spin of that question, which is, I think, another big part of how we implement these ideas is actually having leaders in multinational organizations agree on these types of things. And uh, right now, you know, I think in the past few weeks with the war in Ukraine, we've seen a remarkable amount of unity. But, uh, you know, so whether in the future, if we're going to implement some of these proposals on youth engagement or climate or uh, WPS agenda, you know, how long uh, can we keep up this unity? Is it just because we're in a crisis, so to say? Uh, how long can we keep it up? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, I, I, I was so impressed, like everyone, I think, to see how genuine and how easy in a way this unity came. I had the privilege of being in several ministerial meetings, also with the NATO Secretary General as it happens, and I was so, my mind was blown to see how everyone was on the same line. Yeah. And I think that this sets a very high standard for how unity should look like. It's this, it's right here, right now, this is how it looks like. And I think we also have to form a bit of a, a reflex to show ourselves that, look, it's possible. So I think it also probably surprised all allies and EU member states as well, like, look, wow, this is, it's amazing, we can do it. So I think this is the most important part, that we have shown to ourselves that we can do it, and that the lowest common denominator, actually, when, you know, we are all extremely united, can be very high, as a very, um, a person that I admire very much said once. That's yeah. fantastic. Um, Benedetta, if I could ask you, uh, if there were one of these proposals that we have heard, uh, is there one piece of them? Because some of them had a couple of concrete ideas in there. But is there one piece of it that you could foresee potentially being incorporated into NATO's next strategic concept in the strategy? Aha. Very, very precise. Well, <laughs> I, I would say that in each of these proposals, there are elements that are actively 
part of NATO's work. For example, when we talk about climate change, uh, the focus on reducing uh, our energy, de our dependence on fossil fuels, the focus on diversifying energy supply, the focus on increasing sustainability and energy efficiency. Well, this is something that NATO has been working on for years uh, through investing in our, in our scientists, by investing in green technology, by working with the private sector. So there are elements of that proposals that we can accelerate and scale, but it builds on something that the organization has been doing. So in that sense, I think that uh, that, that it's not far-fetched to see a reference to the importance of mitigation or contributing to the mitigation when it comes to climate change in, in our next uh, big strategic concept. But of course, I cannot, for, I cannot read the future, but I anticipate that will not be, uh, that will not be an incredibly big stretch. Just another, I'll stop because I know we don't have a lot of time, but I think another important point that has been raised throughout the last half an hour is this relationship between energy security national security, climate change, and really the importance of looking at security through this broader lens and looking at our strategic vulnerabilities has something that we need to be a collectively evaluate, assess, and ultimately mitigate together as allies. And I think that's also something that we will, uh, we will see uh, in, the, in our strategic concept as we continue to boost our work on resilience. So I'll just stop there. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. I know we are out of time, uh, so I am really sorry to have to end our discussion here. But uh, thank you so much to all of our panelists for a really interesting back and forth and uh, for giving some feedback to our winners uh, who put forth some really good ideas. I'm encouraged after listening to that. So thank you all so much for uh, your feedback. Uh, and I'll just... Uh, Get ready for our next session here, who's actually another organization that has been thinking about new ways of engaging with the next generation on security issues, very much in the ways that we have just been talking about. And it's actually the US Army. And they've been doing this through gaming, which actually might also be of interest to you, Max. But um, they are doing eSports team uh, competitions around the world to try and connect with young soldiers and talk about security issues. So let's have a quick video from them now, sharing a little bit more about that work. Thank you so much. So my name is Sergeant First Class Christopher Jones. I'm the non-commissioned officer in charge of U.S. Army Esports. And this is an overview of the program itself and how we're utilized within the United States Army. So this was a program birthed of gaming to support the Army's overall marketing initiatives. Um, it started in November of 2018 when we all came to, uh, came under the umbrella of the United States Army Recruiting Command and subsequently under the Marketing Engagement Brigade. And our mission is to support the Army's marketing efforts and market the Army as the service of choice. So how we do that is multifaceted. So we have a full-time team that is here at Fort Knox, Kentucky, underneath the brigade. And these are soldiers that compete in esports at regional, local, and national levels. But then we also support local activations, whether it's at conventions or even high school setups or collegiate setups and showcase the Army in a different light. So from the way I describe it, it's showing the soldier underneath the uniform because there could be a misconception that soldiers are of one track mind, that we are only one certain way, that only one certain kind of person can serve in the Army. So we are that catalyst, that bridge to show the American population, the people who serve in their Army and then if they so choose to follow that path, they at least have a reference point of knowing who is in their army. The way our structure is set up, we're once again under the Marketing and Engagement Brigade and within the Mission Support Battalion. And in that brigade also has the Army Parachute Team and the Marksmanship Unit. And in the battalion, it has the Mobile Exhibit Company, National Conventions Division, uh, all of which serve to support the overall marketing initiative. Some people would say that, well, how does this all fit? Well, it's no different than the Army Marksmanship Unit or the Golden Knights, where whether it's performing tandem demonstrations or competing at the highest level, U.S. Army Esports is the 21st century version. So right here on Fort Knox, we have a facility that we have essentially built on our own, where custom-built gaming PCs, uh, as well as monitors and everything like that, uh, peripherals, 
mouse and keyboards, controllers, whatever the, the soldier needs as far as what type of game they compete in. Um, we also have multiple rooms as well as a streaming room where we have, most of our streams are run out of there as well as the multimedia space. And one of the very unique things about this organization is we've managed our own talent to bring in soldiers that have very unique talents that are normally found within the Army. So someone that can understand streaming, building, building multiple PC setups in order to create a production. We have our own in-house multimedia where we create our own uh, graphic designs, our own photos, everything is built in, social media, because in this space is very specific where social media etiquette to graphics to uh, productions are all run in a very specific way and bringing in some of the best talent in the Army to do that, which is not normally trained, is what really sets us apart from our counterparts, but also kind of set the tone that we are following the exact same footsteps as any other esports organization. So we are not only competing across the services in the Department of Defense, we are also competing within the civilian space, within the esports and gaming industry. And some of the unique abilities that the esports team has is being able to integrate into the industry uh, in, an, in an endemic way. So if we have a partnership with a specific influencer or competitive team, we may uh, do some activations with that influencer, maybe a co-stream, meaning that we are streaming on a specific platform at the same time, and that allows a, you know, uh, average American to tune in to a Twitch stream that they would already be turning into anyway and get to see soldiers representing the Army in a space that they understand. So they get to hear a soldier's Army story from someone that's within their same age group. And that allows a lot of misconceptions to be cleared up almost immediately and allow if so choose that opportunity to then talk to recruiters there for them. Um, we've built not only a full-time team right here on Fort Knox, but we also created an at-large program uh, where we have our Discord server with over 18,000 active reserve and National Guard soldiers. And what this allows us to do is compete across all the titles in esports, as there are you know, innumerable amounts of games that show up in the esports space that can go away. So to combat that, that allows us to have at least 15 teams at all times. And if there's an internal Department of Defense competition, an external competition, or even a convention that we want to play a certain title, that allows us to bring in soldiers from other units who are doing it day to day. And that allows for a very authentic engagement with the American population. It's no longer just a recruiter there. There is a soldier who is not a recruiter, who is stationed you know, right now at a specific assignment doing either their first or second term and allows them to engage with the population in a more comfortable environment, one that they both understand. And that allows us to you know, engage in all kinds of different and unique ways. And uh, within that, there are a whole lot of volunteers as soldiers really are passionate about representing the Army in this space because they're whether we like it or not, soldiers are going home and playing games anyway. They're participating in smaller organizations trying to compete on their own anyway. So we allow them to come together, which is another amazing byproduct of this situation to have soldiers have a place to go where other soldiers are. So they could be stationed across the world, they could play with each other, and not only do they love the same games, but they're in the same profession. So uh, once again, the amazing byproduct of the situation is that we get to support soldiers as well and show them that, hey, the Army's not as big or you may not be that isolated, you may not be that different than other soldiers as well. So this program has a, acts in a multi-domain of supporting the marketing initiatives, but also supporting the soldier itself. And uh, as we continue to move forward, we're looking to continue to grow that as the rest of the Department of Defense is growing. And of course, the rest of the world and other military services across the world are picking up esports as uh, a legitimate uh, part of service. 
uh, I think we'll only see growth from there. All right. Well, speaking of competing in the esports world, in the gaming world, now we're going to talk about competing in the real world with Russia, with China, economically, digitally, and technologically. And we have a fantastic panel, both here in person and uh, on screen, joining us for this. It's going to be moderated by Alexandra Martin, our wonderful Rethink CEE fellow from the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Um, I would encourage everyone to open up the app. Again, feel free to submit your questions. Alex will be working them into the discussion as we go. Um, and so with that, uh, let me hand it over to you, Alex, and uh, we'll have this fantastic discussion. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Good afternoon to all of you. I'm happy to see that the room is still full, and I hope that also our online audience is still with us. Um, it's been an intellectual feast so far, at least from my point of view, um, on the most critical topics on the agenda of, of the Alliance, and we will continue with this session on global competition on the rise. Um, we are in the middle of the renewed era of geopolitical competition, but if we are looking at the arch of history, it's not something necessarily new. Uh, we have been competing in terms of military influence, economic, technological, so on and so forth. What is different this time is that at the core of this competition is the struggle between democracy and authoritarianism. And you have heard that before from multiple, multiple speakers. Um, and for uh, the US and Europe and, and the West uh, to maintain the competitive edge and, and to win, we will need to, to be able to leverage new tools, cyber domain, um, artificial intelligence, new technologies, but also non -military, other non-military sectors. Um, we have a lot to unpack today uh, in just 45 minutes. Before I introduce the speakers, I would like to invite you to have your questions ready, as I would like to have a mic, and you could address the speakers directly. And for those of you that are following us online, have them uh, factored into the app so I can pick uh, and choose a few for our esteemed panelists. So let me start with introducing um, Lieutenant General Lance Landrum, the Deputy Chair of the NATO Military Committee, uh, Didik Kirsten Tatlow, co-author of China's Quest for foreign technology beyond espionage. And on the screens, we have Tsiparab Fried, Senior Advisor for Prospective and Strategy to the Chairman and Vice Chairman of the French um, Joint Staff, Rita Balog, uh, Europe Lead International Government Affairs Google, and last but not least, uh, Andrei Soldatov, Co-Founder and Editor, Agentura.ru, and Senior Fellow at SIPA. Before I have the, the, the framing question for our esteemed uh, panelists, I would like just to do a bit of a, a show of hands in the room with uh, you here. And I would like to ask the following questions. What do you think is the future of the West versus China? Um, do you think that there will be a decoupling or we will find a cooperative approach uh, for the future? So those who think that there will be a decoupling in the future, can you show your hands? Decoupling. Okay, decoupling. and who thinks that there will be a way of co-living, a cooperative approach to this relationship? Mm, no, optimism. Uh, mm. Okay, so 50. roughly half half. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. some yeah. some thoughts for you as 50, 50. As, uh, as you start uh, talking about. So let me <laughs> let me start with the the framing the framing question for all of you and uh, asking you to just stick to your initial two minutes, um, and then I want to get as many questions uh, from from the audience. Um, and general. What are the implications of the, the renewed uh, geopolitical competition for the transatlantic alliance, but also for the future strategic environment? Yeah, thank you. I, I think, you know, when we talk about our relationship with China, we have to look at it from a few different, uh, a few different angles. There's one angle that is um, a values-based angle, which is where I'd like to start, right? And, and we see competition there between an autocracy and a form of government that is much different than ours in the way they interact with their citizens and the way they interact with their people and the way they interact with other nations and in, in other international bodies. And sometimes uh, we see evidence that that interaction is one that is trying to reestablish norms and to push back against the rules-based international order in ways that promote uh, their style of government and their levels of freedom that are not in line with some of our values. Combined with that, we see uh, a very focused decades worth of modern uh, military modernization 
that in some cases is logical, but some cases it makes you wonder, particularly with the amount of modernization of nuclear weapons and the delivery type systems and diversification of delivery type systems. Um, and, a, and a holistic approach that uh, the autocratic government is able to put together in a way that is difficult in our societies, despite all of our um, positive aspects, right? Um, and it's worldwide, it's global, it's comprehensive, and it's all domain to include uh, what I'm sure that has been spoken about a lot here recently, the cyber area, space as a domain, of course, uh, information as a, a domain as well. And so when you put together this comprehensive approach and, and you put it in light of our values, then that's a challenge for us. But I think maybe there's some opportunities there as well and how we can work together into the future and figure out how to weave our way in coexistence into the future. So thank you. I look forward to the discussion with everyone today. Thank you very much. Didi, uh, moving to, to you, because uh, for those that uh, do not know, Didi was actually uh, born and raised in Hong Kong. She also lived in main mainland China. She speaks Chinese. So she can see uh, and participate in this conversation also a bit from the other side of the story. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are the implications also from the other side of the story? Right. Well, thank you very, very much, Alexandra and everyone. Um, it, indeed, I have come to this issue from China, if you like, 39 years there. Um, and I guess I, have, I see what's going on in, in the way that we see China and we see strategic competition through that very particular lens. Um, I think China, the CCP rather, does absolutely, of course, have long-term strategic goals. It's got long-term strategic plans. It's always had them. And who can read in the original language, and this is absolutely essential, um, will see that they are there, and they've always been there, and they are being refined now. And a lot of it is about protecting the CCP from the pressure of change from outside of China. So in order to do that, because it's a dictatorship, it needs to also, in a sense, pacify the outside world, because that's where the threat or the challenge comes from. So it, it's, a, it's a complex situation. It's a serious one. Um, we've talked about a lot of serious things here today. I think that my main real fear almost <clears throat> as we deal with China, um, and I think we absolutely need to expand our, our focus to a global focus when we talk about security, um, uh, is that we don't really in the so-called West have the linguists, we don't have the people with the deep regional knowledge, with the area studies knowledge, we lack that. Now we did have it to a certain extent during the Cold War, for example. How are we gonna build that? Um, I could only push people toward Taiwan and say, uh, go and learn the language if you can, <laughs> seriously. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, moving to, to our uh, online speakers, and maybe I, I'll start with you, Tsipura. Um, looking at the geopolitical competition, the impact on the future strategic environment, but also uh, maybe if you can touch a bit on, on the European security and what uh, the, the French uh, currently um, are looking at when it comes to also NATO-EU uh, cooperation in the framework of European strategic uh, autonomy. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, I would like to just to come back to uh, what you said before about the, the kind of uh, upheaval of the world that we uh, observe now. And there are three really uh, global trends that uh, we can see. Uh, the first one is the uh, de westernization uh, of the world. The, the Western world is not uh, uh, at the center of the world anymore, at the center of the international relations uh, anymore, even though uh, the war in Ukraine uh, has uh, has made it uh, come back at the center of our attention. The second is really the global competition, uh, 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 especially the technological or norms and standards competition between the nations, even between uh, uh, allies partners, but also with uh, great competitors like Russia and, uh, and uh, China. Uh, and, uh, and this is a, a race uh, in a technological competition where we don't know where, it, where we'll, we will, uh, well, what will be the limit. And uh, the, the third trend, uh, I would say, is about our military operations that has raised some suspicion and uh, the notion of uh, winning the war, what it means uh, uh, today. Uh, there is a great question about that. So uh, this world, we have, uh, we, you asked me about the French vision uh, uh, of this uh, strategic uh, 
uh, environment. Uh, we have uh, a, a, a strategic vision developed and released by the chairman in, uh, in uh, November, uh, which uh, imply a new reading grid, uh, grid of this uh, environment. Uh, it's a triptych, uh, which replaces the uh, usual uh, peace, work, peace crisis war continuum. In fact, uh, it is less and less relevant, we think, this continuum, because we are really into a dynamic connection between competition, uh, dispute or contestation, and confrontation. And in this, the military have a place to, uh, uh, have a, a role to play in every facet of, uh, of this triptych. Uh, in this triptych also, we need to win the war before the war, as say the, the French uh, chairman of, uh, of the joint staff. Uh, especially, we have to win the war of perception, information, and influence. And uh, we can win this war uh, through our strategic solidarities. And our strategic solidarities are our allies and our organization, and especially a complementary uh, 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 NATO and EU that works together and work together to assess uh, the strategic environment, to share strategic culture and to develop interoperability. And I want, I want to focus just last uh, on NATO. NATO has a role to play, but uh, yet has to be defined in uh, the term of competition. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the thing about NATO is that we need an efficient and resilient alliance that will be able uh, to, um, to build trust between allies, to build a comprehensive approach between allies, and to keep uh, our armed forces interoperable. And this is a great challenge of the, of the, of the next years. Thank you. Thank you, and I think it's the right moment with the strategic compacts, uh, compact just recently adopted and the strategic concept in Madrid. There is a lot of room for, for cooperation between the two. I want to, to move to, to Andre now um, and to, to ask, we, we talked mostly about China so far, but in this geopolitical competition, uh, Russia plays an important role uh, not to uh, go back to, to Ukraine. Um, we discussed the first part of the day, but I would be curious to, to see more from the Russian perspective how the geopolitical competition um, um, is happening, uh, is seen uh, inside the, the, the Kremlin um, as well, and maybe also how the Ukraine war plays into, into the uh, vision of, of Russia. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, it feels a bit weird uh, to be present at your meeting, uh, being a Russian journalist, uh, when Russia started this horrible war invading Ukraine. And for two months, I've been trying quite desperately to find something positive in, this, uh, in everything which is going on right now, and which something which might give us hope. Uh, and to be honest, the only thing I found quite optimistic here is internet technologies. After 2016, after Russia uh, interfered with the US election, the West began to think about the internet in terms of threats. Uh, and uh, we all remember all these conversations about disinformation and about cyber attacks, about trolls. But what is interesting now with uh, the war ongoing in Ukraine is that it looks like, at least there and now, the internet technologies uh, was a force for good, not for bad. Big cyber attacks never happened the disinformation campaign launched by the Russians in Ukraine was not extremely successful. At the same time, internet technologies developed by global companies like Google, for instance, and some other companies have played a crucial role to keep Russia connected with the world. And Russian liberal people, people who are anti-war, that is the way for them to get information about how things are uh, developing and what is going on in Ukraine. And I think we need to think about it and remember about that, that we need to stay, well, to keep Russia connected. And I think that the military has a role to play here. Uh, remember that the most popular uh, uh, censorship, uh, well, uh, circumvention tool, uh, which is uh, in use in Russia today, is Tor. And Tor was developed by the US uh, military many years ago. So these things are really important right now. 
Thank you, Andrea. And actually, it's a perfect segue uh, to go to, to Rita and to actually see the, the business, the, uh, the private sector perspective on uh, geopolitical competition and uh, the future strategic environment. And maybe if you can touch also on, on the fine balance between the regulation that is coming, uh, especially from, uh, driven from Europe, um, and the, um, the, the freedom to continue to innovate, to um, uh, put forward all the uh, instruments that will protect the free speech. Rita, over to you. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so very much for the invitation and for um, the opportunity to be here today. As you mentioned, I'm part of our international government affairs team and also part of our working group um, that thinks about how we can contribute in the current situation and the war in Ukraine. So if you allow me, I just pick up on a few things that Andre mentioned. Happy to come back to um, any other of these topics, in particular on the day of uh, when the Declaration for the Future of Internet was launched, which I think is a fantastic initiative and, and has a lot to unpack there as well. I'm happy to come back to. But just on Russia, I think there are, um, and the war in Ukraine, I think there are a few learnings from our perspective. Number one is the importance of access to information, which is coming to in two parts. One is how do we elevate authoritative information on our platform and help our users, for example, refugees seeking information and we're showing them UN uh, resources. The second one, as Andre mentioned, is how are we keeping up our platform in many countries around the world, which is becoming increasingly challenging. And we're still present in Russia. YouTube and search is still available in Russia. So number one, importance of access to information. Number two, um, we're still working very hard to make sure that um, this information on our platform is removed and reduced. And we have been incredibly active in this field over the past um, two months or so as well. In the context of the war in Ukraine, we removed about 8,000 YouTube videos and 30, 30,000 YouTube videos and 8,000 YouTube channels that violated our um, community guidelines. We also feel, as a third point, our responsibility for supporting refugees and we dedicated resources and, and, and contributing um, to the work of many international organizations and local organizations in the Central European region. And the fourth thing that is probably the most interesting for this audience is uh, what others mentioned, the importance of cybersecurity. So from our perspective, we've been working really hard um, to keep our um, services and infrastructures and our users and customers safe in the current system, but also to make sure that we share our experience and learnings and resources, in particular with those that are impacted in the war, to help them enhance their online presence. So as I said, um, fantastic to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. Happy to go into more details on any one of these issues. Thank you, Rita. Again, a reminder to all of you uh, to get your questions ready. I'll, I'll get to you in a second. I do have a couple of, of follow-up questions. So not just the West, uh, Europe and, and the US are continuing to invest in new technologies and, and sharpen the, the, the innovative um, edge, but also Russia and China, they do the same. Uh, so my question to you, General, is how do we uh, help the allies and the militaries adapt uh, to these new technologies uh, in an old domain um, era? And uh, will we see something uh, at the Madrid uh, summit about it in the strategic concept? And I want to tie in a question from the audience as well. Uh, what do you think about the technological gap between NATO allies, especially US and, and Europe? So if you can uh, go ahead and try to capture an answer to all those, it would be great. Yeah, sure. I think, <laughs> I think when it comes to the technological development, um, embracing in our acquisition systems and our development systems the emerging technologies, um, and, and it's not just embracing the emerging technologies, right, the widget or the thing, it's embracing the idea of how they're developed. The, the quick turn, min viable product, building upon that um, through your lessons learned and having a, a spirals of iterations that allow software development in quick, um, quick iterations would, that advance the technology is, I think, one of the keys. And I think 
you know, we, this is the youth summit. And so the youth that thinks about these things much differently than some of the older generation can is really, really key to try to inject that into some of the defense systems in order to help our acquisition systems. Regarding the alliance I and mean, technological differences, the alliance is all in this together. And we all help ourselves out together. And, and we strive for interoperability. We strive for compatible systems. And so when we work together and we exercise together, that technological difference starts to reduce a little bit across allies. And then all the, all the allies in their own way are committed to advancing their technological development into the future with, with all the ideas that are being discussed here. Thank you. Didi, would you like to follow up on it? Because you're, the book that you co-author is about the quest for technology beyond espionage. Yeah. So how do you look also at the gap within the Western um, world and between us and China, for example? Well, I mean, what we see is, a again, a long-term strategic plan by Beijing to catch up with the West, whatever that means exactly. Basically, it means North America and Europe, um, but also Israel, Japan, other places, and to ensure that China, um, which is genuine and was genuinely um, culturally anxious about having fallen behind. And then we had this phase, obviously, of sort of, you know, the 19th century invasion, colonialism, et cetera, which was of a very limited form, may I add. Um, one shouldn't fall for that propaganda trope, I think, too much. Um, you know, and then this genuine desire to catch up because, you know, the Chinese culture and state and nation and people are ambitious and want to, to do well in, in, in the world. So what we've seen then is the Communist Party taking this anxiety, if you like, and uh, crafty, very intelligent, large and granular policies and party directives aimed at procuring technology from the outside world, so spotting it, extracting it, bringing it back to China, commercializing it, or as they say, reinventing it, um, all this kind of stuff. And it's been enormously successful. China has, for example, approximately 100,000 science and technology workers in the country whose only job it is is to scan the world, literature, PhDs, conferences, whatever you want, companies, anything they can get their hands on, really, and um, know what is out there and how to bring it back. And that's their only job. And then this feeds into all parts of the system, Ministry of Science and Technology, the military, all kinds of development agencies that, that are all connected to the party state, because everything goes back to the top, to that Communist Party. Uh, system. So, you know, it's enormously successful and we should respect it and we, you know, take it seriously and think about how to manage it. Super. Do we have a question in the room? We already have two questions. Um, come in front um, and try to also uh, address someone specifically, if possible, so we can get as many questions as possible. Uh, thank, thank you very much for this panel. It's already very interesting. Um, I'd just like to come back to the Europe versus America problem. Um, my research is on space policy, and it's, I think, in Europe especially, sitting here in Brussels, a lot of people remember how Galileo went when, I mean, the Americans allegedly threatened to shoot down satellites, you know, in case they were being used by adversaries. Isn't there a kind of, isn't American, the idea that Americans have in, in many technological fields, which is total supremacy, complete control of the space, isn't that kind of antithetical to the foundation of the alliance and especially given what's going on in Ukraine now, well, don't we need basically more technology sharing? Is that to the general? To yeah, in, in, in particular. Oh. <laughs> okay, in particular. General. Sure. sure. Uh, so uh, I, I think it's, it's quite clear that uh, the United States, while ha a great capability in space, doesn't have uh, a complete dominance in space. We've seen very clear evidence of activities in space from Russia and China mm. that's quite advanced and quite developed. And so um, I think that that, uh, that is a challenge area for sure. Um, as far as developing space capability for NATO, NATO does have a space policy, but NATO does not aspire right now to develop actual space systems, and so nations donate their space capabilities um, on a bilateral basis with the NATO organization as alliance members to deliver products, data, and services from their space into the NATO command structure for different values and different purposes. 
Um, I think the other aspect of space is protecting our connectivity to space, both the ground systems and the connectivity to the satellites, of course, through the electromagnetic spectrum and uh, the systems and data systems uh, that keep them alive and working in space, but also help share that data into other, other systems on the ground, whether that be surveillance systems, intelligence to process, exploit, and disseminate that information, or to weapon systems as well. Right, thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to go to Paris, I assume, for you're in Paris, um, and also pick your brain uh, on, on the perceived, or maybe uh, you have a different uh, point of view on the uh, technological gap between the US and Europe. Is that something that Europeans are worried, they feel that's happening? How do they compensate uh, within the alliance, but also in other formats? Uh, Alexandra, thank you. Yes, I think indeed there is a real gap between uh, technology uh, bit, between uh, the US and European Union uh, in technology. And the European Union has uh, had a much uh, uh, focused uh, on uh, the ethical use of technology and uh, what is its role? It's to provide in uh, norms and uh, rules, uh, regulation on the, the use of technology. And I think this has created uh, a delay uh, to develop uh, 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 how uh, power the technologies. But uh, I think the EU uh, is catching up uh, right now through uh, its uh, own nation's uh, uh, programs of uh, innovation. But I would like uh, just to come back to one thing. Uh, uh, we're talking about uh, a com uh, technological uh, competition. Uh, I think uh, technology is not the only way to, um, uh, to get supremacy in operations. And uh, we need, to, uh, we need to, re to remind that, especially uh, regarding uh, the, uh, the war in Ukraine, that uh, resilience, uh, um, uh, force uh, uh, of uh, the spirit, and uh, uh, the capacity to uh, operate in a degraded environment is really also important. So that's the paradox of, uh, our, uh, uh, of today. Uh, the new military capabilities uh, increasingly rely on uh, technology, on connected uh, digital system, on AI with uh, technologies. But it's not the end. It's not the end. And uh, it raises uh, several questions and several challenges uh, for example, uh, how to keep interoperable in the alliance if there is such a gap between the US and the other nations. How we manage the competition between our industries. We, we should not underestimate this competition between the bi-American, bi-European. It's uh, something that also we have to deal with. Uh, but, uh, and I would say there is also competition between the private sector and uh, the, uh, in the classical uh, industries uh, of defense. And uh, it, uh, it uh, asks the uh, duality of those technologies which have different norms and our capacity to acquire them. So uh, there is a lot of uh, questions uh, uh, that uh, we, uh, we need to work on. We need to work and we need to find the right uh, answers uh, to be able to uh, get uh, a coherent uh, alliance uh, in, uh, in, um, uh, ready to, to face uh, any, any challenges. I'm happy that you also mentioned about the sub-tires of the competition within the alliance, within the Western world, because they are indeed uh, very important. And unless we get our house in order, um, it will be very difficult to, to compete globally with uh, actors that do not necessarily have the same challenges at home, including Russia and China. Um, yep. And then we'll go to, to, to Andre on, on a question on Russia and China. Uh, hello, my name is Marie Zemetsnikova. I'm from the Czech Republic and I'm community manager for DG International Partnership as well as Atlantic Forum. And uh, my question is going to Didi actually, and uh, it's uh, from the personal experience uh, regarding China. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, uh, we have, uh, you already briefly touched upon this uh, language narrative that uh, there is a correlation between the language and cybersecurity. That uh, actually, like uh, when uh, there is a Chinese-speaking attack uh, from uh, China uh, going to Europe, there there is a lack of uh, Chinese-speaking people mm -hmm. here, so we cannot really uh, secure ourselves uh, against the China uh, against the cyber 
in terms of cybersecurity. But on the other hand, uh, there is also this that uh, when you are establishing a project in Europe and uh, in terms of cybersecurity, you are including one of your teammates uh, who is Chinese, it decreases uh, credibility here in Europe. So how we can actually balance uh, this, uh, the credibility, as well as uh, to increase the, uh, the Chinese uh, narrative here in Europe? Right, that's um, very happy to get that question. I think um, we don't necessarily, in my opinion, want to increase what you call the Chinese narrative. I think here we need to differentiate very carefully. We need to talk about, we need to be clear about what we're talking about. So we need to be clear about what is the political narrative of the Communist Party of China. What is its propaganda? What are, what are its true strategic and tactical um, actions and goals. And I think with um, the issue of Chinese uh, speaking people and analysis, you're absolutely right that we don't have enough Chinese speakers. Um, the, the EU's uh, East Stratcom task force very recently created anything at all really um, on China. Still very, in my opinion, um, personally, it's, it's too small. Um, East Stratcom, I assumed that meant, well, that would just go to Asia, won't it? But I found out, oh no, that's Russia. I was very surprised, because I'm like, well, if you want East, you've got to go to Asia, right? And Russia is sort of, kind of, obviously East too, but it's Central Eastern, you know, it's, 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 it's not as far East, yeah? So to me, this, this has took a while to get my head around it and to understand that the EU wasn't actually thinking in terms of the East or China, not really, right? So, um, but I think with, um, on, on that issue, what the most important part of that type of cyber and language connection would be the analysis. Yeah, so then you need a type of mind that has the language but can also analyze from different points of view and has a certain capabilities. And I think working is within a certain value system. So it's, it's not that you need necessarily a linguist to, to, to do all of that for you. But of course, there's a vast amount of information on the Chinese internet. It's the biggest information control system in history. I mean, again, it's, it's a massive bubble. And yeah, you do need the people who can go in there and figure out what's going on. The big challenge people have now is how to get the algorithms to do that, to work in the Chinese language, to do a lot of that for us. This is what we are all trying to think and struggle with and trying to build now because uh, I think it's too much for, for, for any human brains actually to deal with simply with that scope that we have. I hope I answered your questions. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I want to go to, to Andre because uh, one of the worries in Europe is the, the relationship or the, the enhanced relationship between uh, China and Russia um, in light also of the, the, the partnership signed at the beginning of February right before the invasion of Ukraine. Um, so the question uh, that probably most of the, the, the Western world is asking, um, is the current Russia-China relationship a, a short-term convergence of interest or is a long-term strategic threat that we need to be very careful about and we need to uh, properly plan um, to counter uh, in the future? Oh, thank you for this question. Uh, actually, the picture is uh, even more complicated. Uh, there are several layers where there are problems between Russia and China. Uh, in terms of the narratives, for instance, uh, we have two narratives struggling here in Ukraine. Uh, on the one hand, uh, you have uh, the narrative pushed by Russia that uh, Russia was provoked to go into Ukraine because the Western powers interfered with the political situation in Ukraine, and that is why Russia was forced to, uh, to invade. And probably China would be happy with that uh, because they are also paranoid about the Western interference. But there is a second narrative, and this narrative is about sovereignty of Ukraine. And this is a big problem for China because it's a kind of sacred war for China. Uh, they've been talking about sovereignty for years, if not decades. There are other problems, more practical, for instance, technological uh, partnership. Uh, well, Russia would love to present to the world what we have uh, uh, a mutual understanding with China in technologies, in telecommunications, but actually it's not true. Uh, and mostly because of, uh, uh, because of the position of Russia. Uh, Russian security services uh, have been paranoid about Chinese telecommunication companies for decades. And that is why uh, the FSB, the domestic counter uh, intelligence agency, was always against 
uh, Chinese uh, well, uh, investments in the Russian telecommunications sector. And well, now, after the invasion, after the Western sanctions, maybe it would be slightly better for China, but now the Chinese are very aware of, uh, of the problem of the secondary sanctions. And they do not want to ship technology to Russia because they can be hit by these secondary sanctions. But it's also a problem of a military co uh, cooperation. Actually, we do not see, for instance, uh, sharing of sensitive information of, uh, by the military of the two countries. It is non-existent. Uh, in terms of intelligence cooperation, also it's a big question. Uh, as I said, Russian spies, they are not really, they do not trust the Chinese. So on so many levels, we have these problems. And uh, actually, the only one guy who is like always pushing for more cooperation with China is Vladimir Putin. And that's it. That's it. But at the end of the day, Vladimir Putin is still the president of Russia. Um, and I think that's um, important enough to consider it as, as a threat, at least for the time being. Rita, I will jump to you now. Um, and just from the private sector perspective, what are companies like Google expecting from NATO when it comes to maintaining the, the competitive technological edge and to contribute to the alliance security? Um, yes, I thank you for that question. Let me also pick up a few uh, other things that were in said In one before. minute and a half, please. <laughs> as in one minute and a half. Um, <laughs> yes, just the notion of uh, Chinese companies catching up from a global company perspective. We do feel that international competition is very, very real and something that we take very seriously. So something that we have been working on is, is really truly investing in R&D. Generally, we have over $100 billion investment in just the past few, a few years in that, but also very targeted in the cybersecurity field, which is, for example, a very recent $10 billion announcement from, from our perspective. In terms of what we can do and, and then countries to um, say if, how, how should countries think about in the uh, industry and the geopolitical context? And something that was asked by uh, the gentleman in the audience as well. I think it's important to you know, work together as allies, look at technology that was developed on either side of the Atlantic, in particular state of the art uh, technology as an opportunity for um, you know, companies and governments on both sides of the Atlantic and, and really kind of trust each other and work on that trust factor and just make sure I think that we're, we're stronger together. Thank you. So trust, interoperability, resilience, it also goes beyond the technical tools. And that's actually um, important key points, uh, maybe for the summit in, in Madrid, where also the, the political um, decision makers will, will discuss how the, the future strategic environment will look like. Um, Maybe, yeah, we are running out of time. We have less than, uh, than five minutes, and I want to give you the opportunity to uh, have 30 to 45 seconds uh, final thoughts. Um, I know it's not much, but um, it's, it's important. And maybe uh, try to incorporate into that, how do we actually set the rules of the game uh, in terms of normative aspects of the technology um, in the future? Shall I start with you, General? Sure. <laughs> I, think, I think we set the rules by uh, advancing our technologies and getting into the business of standards and setting standards. I think we work transparently across international organizations, and we work transparently with our uh, companies and industry in the West in order to have a leadership in forward thinking and forward leaning so that you're the one setting the standards and you're the one setting interoperability and compatibility among the systems. So I think that's a way forward on it. Thank you. Didi. Yeah, I wanted to underline what the previous speaker said. It's absolutely right. Russia is a major target for Chinese technology acquisition. There's a lot of suspicion there. However, on February the 4th, when we had that joint statement between Russia and China, <clears throat> to be honest, my blood rather ran cold because the language that, that was being used in this joint statement was, was the pure Chinese language. For example, the new era, you know, challenging the international order. This is, this is Xi Jinping has been talking about this for, for a long time and before that others have. And I think, you know, I really got a very strong sense that Russia is learning 
from China. Also the narrative, you know, in Ukraine, China has the same language about Taiwan. Um, this, this sort of imperial narrative, this sort of revisionist narrative, historical revisionism, if you like. China claims that it cannot, there's no talk of invading Taiwan because Taiwan is already part of China and you cannot invade your own country. This is the language that the foreign ministry uses. This is, you know, this is hegemonic discourse. It's, it's very fascinating and I see the same thing coming from Putin now. So I think a lot of authoritarian learning going on there, despite you know, the, the absolute definite tensions within that relationship. relationship. So I think my final point would be, that it would be smart of us, I think, to raise the cost for China of this so-called No Limits Partnership with Russia. I don't think we're going to be able to do it before the 20th Party Congress at the end of the year. Xi Jinping wants his third term in government, but after that, and Wait. before that too. Raising the cost. Uh, yeah. Tora, back, back to you, uh, because you did mention about the normative part, the, the resilience. So how do we continue to set the, the, the rules uh, of the future? Oh, that's, uh, that's, I think, one of the great challenges of uh, the, uh, uh, the future year, because uh, I, uh, I wanted to emphasize the fact that uh, the competition is not only about technology. The competition is now about norms and standards. And, uh, and China's ambition is to change uh, the, uh, the, the, the actual, the, 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 um, the, the world uh, and the organization of the rules today. So uh, how can we uh, face that challenge? I would say that uh, uh, first, uh, we, uh, we have to work together. We, uh, we really have to, uh, not only uh, NATO, but also the European Union, uh, which is uh, uh, which has a role to play in uh, regulation. Uh, 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 we uh, we really have to uh, speak with the same voice on maintaining uh, our standards and our norm. And this is what the the, the uh, part of the what the chairman of uh, the Joint Staff, uh, the French chairman, says. It's uh, win the war uh, before the war. And uh, uh, I think for that we need to have an alliance which combine a very reactive, flexible, uh, uh, interoperable, uh, and highly trained set of uh, forces uh, capable to address uh, all those challenges and Thank being you. able to, uh, to um, respond in terms of uh, technology to the, this uh, new set of standards. Thank you. Uh, Rita, final, final remarks very quickly, in just a few seconds, so Andre can also share with, with us. Yes, just on, on your point on the normative aspect, I think it's important that we don't take democratic values like access to information, human rights and others for granted. And then governments are actively working to defend these. And, and just coming back to today's declaration for the future of the internet, I think initiatives like these are really important. It has 60 countries that sign up to it. I think almost all of the NATO and, and, and EU member states are signed up to it. And, and from a company and Google perspective, we are very keen to um, collaborate and, and, and support the success of these initiatives. Thank you. And Andre, I know you cannot talk necessarily from the Western perspective, but we would be very happy to hear your, your final thoughts on... Yeah, very quickly. Uh, what we've seen now increasingly, this big drive of uh, big companies pulling out of Russia, and uh, I completely understand the reasons, uh, of course. Uh, it all sounds really disgusting what is going on in Ukraine. And personally, as a journalist, I think it's absolutely fascinating that maybe the very first time in history, we have ethics playing a big role in international politics. But I think that we all need to think now, strategically, what does it mean uh, uh, that for Russia to, to have it completely uh, disconnected uh, from, from the West. Uh, in terms of, for instance, of 10 years, what might happen in 10, uh, 10, uh, 10 years' time? Does it mean that the West is pushing Russia even closer to China? What it might mean for China and for Russia? We just need to make it uh, a question to ourselves and to think about it really, really carefully. Thank you very much. Thank you to my panelists for uh, fantastic contributions and to all of you online and also in the room for your active participation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, expert job moderating. Thank you all so much for being here. 
So this last panel highlighted that at the crux of this global competition, it's really about values, about this fight for democracy versus autocracy, the way we organize our societies and the way we live our life. So now we're going to uh, see how this is playing out in very real ways, uh, sometimes painful ways, on the ground in Ukraine and also Belarus, for that matter. We're going to hear from someone who knows this struggle all too well, Madam Svetlana Tikhonovskaya, who is the leader of Democratic Belarus. Um, she is going to talk about the importance of these values for fighting for them and the importance of civic engagement, especially from youth like you. Dear participants of the Youth Summit, dear friends, as you are advancing on your path to shape the future of Europe, I urge you to dream big to dream of Europe with the new democratic Belarus and prosperous Ukraine at its heart. For the last 20 months, Belarusians have been peacefully defending this vision. At ballot stations and in prisons, at loud demonstrations and quiet prayers for peace, at striking factories and women's marches. Belarusians have claimed our right to a democratic future. We returned our country to the map of Europe. Unfortunately, the regime of Lukashenko tried to drag our country into Putin's war. From our territory, Russian aircraft and missiles were launched, and they shelled peaceful Ukrainian cities. However, our country didn't become a place where the Russian army feels safe. Belarusians waged a phenomenal underground resistance against the war. Since February, Belarusian partisans have conducted more than 80 acts of sabotage on the railways. Our cyber partisans have been hacking state institutions daily. A powerful Samizdat network has distributed more than 300,000 leaflets to combat propaganda. A Chatham House poll showed that only 3% of Belarusians support military participation in the war. We made our stance clear. We are against the war and the dictator supporting it. And yet, at every meeting, I have to explain that Belarus is not Russia and Belarus is not Lukashenko. The real Belarus is defined by young people like you, like my representative on youth affairs, Alana Gibrimariam, who has been in jail on made up charges for the last two years. Like Artyom Bayatsky, a chemistry student of Belarusian State University and an inspiring scientist who was sentenced to five years for speaking his mind. Like Katerina Andreeva, a 28-year-old journalist who has just been charged with high treason and faces up to 15 years in prison for her coverage of protests. The real Belarus is defined by our fearless activists by independent journalists and by a strong civil society who, despite their repressions, continues to walk from Minsk, Vilnius and Warsaw. It is also defined by young people your age who dream of having the same opportunities as you do. We must learn that dictators cannot be re-educated. Do we need more proof that the brutal crackdown after the stolen election flight hijacked, the migrant crisis, and now the war. Every time the democratic community let Lukashenko go unchecked, he raised the stakes. Just think about it. Had we stopped Lukashenko in 2020, none of that would have been possible. This shows that only democratic Europe will be a safe Europe. Democracy needs to show its teeth. The strongest possible sanctions are needed to prevent impunity. It is also crucial to make sure that sanctions have no loopholes. Otherwise, half measures will only harm. You can see they work by the way Lukashenko has changed his rhetoric. Don't be fooled as he is trying to be a peacemaker in a war that he enabled. You can't bomb your neighbor and plead for peace at the same time. The new Belarus also needs support. I ask you to focus your policy work on aid for civil society. It is precisely because of Belarusian independent journalists, NGOs, 
human rights defenders that the regime hasn't sent Belarusian military to Ukraine. It is afraid of pushback. Independent media are fighting against propaganda, and solidarity initiatives provide guidelines and support for those brave enough to leave the military. You can help us turn the vision of democratic, free European Belarus into reality. Your voices are loud and strong. I urge you to use it to help those who have been silenced in Belarus to advance our shared, safe and democratic future. Excellent. So, to continue with this discussion about democratic values and, and fighting for democracy, I'm so pleased to introduce our next panel, which contains the real activists and the voices who are leading the fight for freedom out on the front lines in their countries, whether that's in Ukraine or in Russia or even Hong Kong. They're going to share some, some of their firsthand stories about what they're doing, illustrating how they make a difference in their own communities and how you can too. Their stories will tell us why this work is so critical and, and how you can continue the fight at home. So now I am so pleased to hand it over to our world-class moderator, who is something of a NATO nerd himself, by the way, Damon Wilson, who is the president and CEO of the National Endowment for Democracy, which is an organization dedicated to strengthening democratic institutions around the world. Damon, thank you so much for being here, and over to you virtually. Lauren Speranza, thank you so much. It is such a pleasure to see you there leading the charge today. It's an honor to be with you for this conversation at the front lines, democracy, human rights, and activism. Uh, and Lauren's right, I am a bit of a NATO nerd, but I'm passionate about the cause of freedom and democracy, and they're connected. The process of enlarging an alliance was really about securing freedom for people, and it's appropriate that it's a topic today at the NATO Youth Summit. Because 70 years ago, this, this alliance was founded to safeguard the free world. The preamble of the Washington Treaty is clear on this. The parties are determined to safeguard the freedom of their peoples, founded on the principles of democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. And today, those principles are under attack. Lauren has teased this up so well. It's really an honor to be back paired up with her in this setting, as I am now at the National Endowment for Democracy, where Svetlana Sikhanovskaya said, it's our work is the daily work, as she called for, supporting civil society, supporting independent media. She's here in Washington. We had dinner last night. But today, we're delighted to be joined by extraordinary activists. We see this, these principles are under attack around the world as a Russia invades a Ukraine uh, and represses its own people at home as part of that campaign. We see from China beginning to export the tools and technologies of repression uh, even as it's doubled down on repression for its own people, the people of Hong Kong, Uyghurs, and East Turkestan. And it's not limited to Russia, China. It's across the globe today. So this issue is how do we strengthen democracy at home and abroad? What can people do to contribute to this? So I'm going to turn to some extraordinary activists that we've gathered who are on the front lines of this fight. We have joined with us three people who have been, in many different ways, forced to leave their own homes. We're here with Olga Tukaryuk, who is with us in Western Ukraine. She's an independent journalist and researcher normally based in Kiev, who had to leave because of the war, a fellow at the, at, at the Center for European Policy Analysis, and a real expert on building independent media in Ukraine and the, this, the battle for disinformation. We're also joined by Nathan Law, uh, who's joined us from the United Kingdom. He's a leading human rights and democracy activist from Hong Kong, jailed during the Umbrella Movement, now the convener of the advisory board of Hong Kong Democratic Council in exile in London, and Mikhail Fishman, who is with us from Tel Aviv, who had to leave Moscow just in the past few weeks as a leading journalist, independent journalist, political commentator from Russia, who was the host of TV Rain, a former editor-in-chief of the Moscow Times. So I want to go to Olga in Western Ukraine and start with you, if I might. Um, tell us what has motivated you for this line of work, what motivates you in the middle of a war to continue to do this work of providing independent media, countering disinformation, and effectively defending a free Ukraine. Hello, uh, Damon, everyone. Thank you for having me on this uh, panel today. I'm delighted to be sharing it with uh, such wonderful colleagues. 
Well, uh, you know, the war has changed a lot, and I think I will, I'm just reassessing what what is happening. Uh, but uh, in general, I can say that my work as a journalist and as a researcher of disinformation is motivated by my fellow citizens. You know, they give me inspiration. Ukrainians have been fighting for democracy and have been dying for democracy for the last eight years. As we speak, so many of my compatriots are on the front lines, risking their lives to defend their right to live in a free democratic country that determines its own future. Uh, you know, in a country where, that has free elections, in a country that has freedom of speech, in a country that has free civil society, a diversity of, of the media. So, you know, this uh, values that might be taken for granted by someone in the West definitely are not for us Ukrainians. And as I said, Ukraine has been invaded by Russia precisely because it was moving closer and closer with the, you know, the Western free and democratic world. Russia wants Ukraine to stop this, uh, you know, rapprochement with, uh, with the EU, with the West, but it's failing. We are seeing this strong resistance of the Ukrainian people, huge resilience of the Ukrainian society that mobilized to provide all kinds of support to, to soldiers coming, you know, starting from sending uh, uh, assistance uh, uh, to supporting IDPs who had to flee their houses and, you know, who are stationed in other parts of the country. So my inspiration are my fellow citizens. I'm happy, you know, to be uh, a Ukrainian and I'm doing what I can as best as I can as a journalist to speak about their fight, to speak about their struggle, and to promote the values they are fighting and dying for. Olga, thank you so much. I think everyone here recognizes that the future of freedom and democracy is playing out, being fought in Ukraine today, and we honor that sacrifice and, and the courage that you bring to this conversation. Um, I also want to turn, because the implications of this have been quite tough for those Russians who wanted to provide independent voice and, and, and perspective to the Russian people. Um, one of those is our, our journalist who's with us, Mikhail Fishman. Mikhail, you have had to leave uh, recently for Tel Aviv. You've done extraordinary work over the years in Russia, from Russia, um, in your work at TV Rain and other places. Tell us a little bit what has motivated you to push the limits of what's been acceptable to take that risk and what, what has now forced you to take exile. Um, thank you, Damon. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'll try to be short. Uh, you just uh, listened to Svetlana Tikhanovskaya's uh, address, and uh, well, that's basically the position of uh, Russian civil society as well. It's uh, very similar to what Belarusians uh, go through uh, for uh, all these years. Um, uh, let me speak as a as a Russian and as a Russian uh, Russian independent journalist on behalf of Russians and Russian independent journalists. Um, of course, uh, this war, this uh, Putin's war with Ukraine, brutal, unjust, predatory, has already uh, left tens of thousands killed, not only soldiers on the battlefield, but also civilians. The world already knows about horrific war crimes committed by the Russian military, and not the whole truth uh, has been revealed yet and documented. We all know that. And of course, Ukrainian people, Ukrainian nation, is uh, the first and the main victim of this war. But there is another victim too, and I mean Russians. Um, yes, they are not murdered and tortured in their homes, yet they are victims. We are victims. Russians are repressed, silenced, put in jail, persecuted, intimidated. Uh, since the start of, the war, start of this war, thousands of uh, Russians uh, have been detained for protesting, uh, protesting against it. Um, the government has instated military censorship and uh, activists, human rights um, defenders, NGOs, members, uh, journalists, other Russians are prosecuted on daily basis for simply calling this war a war. Um, to give you an example, um, right now, Vladimir Karamurza, um, prominent liberal thinker and uh, um, a, a political activist, very well known across the world, uh, is under arrest and facing up to 10 years um, up, to, up to 10 years in jail for speaking out against this war. And there are many more. Thousands, I'm getting to my point, thousands already had to flee and hundreds of thousands have fled, making it major exodus 
um, from Russia since the Bolshevik Revolution and the Civil War, um, well, what, 100 years ago. So uh, make no mistake, uh, for Russia and for Russians, this, is, this war is a tragedy and uh, it's existential. I know what you're probably uh, thinking, uh, and you heard about this, and uh, we all heard about this. Reportedly, majority of Russians stand behind this war. Official Russian pollsters present striking numbers of uh, public support, 75%, 80%, 85%. But these numbers are not a real reflection. They are a weapon. They are used to suppress Russian society even more. First, these polls are a manipulation. Second, let me tell you this, it's very simple. This war would never happen if Putin's government would not rig every major election, every national vote for last 15 years. It's a full-scale war brought on Ukraine by a full-scale tyranny. In these circumstances, Russia's independent journalists are still doing their job. Hundreds, um, maybe even thousands, well, whatever was left of uh, Russian independent journalism mostly had to leave Russia, including myself, disrupted, brought down, scattered across, uh, across the world. Editorial teams have started already reinventing themselves and getting back to work, and this is very important. They are, well, we are, I'm on this list, I'm part of this global team of uh, Russian independent journalism, still operating, still working. Uh, we are on a mission, on a mission to do whatever, whatever we can to deliver truth about this war to Russian people to crush this iron curtain of uh, propaganda, lies, um, military censorship, and persecution of free speech. So to answer your question, Damon, what motivates me? This mission. Mikhail, thank you for your clear words. Thank you for your convictions and courage. Uh, I'm honored to set, share that I'm, uh, uh, we're meeting with uh, Vladimir Karmurza's wife uh, right after this, who's here with us in Washington. It's a tough time for those who are, as you said, full-scale war from a full-scale tyranny time, trying to stand up to that. But it's uh, while the headlines right now are appropriately focused on Russia's war in Ukraine, Mr. Putin's war in Ukraine, the big, greatest rollback of freedom around the world last year, the most rapid rollback of freedom, took place as Beijing uh, unwound the freedoms of, of rule of law in Hong Kong. And we're joined by Nathan Law, who got into the arena, ran for office, won, was unable to take a seat in jail in the umbrella movement. Nathan, tell us a little bit about why you were motivated at such a young age to step up, get into the arena, and, and push these issues in a really difficult environment. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction, Damon, and, in, and the invitation from um, the organizers. Um, for me, I, I always quote uh, Fakla Pafo, the first um, President of the Czech Republic, um, his word about dissidents. Whenever chooses to become dissident, the dissent is a reaction. Many Hong Kongers, Russians, Ukrainians, we all stand up to fight for, for, for our democracy because tyrannies are just pushing our limits um, multiple times and they, they were diminishing our hopes and they are destroying our whole society. <laughs> and in the case of Hong Kong, Beijing promised us democracy and freedom, but they failed to do deliver. And we've been seeing the rise of authoritarianism of dictators for the past two decades because we also have seen the complacency from the West, from democratic countries, that some of them may blindly believe that the democracy will prevail without any effort. No, this is not the case. Democracy prevails only if we are vigilant enough towards these malign force and to protect our freedom and we haven't been doing enough for the past two decades. That's why we're in the second decade of democratic backsliding. And that's the thing that we have to review and to have change. If we do not have an awakening or a perceptual change about the reality that we put the rise of authoritarianism or defense of democracy as one of the largest threats of our times, it is impossible for us to defend democracy and to suppress these rights of authoritarianism and to protect freedom everywhere. Um, so for me, uh, it's really important for us to remember that um, basically the West has fed these monsters and is 
time for us to take that responsibility and to help activists, journalists, people who are resisting on the grounds and wherever they need in order to make a case that people, they are going to take back their future. They are going to resist and to fight for democracy. So for me, um, being situated in Hong Kong, a place that we, we definitely felt like our freedoms were taken for granted is, is a very powerful example to see how rapidly a city could roll back its freedom, basically from one of the freest uh, city in Asia to a complete authoritarian police state now. And this is a perfect example showing that Beijing with uh, the control and the leadership of Xi Jinping, um, they are really confident over their totalitarianism. And we must uh, recognize that they are not something like peacemaker or, or a force of good on the international level. They are trying to topple the rule-based order that we all enjoyed. And the very first blood or the very first example of it is in Hong Kong. So this is, uh, this is an example with a global implication and reminds everyone how fragile freedoms are and how much effort we need to pay to defend our freedoms and democracy. So Nathan, thank you for that. And you know I agree with every word you said, but I want to push you a little bit um, as an activist, as an organizer. Um, and I see we're starting to get some questions in. So I'll encourage uh, those in the audience to send in those questions. I will pivot to bring them in. But let me come back to you, Nathan. Defending democracy. In fact, I want to ask each of you, how can we be more effective, not only just in defending democracy, but as Nathan pointed out, we've been in this democratic recession for almost two decades, a 16 year run. How can, how can we be more effective in helping you be part of a democratic renewal? And what specifically would you point to for those in our audience to think about that? The first, Nathan, Nathan, back to you on that. Well, thank you, Damon. This is a very timely question um, for us. There has been an increase of uh, diasporic uh, activists from around the world, um, from Hong Kong, because uh, for now, the implementation of the national security law really prosecutes every one of us. For me, I'm a wanted person and I got my asylum status in the UK. And there are many more people like me who are dispersed around the world. And one of the things that we need is uh, we need the recognition and the platform for us to continue our activism. I've encountered many occasions that when um, an event uh, invited me in and they start promoting and the Chinese government reach out to them and to pressure them and they decide to disinvite me because um, they accepted uh, the disinformation from the Chinese government or they just are terrified about the economic power uh, and, and the laws that they could bring if they continue to invite me. Um, I've encountered so many of these uh, occasions and this is exactly what Beijing wants. Um, they want to deplatform activists. They want, it, they want us to be silent with the economic power. So for me, uh, this is a really important uh, task for me to, to continue to speak up and to continue to be the, be the voice of Hong Kong and continue to lay out the story to the international audience. And that is the case uh, when um, we need a platform, when we need more resources to, be, to continue to, to make that point. Um, I hope that the international community could provide that and to make us to feel like we are not alone. Um, the whole world is standing um, with us and we can campaign um, with all your supports. Thank you, thank you, Nathan. So Michal, I want to bring the same question to you. You know, if things are going to, to change, the Russian people need access to information. How can we be more effective in supporting you? How can we as a community, including you, be more effective uh, in defending uh, open media, independent journalism, ultimately democracy? Well, the simple answer would be uh, keep doing your job, keep doing our job. Uh, but uh, I think there are three key uh, keywords, teamwork, honesty and uh, involvement. Uh, it's, it's simple. Uh, for, for example, to give you an example, TV Rain, it's not the first time TV Rain, it's the first time we, most of us, the team of TV Rain team had to leave Russia. This is true, this is correct, but um, it's not the first time TV Rain has been shut down. Uh, it first happened, what, uh, eight years ago, seven, eight years ago, when actually the first phase of this war started, uh, when Putin annexed Crimea and started the war in Donbas. That's when TV Rain 
uh, was shut down for the first time, yet it survived. Yet it survived and even um, became able to spread its word even louder than it was heard before because of, uh, of this commitment of, um, of all, all the team to, to simply keep doing their jobs, to uh, not uh, seeing this uh, shutting down. TV Rain was shut down from the cable, but we reinvented ourselves through YouTube and other, and other media. Yes, that's what happened. And uh, uh, it's never the end. It's all very important to, to understand this and to, to be committed to be honest with yourself and your audience, and that will help uh, help you to, to get to your audience and spread the word. Thank you, Mihal. Olga, you are part of a, of a civil society independent media response that is defending democracy in real time in Ukraine right now. Um, let me ask the same question about how we can be more effective. How can we be, uh, be more effective by picking up one of the questions that's come in from our participants? Um, not only how can we be more effective in supporting the free Ukraine right now, but uh, we're getting a question, how can many people in the audience, how can younger activists best get involved to help Ukraine where they want to be helpful? What, what, can, uh, what can they do to help a free Ukraine? Thank you for this question. Well, uh, I have two answers. I have a more general answer, and I want to, you know, uh, echo the words of Nathan that also the, the West, the Western countries, the democracies and the people in democracies and young people in democracies, especially who were born, you know, in peaceful times who have never experienced anything else but democratic and, and uh, democracy and freedom, they should not take these values, these things for granted. They should really uh, defend them, fight for them and protect them and do not expect that, you know, they will stay there forever. If you do not fight for them, if you do not defend them, you know, you are at risk as well. And uh, also, I think uh, the word of criticism should go to the governments who are enabling the rise of authoritarian powers, such as Russia, you know, uh, so many countries, especially of the European Union, European Union giants, such as Germany, Italy, and other countries, they were making themselves dependent on Russian oil and gas. And now they are unable to support Ukraine as much as they should because of that, you know. So uh, separate democracy and, and business, you know, uh, decide your priorities. You cannot have both. You should think about your values and, you know, you should protect your values, uh, first values and then money and business. And uh, in, in particular, like, uh, how can you support Ukraine and, uh, you know, Ukrainian activists, Ukrainian media, give them a floor, speak to them, hear their voices, do not let some other people, other nationals, Russians, uh, Americans, uh, whoever else speak for Ukrainians, let Ukrainian voices be heard talk to them, hear their version of their history, hear what they think of what is happening. You know, we have so many brilliant, young, not so young Ukrainians that, you know, speak foreign languages who are great professionals in different fields, invite them to conferences, uh, uh, offer them jobs, offer them collaborations, reach out to them to uh, show your support, to even, you know, uh, send your messages with uh, whatever you want to say. Talk to them and uh, hear their voices and take them seriously. You know, if for too long, Ukrainian agency was not taken into account. Ukrainians were presented and still in some countries in the, in the public and the media discourse, they are deprived of their agency. They are talked about as pawns, but they are not. They are people who have their values, who have their priorities, who are great, fantastic professionals with great education, with great skills. Listen what they have to say, hear what they have to say, and take them seriously and work together with them to promote democracy. I think the world has a lot of, to learn from Ukrainians and how to fight for democracy, how to protect democracy. The world has a lot to learn from Ukrainians. Thank you, Olga. Thank you. Let me uh, uh, get some brief final um, comment here. One on technology. Let me come to you, Nathan. Um, how would you consider technology and democracy? It's freedom of speech, automatic link, free access to technology. Um, offer a quick word on that before we come to a close. Um, well, thank you so much. Technology has been a big part in Hong Kong's protest. It helps circulate information and provides a way for direct democracy. 
But of course, we also need to be aware of the spread of disinformation and information warfare from regimes like the Russian regime and the Chinese regime. So I do believe that we need uh, much um, more like utility on, on the internet, uh, encourage, encourage people to participate more, but also we need to defend democracy uh, much more with uh, what we can do to counter those disinformation. Thank you, Nathan. And Mihail, can I close with you with a quick response on a big question? We see the new generation of Russians are seeing more and more of the, the ugly side of this invasion. But what is the future? What's the political future look like for young Russians today? A big question, but a quick response, please, to close us out, Mikhail. Um, well, the, the new, new perspective looks grim, of course. Uh, let's be open about that. But um, Putin's regime has already lost this war. The day it started it, Vladimir Putin has lost the war on the 24th of February when he started this invasion. And, uh, and uh, he's, um, um, he's done. He's, um, his career is over as a leader of, uh, of Russia. It may yet last for, uh, for uh, we don't know for how long, but it's, uh, in a way, it's over. This game is over. And uh, this is uh, what is important to understand for, for, for everyone and for, uh, for young Russians as well. And we know that uh, all the polls suggest that young Russians stand against this war. The young Russians stand against the regime. The, uh, virtually, uh, Vladimir Putin maybe started this war because he wanted to stop time, because he wanted to get uh, to, to suppress this young uh, Russians speaking out. And that's, what, that's, what, that's why it happened, but it's impossible to achieve. Thank you, thank you, Mihail. This has been an excellent conversation. I just wanna underscore that to have this conversation at the NATO Youth Summit underscores that this alliance isn't meant to be alliance with the North Atlantic Council and governments all around the table. It's an alliance of free nations, which is premised on people. It's premised on what you just heard, the agency of individuals to determine their future. And it's that simple message ordinary people capable of doing extraordinary things, something that Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping have trouble understanding, and yet we see that playing out today in Ukraine. That will help determine the future of Russia. That will help determine the future of China and Hong Kong because of people like we heard from today. Olga, Mihail, Nathan, thank you for your courage. Thank you for your leadership. And to all those joining, it's the agency of the individuals and free societies to stand in partnership with those uh, that seek to be on the front lines, to seek to bring freedom to their own nations. And so glad we could have this conversation as part of the NATO Youth Summit. Back to you in Brussels. Damon, thank you so much. What a fascinating and powerful conversation. Hearing those stories, that's what it's all about. It's about communicating the importance of these values to a much wider community. And I'm joined here now in Brussels with another master communicator, <laughs> uh, Ben Wheeler, who has built a really incredible platform to do some storytelling um, on Twitter and on TikTok. If you haven't checked him out there, he's at D1 Wheeler, so please go ahead. But Ben, you spend a lot of time taking these really complex geopolitical issues and kind of unpacking them for a more general and youth audience. Um, how did you get into this? And, and tell us a little bit more about what you do. Uh, so, I, I, so after I got done working for uh, who would soon be President Biden, I was kind of looking for things to do. And so I figured I'd try my hand at this. And it turned out I was good at it. Um, and so I kept doing it. And I realized I was having an actual impact on things because, uh, you know, things are complicated, right? But you don't actually have to make them complicated because no one thinks they're getting, no one thinks they're getting an academic paper out of a TikTok. So, um, but when you give these 60-second summaries, you're piquing people's interests and you're hopefully getting them to dive in more. And I think uh, you know it's pretty effective, right? So yeah. that's kind of what got me into that and why I think it's worthwhile. So. That's really, really interesting. Um, could I ask you because some of us might also be digital creators in our audience here. What is one or two things that you found to be really effective in terms of reaching a broad audience? What do people like the most? Be exciting. Um, and, uh, some of these topics that we talk about, especially in uh, geopolitics and international relations, they sound boring, right? Um, but if you start off with something exciting, uh, a big instance uh, or a big example of this is uh, Ethiopia and Egypt at one point were beefing over, or fighting, sorry. Uh, they were fighting, um, <laughs> I can't use slang. Uh, so they were fighting 
over this dam and the, the water flow. You know, we all know the story there. Um, and so people were kind of opening up videos with, oh, you know, we have our first dam war. And it's like, no, they're fighting over water, right? So open with that, you know? And that's the thing that matters, the lead, right? It's, so it's an exciting headline, not exciting in like an enjoyable way, but exciting in the way that it provokes intrigue. And it's also the, the thing that matters, you know? If you lead with people are fighting over water, people suddenly care. You know, so it's yeah. ripping away the language that sometimes newspapers and academia use to gatekeep topics and putting it in simple terms for everyone to easily understand. Yeah, that's fascinating. So tell me a little bit about how you built your community, your audience. Uh, well, so the great thing about TikTok is that they come to you. Uh, so it puts you in front of people um, who like that kind of stuff. And also by being able to uh, you know, appeal to a more casual audience, people who otherwise would feel pushed away um, by geopolitics, were able to get involved in it. Because people, and I think this is true, most casual people are interested in it because it is, it is kind of like a big chess game, right? Except real world consequences, right? But it is a big chess game. And I think people are inherently interested in that. And when you break it down at a fundamental level for them, people tune in. They watch, they care. And you know, also, I think young people are open-minded and they want more information. And if there's not a lot of solid sources of information out there, sometimes they can open their mind too much and their brain will fall out. So it's important that you know, we have a solid source of facts for people to reflect on. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Could I squeeze one more question out of you? Um, what's one piece of advice that you would give NATO in terms of communicating its policies and the things that it stands for? Um, I would say you need, to, you need to meet people where they're at. You need to meet young people where they're at. Um, their, their videos online are very professional, very clean, but they're boring. Um, the police don't kick me out. Um, <laughs> they're, they're, I'm, I'm going to be stranded here. They're going to cancel my flight. Uh, so, uh, but uh, they're boring. And you need to meet people where they're at. They need to be fun. They need to be upbeat. Um, and they really kind of need, you know, they have a lot of cool stuff. They got a lot of cool jets. Show some of those, show them, you know, flying by some things, burnt, blowing it up. People like that kind of stuff, right? Um, so be fun, be exciting, and uh, a clean professional looks cool. But now it's all about a niche and, you know, being creative and having a personality. At least for now. I mean, online trends, they change every 45 seconds, so... You know. Very important to remember. Well, thank you so much for being here and uh, bringing a new kind of perspective to the NATO Youth Summit, to the NATO community. We have a real treat today because actually Ben has made a special video that we're going to play here that was designed just for the NATO Youth Summit. So I'm really looking forward to watching that. Uh, so let's take a listen. In the past few days, there have been growing calls for the United States and NATO to establish a no-fly zone over Ukraine. No-fly zones are our bread and butter. No no fly fly zone. Fly zone. When Russia began its renewed invasion of Ukraine in late February, talk of implementing a no-fly zone dominated Western news. Pundits argued day and night about whether or not it would lead to a nuclear war. And pollsters began polling the public. The concept of no-fly zone polled extraordinarily well among Americans, even when Americans were told about the possible implications. However, it didn't poll that well among Europeans. The split in Western opinion was reflected with the cable news news debates about escalation. Americans seem to view the idea of escalation as somewhat of a fiction because of its geographic nature, while Europeans were all too familiar with the consequences of a potential escalation because they'd have to live with it. The debate ended before it even started. The tide of the war changed Ukraine, and the urgency of a no-fly zone and the debate surrounding it faded away. It's been two months since the war began, so let's talk about whether or not we should have a no-fly zone over Ukraine in the present day. A lot of arguments against a no-fly zone often boil down to the fact that it's a declaration of war. And sure, that may be right, but not all wars are like the Second World War. Limited military actions happen all the time, and historically, restraint is the norm in warfare. If NATO were to declare a no-fly zone, contrary to the popular belief, that wouldn't result in 99 left balloons. <laughs> Russia and Putin have a history of backing down when challenged. Russia can't seriously contest American and NATO air power, and doing so would result in heavy losses for the Russian Air Force. It is in Russia's best interest not to escalate, and they're well aware of this. The risk of escalation would come from NATO deciding to attack non-air defense ground targets, or Russia actually choosing to challenge the no-fly zone in a serious capacity, both of which can be avoided. But look, my check from Lockheed Martin bounced this morning, so here's some genuine downsides to a no-fly zone that don't result in doom spiraling. In order to implement a no-fly zone, you have to ensure air superiority. In order to do that, you have to suppress or 
or destroy enemy air defenses. Russia has a vast network of air defense systems, and while most of their equipment seems to not work, the S-400 does, and that makes things a bit difficult. NATO and the U.S. are definitely tracking these air defense systems, but there are most certainly hidden ones. Do you know how they find hidden air defense systems? Now, this is the fun antidote part. Let me introduce you to Wild Weasels. A Wild Weasel is an aircraft that baits enemy air defenses into looking at it or even shooting at them, which reveals the system, and then the Wild Weasel is tasked with eliminating it before it eliminates them. The acronym at the bottom stands for You Gotta Be Shitting Me, which is presumably what every pilot says when they find out this is their mission. Getting back to the topic at hand here, another factor that is relatively untalked about is that it compromises Western technology. For every minute an F-35 is within range of Russian radar, more of its capabilities and its stealth functions are revealed to them. And if, God forbid, they got a lucky shot off and came in possession of a destroyed one, they could reverse engineer it and now our security is compromised. This famously happened with the Sidewinder missile. Formosa. 100 miles from the red Chinese mainland, the U.S. bound by treaty to its defense. In the Formosa Strait, Chinese communist aggression centering around Kamoi poses the question of how far the U.S. will go trying to defend the offshore islands. A Taiwanese plane used the high-tech American missile on Chinese aircraft in 1958. The missile got stuck in the plane, which returned to base. The Soviet Union was given the missile and reverse-engineered it to make an exact copy of the missile. There was another time when the KGB walked into an airbase in Germany, took a newer version of the missile, walked out with it, and then mailed it to Moscow. Thankfully, it's really hard to mail an F-35. But lastly, a no-fly zone seems like a solution without a problem as of right now. Russia seems to be incapable of complex air operations and still hasn't fully utilized its air force. They are relying heavily on artillery and missiles, which have been devastating for Ukrainian cities. But there's not much a strict no-fly zone can do to stop that. The airspace over Ukraine is still contested. Ukraine is still conducting air operations. They are winning this on their own, and if we get in the way, we could change the war in a way that hurts Ukraine. A no-fly zone could change the scope of how Russia can act in the eyes of its own people. Russia keeps scaling back its objectives because it's not winning. And even in the most brainwashed of societies, massive casualties eventually have domestic consequences. A no-fly zone could enable them to justify an even bigger mobilization when they otherwise wouldn't be able to. In closing, a no-fly zone seems to be a solution without a problem. While kicking dirt in Russia's face when they're down is appealing, it's perhaps not for the best. Not because it could cause nuclear war, but because the negatives outweigh the positives right now. Awesome. Something new that you don't normally see at a NATO event. So kudos to NATO for broadening the horizons and trying something a little bit new with a TikTok creator here with us today. Fantastic. So next up, we're coming near to the end of our program. We have a couple more rapid fire segments, so stick with us. Next up, we have a message from the Right Honorable James Cleverly, who is the United Kingdom's Minister for Europe and North America. He is going to talk to all of you about why the future is in your hands. Hi, I'm James Cleverly. I'm the Minister at the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, and I am also responsible for our relations with Europe and North America. And I'm pleased that NATO, the Centre for European Policy, have organised this summit at this watershed moment for the alliance. Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine and the outcome of this war will dominate the world for years to come. It will determine whether we live in a peaceful world governed by a rules-based international order, where we can cooperate and tackle global challenges, or whether we plunge into a world where autocrats thrive and large countries decide the fate of smaller ones. This is why we need you, the future leaders, to engage with the debate, as it will be you that inherits the world that we create. The UK has been clear what outcome we want to see. We will not rest until Putin fails and Ukraine prevails. Through our military and humanitarian aid, we have shown we will not waver in our support for Ukraine. Our increased troop deployments in Estonia and Bulgaria and our aircraft in Romania underline our commitment and support to NATO and our allies. Today, our alliance is more united than ever. We know that it's our unity that has made us the most successful military alliance in human history. And it's that unity that will take us forward together. At the end of June, the Prime Minister and other world leaders will gather in Madrid to anchor our new commitments to our shared security in an updated strategic concept. That means making sure NATO is focused on all the challenges and all the opportunities of the next 10 years.
from the long-term implications for European security to China to the need to harness new technologies and, of course, to address climate change. You are essential to this process of renewal and innovation. Your perspectives enrich our deep commitment to the Alliance. That's why the UK is so firm in its support of this youth summit. It's also why the UK asked for young people to share their ideas for the future of the Alliance as part of our deterrence and defence seminar in December last year. It's our privilege to continue that conversation with you every day via our social media channels and through events like this. So, be bold, be creative, share your views today. What are your concerns? What are your ideas? How should NATO best secure your future? Know that your voice will influence the shape of the Alliance as we rise to meet the challenges that face us in the 30 unified allies. Thank you very much. Fantastic. All right, being bold and being creative. We are holding him to that. That has been one of our themes throughout the day. I will say one really cool way that NATO is trying to be bold and creative and shaking things up and in transatlantic security is through one of its own projects called Project X. It's part of NATO's tech and innovation efforts, which we've heard a little bit about today. We're going to go to a short video now just to give you a little flavor of what that looks like. And then we're gonna have a demo by some of the members of the project to show you what that work looks like. All right, good evening and uh, good afternoon to those joining from the trans uh, from across the Atlantic. Uh, thank you, Lauren, and, and congratulations for this excellent event today. It's, it's been really fantastic uh, to uh, see this really rich program. Great to be with you today, unfortunately not in person because COVID struck me, So, uh, but really excited to be part virtually. I work in NATO's Defense Investment Division here in Brussels, and our job is to help NATO and allies to develop the most cutting edge technologies from battleships or fighter jets to satellites or autonomous systems. So the event uh, today is coming to a close, so let me get right into this. Today has been all about change, and NATO's history, as you've heard today, is a history of change, is a history of transformation. And we've talked um, a lot today about climate change. We've talked about cyber, the great power conflicts. So let's exclusively for a few minutes focus on the underlying factor of all these topics, which is technology. The section this morning highlighted technology is at the forefront of this transformation process. And I think the last weeks and a uh, few months, uh, we were able to, to see history in the making when it comes to the importance of technology for the Alliance. With Russia's invasion in Ukraine, all of you were able to observe how satellite imagery or social media feeds revealed Russian troop movements or how uh, NATO and allies are working together to counter Russian mis misinformation and cyber attacks. Throughout our history, NATO and allies have pioneered technological advances just think about GPS, think about the jet engine, digital photography, 
or the internet. And uh, so technologies really shape our daily lives. However, things are changing now, and we see that governments are no longer the, the main funders and drivers of technology development. Major innovation today is coming from the commercial and the civilian markets, and that's why we here at NATO are expanding our uh, innovation radars uh, to new partners uh, across the globe. Let me just highlight, talking about innovation is one thing, and we often hear a lot about innovation, but doing it is very, very different. So let me present to you Project X, which is really number one about changing our culture. Number two, reaching out to new and diverse partners. And thirdly, turning those meaningless slogans like disruption, innovation, agility, and so on into action, into reality. So with uh, Project X, we brought together students from Dutch universities together with NATO militaries, with big industries and with startups to tackle some of our greatest problems. And we partnered with Boeing, with the Technical University in Delft, and with the Dutch startup hub uh, Unmanned Valley to develop drones, or what we call in NATO speech, unmanned aircraft systems. And the challenge here was to develop drones that can autonomously operate in crisis response situations. So think about a natural disaster, Think about floodings or earthquakes uh, where we need to make it easier for allied forces, for rescue forces to enter this territory and save lives. So our main messages, message to the team was blow things up. And we, we meant it literally. We encouraged the teams to not waste their time on the drawing board and to write plans and roadmaps, but to go out there to fly their drones, to crash them, and then rebuilt them. At the same time, it was really important to us that Project X is not just another hackathon or a youth niche activity where we tick the box for, okay, we've, we've engaged with youth. This work will directly support um, the deployment of new technologies um, across NATO territory, and uh, it will replace uh, industry studies of multi-million value, plus we're planning to spotlight the winning prototype at the NATO summit in Madrid. So let me put the spotlight on our two uh, guests that we have on the stage. NATO's very own uh, young Sheldon Cooper and Amy Fowler. Uh, Dennis, 21 years old, he's a student of international security from Leiden University. And then also we have Ailey with us, 23 years old. She's a student of aerospace engineering at the Technical University in Delft. And you two are leading the remaining two student teams and are in the final stages of uh, the Project X challenge. We only got two weeks left uh, to work out the solutions and pitch, pitch them in a, in a Shark Tank setting to industry and NATO. So uh, let me hand it over first to Dennis and then Ailey to uh, give us a sneak preview of what you're cooking up. Dennis, over to you and then uh, right to Ailey. Yes, thank you, Daniel, for this nice introduction. And hi, everyone. Um, so as my team members and I all live in the Netherlands and live below sea level, we're all concerned with the increasing uh, risk uh, of floodings and the rising sea levels. Um, and therefore my team and I have thought of a solution that removes the search part from the search and rescue operations when such a crisis occurs. So how this works um, is that we have set up a game-like game structure in which drones are incentivized to compete with each other and to uh, collect as many tokens or rewards as they can possibly get. So they, they get these rewards by completing their task or their mission, which is uh, set beforehand, and in case of a flooding, will be finding survivors or significant damage to certain buildings. Um, and in this way, they uh, compete with each other um, and try to find as many survivors as they possibly can, because they all want to be at the top rank um, of their drone leaderboard. Um, so when they found a survivor, they saved their exact GPS location in a shared database amongst the drones. And these, G these GPS locations are then again shared with the right authorities so that these authorities um, can then send it through to the, the right operators. Um, and this thus increases the speed and effectiveness of these operations and hopefully will increase um, the amount of survivors we can rescue when such a crisis occurs. 
Yes, and for the second project, we also focused on search and rescue missions. Um, but specifically by creating a structure of specialized drones. The structure has three layers, and they work by communicating with one another to survey the area of interest. They then evaluate the risks and rank them. And then from this, they can provide operators with information, for example, an optimized route for a rescue team to follow. What's unique about this design is the hierarchical structure of the drones, in which the highest level has a constant overview of the situation. And what this allows for is accurate assessment of a dynamically changing environment. And because of this, the, the range of applications is extensive. Excellent, Ailey. Thank you so much. These are impressive pitches. Uh, and it's, it's good to look into uh, brains of scientists working on some uh, real world problems that we're encountering. And I'm excited to see the drones flying in a few weeks. And let me just follow up with a, with a few questions. Um, let me fire one directly to Dennis. What was your motivation to join uh, PX in the first place? You both are ambitious young scientists and you probably got other gigs going on in your life. Why did you become part of this journey? Well, as you already mentioned, Daniel, I'm a, a security studies student. So I engage with the issues NATO engages with um, on a daily basis, of course, theoretical instead of practical. Uh, but I also deal with, uh, with or I learn how to unravel issues like cybersecurity, terrorism, um, and so on and so forth. So to be able to participate in a challenge that NATO hosts is an honor in itself. Um, and when you combine that with uh, NATO being one of the leading big organizations within the field, um, it was a great opportunity for me to finally put the theory into practice and see for myself how an organization like NATO uh, works and innovates with young students. Excellent. And it's been great to have you be part of this. Eli, you, you've been part of this uh, journey now of Project X for four months. and. Uh, this means working on your ideas in a team of, of five and long nights in the workshop, developing these prototypes. And I know you're, you're a full-time student as well. You, you have side jobs as well. Was it any fun? Did you enjoy uh, attending Project X? <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. Um, I mean, as an engineering student, it's my dream. I, uh, I love solving problems creatively, developing solutions to them. Um, and of course, it was a huge learning experience meeting and working with students from a variety of educational backgrounds and nationalities. And of course, we all appreciated the close contact we've had working directly with, with subject matter experts, with NATO operators and companies, for example, Boeing. Super. And uh, let, let me close this out um, briefly to, to uh, both of you. Uh, two weeks, it's going to be over. Final pitch. What's next? Are you going to close uh, this chapter and, and leave that in your bookshelf? Or what are your takeaways from this? Well, for me, my main takeaway was actually the technical part of this, this project. So I do security studies and that, that's not technical at all. So I didn't know the field as well as I do now. Um, and as I've, I've met this field and uh, saw how engineers can work together in the field of safety and security, uh, I can see the future of this uh, and how NATO should use uh, this project as, a, as an example uh, to further these projects into, uh, into uh, um, even more long-term uh, challenges. Um, and besides that, I've met a tremendous amount of people, had a great experience, uh, and I can see how, how NATO fits within this field and possibly within my future career. Excellent. Good stuff. All right, let's, let me... Uh uh, Ellie, do you want to any enter, add anything to this? Or? Yeah, well, I think from a, a technical viewpoint, um, one main takeaway as well would be the process of rapid prototyping through trial and error in a very short time period, really, of, of 12 weeks, just trying to find what works best. Um, but yeah, overall, very, very good experience. Super. So thank you, both of you, and good luck with the final pitches. I hope to see you in Madrid. Lauren, that's it from our side. Thank you so much. And I heard that uh, Mircha is about to kick the ball. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Daniel. I uh, really appreciate that. Great to hear from you guys. And I think uh, you all are troopers. We made it into the end of our program. Thank you so much.
I think this goes to show that it's the young folks, the students, uh, the people that are coming into our institutions that really are going to be the key to securing our shared future. They're the ones that bring the creativity, all of you. That is what will keep our institutions and our countries alive and strong for the years to come. And someone who believes in this message so profoundly is our final speaker for today, the Deputy Secretary General of NATO, Mircea Joanna. He's going to share a special message with all of us, and then I'd ask you all to please stay tuned for a special giveaway afterwards, and then I promise we'll let you go. <laughs> Okay, uh, still pretty good, isn't it? Uh, I remember 50 years ago when I was playing football as a kid. The pitch was not as good as this one at NATO, but it was one of the few things we could do because it was communism, not much freedom. So football and sports uh, were one of the few things we could enjoy. So we were playing lots of football, not only on the pitch like here, but also in the backyard of the communist blocks of flats in my home city of Bucharest, Romania. But it was the summer of 1968 when the most important memory of my childhood happened. Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia. An innocent nation invaded by a big power. And I believe that as I was shocked and it stays with me all my life, that summer of 1968. For you, my young friends, the atrocities, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia today is probably triggering the same sense of emotion, of outrage, as I had when I was a kid. But not even the Soviet tanks could stifle our desire for freedom, for liberty, for our own destiny. So in 1989, finally, the Iron Curtain fell. And the movement in Poland, Solidarność, and the symbol is here, the NATO headquarters, was embodying the irresistible drive of human beings for freedom. Freedom at last. Freedom forever. What we see these days in Ukraine and the awful aggression of Russia against the innocent people of Ukraine is a stark reminder that the quest for freedom never ends. It's a brutal wake-up call for all of us, for my generation, but mostly for your generation, that freedom can never be taken for granted, that we have to fight for it, defend it, find creative ways to support and strengthen our freedom. Because in the end, this is what NATO is all about. It's about peace, about security, about securing freedom. And this is why I'm so proud to speak to all of you in my capacity in this headquarters of NATO. As a child, I was shocked by Czechoslovakia. As an adult, I'm shocked by the appalling war in Ukraine. This is our freedom we have to defend. But I know some of you might say, that's politics. These old guys preaching us and telling us what to do. But I urge you to think harder. Imagine that people like you, the young people of Ukraine, just a few weeks back, were living the lives you live, going to school, dating, using the social media channels, having a normal life, a life of freedom, a life of peace, a life of security, and that reality shattered just overnight. So my urge to you, and through you, to your friends, to your families, to everyone you know, that the fight for freedom is not somebody's fight, it's everyone's fight. We're in this together, but it is also the struggle of your generation. This is the way to protect your freedom, your way of life, your families, your future. And from my generation to yours, I pass the ball to you.
So, quite literally, it is now my last duty to pass the ball to one lucky participant that we have here today. We pulled a name randomly from one of our 1,800 participants that have joined us today, both online and in person, who will receive a bag of goodies as well as the football that DSG has been kicking around. And actually, it is signed by all of our speakers that joined us in person today. So, kind of a fun souvenir. I will ask our production team to reveal the lucky winner on the screen. Drum roll, please. Corinna Lishka. I'm not sure if she's here in person or not, but uh, fantastic. We will find her and link up after this to make sure that she can get all of the goodies. OK, I have one more thing to do before we go. I'm going to check in with our audience with uh, one final word cloud to see if after all of these debates, anyone learned anything new. OK, what's one thing that you learned today about security or NATO? Can I get our uh, word cloud up on the screen? I know some people have already been putting in some ideas in the app. Uh, please go ahead and, feel, and feel free to continue adding to that. And we can get it up here on the big screen from the Slido. I see some things coming in here. Uh, lots on the youth role in NATO. Fantastic. All right, everyone agrees we're important. I love that. Good takeaway. We learned a lot about Project X. Fantastic. Cooperation. People learned about how to counter a cyber attack. Very good. Project X is something uh, people didn't know about, so that's great. I love it. I like that we are the future. That's a good note to end on. Fantastic. Um, all right, and now, as a final thing, I would like to just rerun the poll that we took at the top of the summit, which was um, asking all of you what you see as the most pressing challenge to global security. Let's see if anyone changed their mind after today's debates. All right, we got lots of things coming in. Um, and while we're voting, I will just flag that after the event, we are also going to send around a survey to get feedback from all of you. It will be posted in the community wall in the app, and we'll also send it to your email. Please, please don't be shy to send us your feedback. It's going to help us uh, make our next summit, which I hope we will convene and do this again next year, uh, make it even better based on your feedback. So please send that in. And then I'll just remind our uh, in-person audience here, if you would like to stay for a drink afterwards, we would love to see you out in the lobby. So please, uh, I hope to see some of you there. All right, so it looks like mm, the majority of people still think disinformation, although we do have a strong second for climate change. Interesting. Really good to see. Well, thank you all for sharing your thoughts. Um, what a fantastic day. Can we just get one last round of applause for all of our speakers and for all of you? <laughs> amazing, amazing. I will say, amidst all of the challenges that we face now and in the future, I feel confident and optimistic knowing that we're in your hands and that our leaders today really believe in us. Uh, it's such a really refreshing experience today to hear from all of you. So thank you so much. Thanks for sticking with us through a really long day and for all of your contributions. For the highlights from today's conversation, obviously you can find them on social media, at NATO and at SIPA. Also head to our website at SIPA.org to check it out. And we look forward to staying in touch. I hope we'll have a chance to do this again soon. Until next time, thank you, everyone, and goodbye.